Well, hello and welcome to Hearth and Homeless OTR Visual Radio. I'm Mr. H. I'll be your host for this evening. Tonight's compilation is Mr. Key, Tracer of Lost Persons. This show is one of the longest. Hello. Well, hello. Yeah. Bad guys. Where there's bad guys over there? This show ran from 1937 to 1955 and was one of the longest running radio shows on the air. Over the years, Mr. Keene was played by Bennett Kilpack, Arthur Hughes, and Phil Clark. As we mentioned in our last compilation of the 1,690 episodes made, only about 59 survive today. So tonight's compilation features shows from 1949 and 1950. So these shows are about 12 to 13 years into an 18 year run. Overall, it's a great show. Very interesting, very entertaining. So once again, I think we're in for an enjoyable evening. Now, just before we get into the show, do want to take a minute to tell you about a couple ways you can help support the channel. First up, we've got the Johnny Dollar Club starting at just a dollar a month. You can help keep these great shows coming. You've got three ways to join coffee.com, buymeacoffee.com and patreon.com. The links for those are in the description below. And many of you have asked about using PayPal. So if you prefer PayPal, the first option, coffee.com, is a great one for you. And the second way you can help support the channel and get a little something for yourself is to check out our Hearth and Home Shop on Etsy. We've got a great assortment of old-time radio-related merchandise, including the Yours Truly Johnny Dollar Collection. We've got the old-time radio detective mug series. And our newest collection, starting right now, is, is the Harold Apple Knocker Collection. The link for the Etsy shop is in the description below. Head on over and check that out. So now it's time to sit back and relax and enjoy Mr. King, Tracer of Lost Persons. And as always, thanks for tuning in. It's time now for Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Anison and Kalinos present Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. One of the most famous characters of American fiction in one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday at the same time, the famous old investigator takes from his file and brings to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. Tonight's case is entitled The Yellow Talon Murder Case. Today, many thousands of people are thankful to their physicians or dentists for first having introduced them to that remarkable preparation called anison, which brings such incredibly fast and effective relief from the pains of headaches, neuritis, or neuralgia. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, it contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients. So ask for easy-to-take anison tablets at your drug counter next time you suffer pains from headache, Neuritis or neuralgia. For most effective relief, use on is directed. I'll repeat the name for you. Anacin. A-N-A-C-I-N. Now for Mr. Keene and the Yellow Talon murder case. Our scene opens in the study of a country home on the Hudson River, some 50 miles from New York. An attractive, auburn-haired young woman has just entered the room. And as she shakily picks up the telephone and dials a number, it is obvious that she is under some frightful strain. Why don't they answer? Why don't they answer? Operator. Oh, operator. I've been trying to get the police. It, it's a matter of life and death. Well, for heaven's sake. Oh, hello? 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 Oh, the phone. The line's been cut. The phone's dead. No. No. Don't kill me. Don't kill me.
Can I help you, young fella? Are you Mr. Keane? Oh, I'm Mike Clancy, his partner. Mr. Keane's in his private office. Uh, did you and this young lady have uh, an appointment with him? No, I... I just hoped I'd get a chance to see him right away. It's rather important. Please, tell him Philip Carter's here. It's terribly urgent. Oh, here's the boss now. Mike, uh, do you have the Roberts folder? Are you Mr. Keene, sir? Yes. My name is Philip Carter, and this is my fiancée, Eloise Gray. Could you possibly give us a few minutes of your time, sir? I'd be very grateful. Just what is it you want to see me about, Philip? A murder, Mr. Keene. It's Philip's sister, Helen. She was... She was killed last night in Philip's home. Saints preserve us, but we didn't read anything about it in the papers, young fella. The family estate is 50 miles from here, on the Hudson. It will probably be reported in the newspapers later today. Well, sit down, Philip. And you, Miss Gray. Mike, we can let the Roberts matter drop for a while. Doesn't seem to be as urgent as this. Okay, Mr. Keene. Now, suppose you give me the details, Philip. My sister, Helen, was found in the study about midnight by our Uncle Jonathan... He's been living with us ever since the death of our parents years ago. I'll never forget last night as long as I live, Mr. Keene. I saw Helen's body, too. You were in the house at the time of the crime, Heloise? I was asleep. Philip's uncle woke me up and sent me into town for the police. The phone wires had been cut. How was Helen Carter killed? That was the most horrible thing of all, Mr. Keene. My sister had been strangled, and her throat was terribly lacerated. It was as if some gigantic bird with sharp talons or claws had attacked her. A bird? Saints preserve us. What made you think of a bird, Philip? Because of this. It was found near my sister's body. The police permitted me to bring it here when I told them I was going to ask you to enter the case, Mr. Keene. Well, let me see that, Philip. Hmm. Mike, what do you make of this? Well, it looks like a, a talon, Mr. Keene. A yellow claw. Yes, the type of claw an eagle or a hawk might have. And yet this particular talon is too big for an ordinary hawk. If it actually came from a bird, the bird must have been gigantic. Sure, and it makes your spine crawl just to look at it, boss. It's as sharp as a razor. Yes. What other facts are there to the case, Philip? Well, according to Uncle Jonathan, he was awakened around midnight by some kind of horrible scream. First, he thought it was one of his pets, but later he changed his mind. What kind of pets does your uncle keep? Falcons. In medieval times, as you probably know, Mr. Keene, hunters would train falcons to help them bag their game. Well, I've never even seen one of them things. Well, a falcon is a hawk, Mike, and a very clever and ferocious bird. Hundreds of years ago, they were trained to go after small game. They can be quite wild and dangerous. Uncle Jonathan Briggs is an eccentric, I guess. He's been a little peculiar ever since he lost his fortune years ago and came to live with us. We've been supporting him, but it hasn't been difficult. Dad left a very considerable estate when he died. And your Uncle Jonathan and your fiancée, Miss Eloise, were the only people in the house at the time of your sister's murder? Yes, Mr. Keene. My sister Helen had a personal maid, Amy Parrish, but she had taken the evening off and she didn't return until very late. Philip, I... I, I think you also ought to tell Mr. Keene about Kim Bradhurst. And who is Kim Bradhurst? A neighbor. He was in love with my sister. And he used to make a pest of himself. I once had to throw him out of the house bodily because he annoyed her so. Was he questioned by the police? Yes, Mr. Keene, but he had an alibi. He was ill all day yesterday and in bed. He had a doctor visit him about nine last night. Mr. Keene, Philip's sister Helen was one of my best friends and a wonderful girl. I never thought she made an enemy in her life until now. We were very close, Helen and I. And if I ever get my hands on the killer... Philip, please, don't talk like that. You frighten me. Let Mr. Keene and the police handle the case. There's been enough horror already. Your fiancé is right, Philip. No matter how you feel, the law must take its course. I understand that, sir. Will you come back to the house with us, Mr. Keene? Philip was afraid to leave me there alone after what happened. That's why I came with him to New York. Eloise was spending a few days with Helen while I attended a horse show near here. I've shown a few entries every year, but I only wish I'd never even thought of it this time. Maybe if I'd been at home last night, I'd have been able to save my sister's life. It was something you certainly couldn't foresee, Philip. Mike, suppose we drive out to the Carter estate along with Philip and Eloise. I'll get the car, Mr. Keene. We're having my sister's funeral at two o'clock this afternoon. I guess we'll just have time to make it. 
Then suppose Mike and I go to your house, Philip. You and Miss Eloise can attend the funeral while we make a preliminary investigation. Whatever you say, Mr. King. This yellow talon is most strange, to say the least. Certainly it couldn't have been some monstrous bird. It's and... dreadful. It makes me shudder just to look at it. When I think of poor Helen, I... I know, it's... it's shocking. But I promise you, Philip, I'll see this case through to the end. No matter how great the risk. That must be the Carter house, Mr. Keene. Right in front of us. Yes, and apparently that's where the road ends, Mike. Oh. Saints preserve us. What's the trouble? Did you see that, boss? What? Well, something flew by the car on the left just a second ago. Mr. Keene, look out. It's some kind of a hawk. Yes, Mike, it's, it's a falcon. One of Uncle Jonathan's, I imagine. Well, it's flying back to the house. Try to see where it lands, Mike. There. There she goes. Up behind them gables on the roof. And she's a beauty, isn't she? Mr. Keene, who's that fellow? Huh. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. By any chance, are you Philip Carter's uncle? Why, yes, I'm Jonathan Briggs. Who may you be? My name is Keene. This is my partner, Mike Clancy. Keene, the eminent investigator. You've come to look into the death of my niece, Helen. At your nephew, Philip's request. I imagined you'd be at your niece's funeral, Mr. Briggs. I don't like funerals, Mr. Keene. I never attend them. Well, would you mind showing us to the house? Not at all. But let me tell you that you're just wasting your time here. Am I? As well as risking your life. The house is no good. It's cursed with bad luck. Well, we'll risk it, Mr. Briggs. Suit yourself. But just remember that I warn you. This way, Mr. Keene. Amy! Amy, where are you? Fool maid's never around when you want her. Make yourself at home, Mr. Keene and Mr. Clancy. Well, thank you, Mr. Briggs. It certainly is a big house. Must be 20 or 30 rooms in this place. Yes, it's big. Big and cold. You don't seem to like it very much, Mr. Briggs. I don't. And why do you stay? Because I can't go anywhere else. Besides, Sir Richard and Lady Sharp would miss the woods. And who are Sir Richard and Lady Sharp? My birds, my falcons. You saw Sir Richard a moment ago when he flew past your car. He's as fast as lightning, that one is. I've spent three years training him how to kill. Huh. Not a very cheerful hobby you've got, Mr. Briggs. He attacks only field mice and small animals, Mr. Clancy. Would that falcon be capable of attacking a human being? I knew you'd come to that, Mr. Keene. They want to blame my niece Helen's death on one of my birds. Well, it's ridiculous. Oh, those falcons are as harmless as two pigeons. <coughs> Thanks, Preservus. What was that? Sounded like Amy the maid. Get him out of here. Keep him away. Amy. Amy, control yourself. Why are you carrying on? It's one of your falcons. He flew in through the window and almost blinded me. Stop acting like a child. It's probably Sir Richard. Uh, I'll, I'll oh, find him. Calm yourself, Amy. You're not in any danger. My name is Keene. Mr. Keene, the great investigator? Oh, I was hoping Mr. Carter would call you in, sir. The most terrible things have been going on in this house. So I've heard. It's those birds. Well, you'd think they were human the way Mr. Briggs talks to them. One of them killed Miss Helen, I know it. And I'll be next. Oh, no, take it easy, Amy. No one's going to do any killing while we're around. Tell me something about Miss Helen Carter. Was she on good terms with her Uncle Jonathan? As far as I know, sir. I guess he's a harmless one himself, though he... Acts like a loon sometimes. But it's those vicious birds, those falcons. I can't stand them. I don't think Helen Carter was murdered by a bird, Amy. No? In fact, I'm sure of it. But, Mr. Keene, I've heard of eagles and hawks attacking people sometimes and even killing them. That's true. A bird the size of a hawk might possibly attack a man or a woman if it was provoked. But it certainly wouldn't bother to cut a telephone wire before doing it. Well, I... I never thought of that, boss. Sir Richard! Sir Richard, come back here! Come back! Don't, don't shoot me! Faith, and now what's going on in this place? There's a shotgun blast, Mike. 
Sounds as if it came from outside the house. Come along with me. Mr. Kane, look. Who are you? I was just going to ask you the same question. Kim Bradhurst, my name. Where's Jonathan? I've got a little present for him. You've killed him. You've killed Sir Richard. I'll say I have. I was glad to blast his ugly head off. You'll find him out there in the woods, Jonathan. If that other bird of yours starts going after my chicken, she'll get the same dose. You murderous study, Mr. Briggs. Take him inside the house, Mike. Come along. He killed my falcon. I swear it counts. I swear it counts if it's the last thing that I do. What did you say your name was, mister? I didn't say, but it happens to be Keen. Oh, famous investigator, huh? Well, I suppose you've come to find out how Helen Carter died. Well, I loved her as much as anyone. If you find the killer, I'll be happy to help you take care of him. I won't need any help on that score, Mr. Brighthurst. But I assure you, I intend to find him or her. No matter how dangerous the task it may be. Helen Carter was murdered by a human being, not a bird. Although it appears her killer had talons. And I'm going to see that those talons are clipped for good. In just a moment, we'll return to Mr. Keene and the Yellow Talon murder case. Meanwhile, beware of unpleasing breath that breathes between teeth. Get Kalinos toothpaste with amazing dental floss action for a clean mouth and a pleasing breath. Most unpleasing breath breeds between the teeth in the deep recesses where food particles can collect and decay. These are the places that must be reached to have a really clean mouth, a pleasant breath. Your dentist knows this to be true. Now Kalinos toothpaste gives you dental floss action. That is, sends thousands of active cleansing bubbles to penetrate hard-to-reach dental areas. Helps dislodge bits of food that can cause unpleasing breath and tooth decay. What's more, Kalinos has high polishing action. Brightens dingy teeth by removing ordinary yellow surface stains. Kalinos is gentle, safe for even children's teeth and tender gums. Enjoy its cool, clean, minty flavor. Most refreshing toothpaste ever. Test Kalinos in your own way. Keeps your teeth bright, your breath right. Kalinos toothpaste is dentist approved, dentist recommended. Get the Kalinos with dental floss action today. Save 31 cents on the giant economy size. Now back to Mr. Keene and the Yellow Talon murder case. The strange and terrifying murder of pretty Helen Carter brings Mr. Keene, the famous investigator, and his partner Mike Clancy to the Carter home 50 miles from New York, the scene of the crime. The victim appeared to have been attacked by some gigantic bird. And the only clue discovered so far is a large, broken yellow talon, as sharp as a knife. Now it's shortly after midnight. And in the room Mr. Keene and Mike have been given, Mike is suddenly awakened from his sleep by the sound of someone moving about. Quietly, Mike reaches under his pillow for his revolver then raises himself on one elbow and prepares for action. Don't move. Whoever you are, mister, don't move or I'll shoot. It's me, Mike. Everything's all right. Mr. Keene, what are you doing, sir? I heard someone moving about the house. Don't put the lights on, Mike. Just slip into your robe and slippers and follow me. I'll be right with you, boss. Just one second. Ready, Mike? Yes, sir. Then follow me. This way, down the hall. This house seems to be as quiet as a tomb. I'm sure there's a prowler about, though. Boss, look. There's a light moving towards us at the end of the hall. Someone with a candle in his hand. Stand back against the wall until he reaches us. He hasn't seen us yet. Boss, it's... Yes, Mike. It's Philip Carter's uncle, Jonathan Briggs. Looking for something, Mr. Briggs? What are you doing, Mr. Keene? Spying on me? I was just wondering what you were up to at this hour. You and your partner here think I'm crazy, don't you? You think there's something wrong with my mind? On the contrary. 
I believe you're a lot more aware of what's going on than you appear. You're looking for a murderer, aren't you? You're looking for the man who killed my niece, Helen. Well, maybe you'll have two murderers on your hands. What do you mean by that? Kim Bradhurst killed my pet falcon. He killed one of my birds for no reason at all. Because he wanted to see how miserable he could make me. Well, when I get my hands on Bradhurst, he'll wish he'd never been born. Mr. Briggs, maybe I ought to go back to your room. Don't touch me. I can take care of myself. I'm not as old and decrepit as my nephew seems to think. He may be supporting me, but... Tommy, let go! Help! Help me, someone! Mr. King is coming from that room, Mike. That's the maid's room, Amy's. The door's locked, boss. Break it down, Mike. Wait! I'll let you in! What's going on here? It's Eloise, my nephew's fiancée. What's the trouble, Eloise? This maid, Amy, is a thief. She's got a room full of things that belong to Helen Carter. I heard her prowling around the house, and I followed her here to her room. I caught her with my purse. I left it downstairs on the table by mistake before I went to bed. Is that true, Amy? Well, I guess there's no point in saying no. You have the evidence. What's the trouble, Mr. King? What's going on here? I'm afraid your housemaid Amy is in a very difficult situation, Philip. She's evidently a thief. Look, Philip. The closet door is open. There's a pair of shoes that belong to your sister, Helen. She even stole her clothes. Miss Eloise, what's happened to your hand? Well, you've got her cut on the palm, young lady. Amy scratched me when I tried to take my bag away from her. She fought like a wildcat. Well, what would you expect me to do? Smile at you when you grab me? Anyway, I, I, I didn't take much. It isn't as bad as all that. I'm afraid it's a lot more serious than you imagine, Amy. You not only face a charge of larceny, but also one of murder in the first degree. Murder? Oh, no. No, I I didn't kill Helen Carter. I swear I didn't, Mr. Keene. You can defend yourself in court, Amy. I'm asking Mr. Keene to see to it that you're placed under arrest. Well, at least give me a chance to call someone. An attorney? No, no, not a lawyer. Uh, Mr. Bradhurst. Kim Bradhurst, our neighbor. What's he got to do with this? Well, never mind. He owes me a little something, at least protection. Let me call him. That's all I ask. All right, Amy. Go ahead. I'll keep her company, boss. Just to see that she behaves herself. Right, Mike. So it was Amy Parrish who murdered my niece, eh? Perhaps. But this case isn't quite finished, Mr. Briggs. We may be due for another surprise. In any event, we'll hear what Mr. Bradhurst has to say. Well, that must be Kim Bradhurst now. Philip. Yes, Mr. Keene? I suggest you take your uncle to his room. There may be trouble between the two. Very well, Mr. Keene. Come on, Uncle Jonathan. All right. I'll go. Can't stand looking at him anyway. Here's Kim Bradhurst, Mr. Keene. Still carrying his shotgun, I notice. Maybe I like to carry it around, Mr. Clancy. Well, now, Amy, what is it you want to say to Mr. Bradhurst? Mr. Keene's accusing me of murder, Mr. Bradhurst. They all say I killed Miss Helen. That's ridiculous. We found Amy the maid with stolen goods a little while ago. And she admitted taking most of it from the murdered girl, Helen Carter. I don't know anything about stolen goods, Mr. Keene. But I'll stake my reputation on the fact that Amy didn't murder Helen. What makes you so sure, Mr. Bradhurst? Because she was Helen's confidant, as well as her personal maid. And she's a friend of mine. Amy's done me many a favor making things easier for me when Helen was alive. I'll return those favors by backing her to the limit. In what way did Amy help you, Mr. Bradhurst? I can tell you that, Mr. Keene. Well, Miss Eloise, do you know? Amy used to inform Kim Bradhurst when Helen's brother Philip was out of the house so he could try to see her on the sly. It used to frighten me. I knew that Philip disliked Kim, and I, I thought one day it would lead to trouble. Do you know why he carries that gun around with him all the time? I don't mind admitting it. Your sweetheart Philip's a big man, Eloise. He's stronger than I am. I made up my mind to take care of him the next time he put a hand on me. Mike, ask Philip Carter to bring his Uncle Jonathan back to the room. And ask Jonathan to bring his pet falcon along. Okay, boss. No, I'm afraid of that bird. I don't want to see it. Don't worry, Amy. I got rid of one of those falcons with a shotgun. I can do the same for the second. I advise you to be careful, Mr. Bradhurst, and keep that gun lowered. But... Why bring the falcon in, Mr. Keene? You'll see in just a moment, Miss Eloise. Please, just call me Eloise. I feel as though we've known each other for a long time, Mr. Keene. That's odd. 
I feel the same way, Eloise. Just step inside, Mr. Briggs. What do you want with me? My bird, Mr. Keene. I just wanted to make a test, Mr. Briggs. Look at that bird. It's horrible. Do you also think the falcon is horrible, Eloise? No. I think it's a beautiful bird, Mr. Keene. Yes. Eloise always liked my falcons. She understands them. Perhaps even more than you imagine, Mr. Briggs. What? Just what are you getting at, Mr. Keene? I'm afraid I have some shocking news for you, Philip. In my opinion, your fiance Eloise Gray is a murderess. She I... murdered your sister Helen. What's that you say? Eloise? Mr. Keene, are you joking? A few minutes ago, Eloise claimed that she followed Amy to her room and caught her with her purse. Well, Amy admitted it, didn't she? Yes, she admitted it, Eloise, and she did steal your purse. But you didn't follow her or see her take it. You were waiting for Amy in her room. And may I ask how you know? The door was locked. If you had followed a thief to her room, you certainly wouldn't have locked the door yourself. It would have put you in a dangerous position. No, it was Amy who locked her own door when she entered, thinking she was alone. And you were waiting there to kill her, the way you killed Helen Carter. That's a lie, Mr. Keene. No, it's not a lie, Eloise. And I have further proof. You said Amy scratched your hand when you struggled with her for the purse. I noticed that Amy bites her fingernails. They aren't long enough to scratch anyone. Then, Mr. Keene, how did Eloise get that cut on her palm? She inflicted it on herself by accident, Philip. She was wearing sharp talons, yellow talons, to use on Amy as she did on your sister. <laughs> look, look at her, Mr. Keene. Yes, yes, I killed her. She hated me. She wanted to break up my engagement to Philip. But that isn't true, Eloise. She loved you. Loved me? Wasn't she trying to call the police? Yes, and you cut the phone wire. In some way, Helen found out what you were, Eloise, and she tried to protect herself. <gasps> Boss, look what she's putting on her hands. The talons, the sharp claws. She wears them like gloves. You hate me too, kid. And you'll get what she got now. <laughs> Mr. King, look out. Saints preserve us, but I was almost too paralyzed to move. Did you see how she acted, boss? Why, well, she waved her arms like, like she was some kind of a hawk and, and went for your throat, Mr. Keene. Yes, Mike. Mr. Bradhurst, I'm sorry you used your gun. Mike would have been able to subdue her. I couldn't help it, Mr. Keene. When I saw the insane look in her face, watched her reach for your neck with her talons, well, I tried to protect you instinctively. Well, I suppose she's better off. She was undoubtedly insane. Mr. Keene, I... I can't believe it. How could anyone change so? I'm sorry, Philip. But in my opinion, your fiancée had a split personality. She changed from a human being to what you've just seen, a homicidal maniac. How long had you known her? Only a, a few months. And your sister, Helen, actually was very fond of her, Philip? Yes, Mr. Keene. Well... Eloise had to have some excuse for murder in her poor, distorted mind. So as she imagined, Helen was trying to ruin her life. Amy would have been her second victim. It went for a stroke of luck. However, we can consider the case to be closed. We've solved the mystery of the Yellow Talon murder. Mr. Keene finds the solution to the Yellow Talon murder case. The next time you're suffering from the pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, try Anison. You'll bless the day you heard of this incredibly fast way to relieve these pains. Now, the reason Anison is so wonderfully fast-acting and effective is this. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing Anison tablets from their own dentist or physician, and in this way have discovered the incredibly fast relief Anison brings from pain of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. So next time such pain strike, take Anison. For most effective relief, use only as directed. Your druggist has Anison in handy boxes of 12 and 30. 
and economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100. The name is Anacin, A-N-A-C-I-N. Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, is based on the novel, Mr. Keene. The radio sequel is originated and produced by Frank and Ann Hummer. Dialogue by Lawrence Cleek. Bennett Kilpack plays Mr. Keene. It is on the air every Thursday at this time. Don't miss Mr. Keene next Thursday when the kindly old Tracer turns to the case of murder with a thousand witnesses. Time now for Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. Ladies and gentlemen, Anison and Kalinos present Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction in one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday at the same time, the famous old investigator takes from his file and brings to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. Tonight's case is entitled, The Case of Murder with a Thousand Witnesses. If you suffer from the pains of headache, we are due to try the remarkable product this program features, Anison. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, it contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients. That's why the relief it brings is often incredibly fast. Many of you I know first discovered Anison tablets through your own dentist or physician. But if you've not yet used Anison, we urge you to try it. You can get Anison at any drug counter. Use only as directed. And if pain persists or is unusually severe, see your doctor. Anison is spelled... A-N-A-C-I-N. Now for Mr. Keene and the case of murder with a thousand witnesses. Our scene is set at a county fair which is opened in a community just outside New York. It is a bright, sunny afternoon, and as the visitors to the fair wander from exhibit to exhibit, they create a gay holiday mood. A well-dressed, handsome gentleman of 45 has paused near an exhibit of cakes and pastries. After a moment, he is approached by his wife, a lovely woman in her early 30s, whose worried, tense expression sets her apart from the cheerful faces around her. William. And darling, so you decided to come to the county fair after all. I... My headache's gone, William. Good. You're just in time, too. The baking contest's about to begin. Oh. <laughs> you know, I love these county fairs and the people who run them. They're wholesome, these folks. And by asking me to be an honorary judge, well, they flatter me more than I can tell you. I know that, William. In spite of your success, you've always been modest and simple, just like our neighbors. Perhaps that's one reason I fell in love with you and married you. <laughs> that's another thing I can't get over. How a lovely young actress like you ever gave up the stage just to marry me. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Brooks, but they're waiting for you to judge the baking exhibit over there. Oh, thanks, Miss Wilkins. I imagine you've got your usual delectable entries on the table again this year. Well, I, I baked a large cake, but maybe it isn't exactly right that the judge's housekeeper should be a contestant. Or the judge's wife, for that matter. My wife? Anne, did you... I, I've made a few small cakes, William. Just little decorative things. Well, this is a surprise. I didn't know you were a cook, Anne. Up to now, I imagined that actresses couldn't even boil an egg. And you still may be right. This way, Mr. Brooks. We're waiting. Here I come. And now, folks, Mr. Brooks, our favorite country squire, will taste these cakes and tell us who's the best pastry cook in Bellows County. <laughs> Mr. Brooks. <laughs> well, let's see now. Here's a delectable-looking morsel, if I ever saw one. Well, this cake is guaranteed to expand a man's waistline. <laughs> I'll score that at 80 points. And now, 
Oh, these little cakes look out of this world. Just, just a mouthful of... <coughs> Mr. Brooks, what's the trouble? Get a doctor, somebody, quickly. Oh, Mr. Brooks! Mr. Brooks, what happened? Don't touch him, Miss Wilkins. He, he's dead. Dead? He was poisoned. The poison must have been in the cakes. And those cakes were baked by Mrs. Brooks, his wife. Then what happened, Miss Wilkins? When I shouted that the poison cakes had been baked by Mrs. Brooks, everyone, all those people turned to look for her, Mr. Keene. But she was gone. Saints preserve us. Murder with a thousand people looking on. You say Mrs. Brooks disappeared? Yes, Mr. Keene. And she hasn't turned up since. Holy mackerel. That makes her look even more suspicious. My partner, Mike Clancy, is right, Miss Wilkins. Mrs. Brooks has certainly made things more difficult for herself by leaving the scene of her husband's murder. There's no question about the fact that Mrs. Brooks murdered her husband, Mr. Keene. The police have an alarm out for her right now. Then why did you come to me, Miss Wilkins? Because I know your reputation, sir. You're not only one of the most famous criminal investigators in the country, but you have just as big a name for finding people, particularly criminals in hiding. If anyone can ferret that woman out, you can, Mr. Keene. You're very bitter about Ann Brooks, aren't you? Why shouldn't I be? Her husband was one of the finest men I ever knew. She only married him for his money. She and her theatrical heirs. Why, he was over 12 years older than she was. And besides, what did she know about running a country home and pleasing a man like Mr. Brooks? Miss Wilkins, how long had you worked for Mr. Brooks as his housekeeper? For 15 years. I'd taken care of him as if he were my brother. And when he married that woman six months ago... I still remained in spite of everything. How do you mean, in spite of everything? Well, Ann Brooks and I never got along, Mr. Keene. But that's beside the point. I'm asking you, pleading with you to accept this case, sir. A man's been murdered. A good man. And I know that you'll want to see that justice is done. I most certainly do, Miss Wilkins. And I intend to see that justice is done. Thank you, Mr. Keene. Now, I have the address of Brooks's home. You'll hear from me very shortly. Well, just one thing more before I go, Mr. Keene. In regard to her brother... And Brooks's brother? Yes. He's been living with them ever since the marriage. I see. And frankly, I think that man is worthless. He's been sponging on Mr. Brooks' generosity. Hmm. Of course, I, I don't believe he had anything to do with the murder. But there is a chance that he may know where his sister is hiding. Well, in that case, I'll have a talk with him. You can expect my partner and me at the Brooks's home this afternoon. Very well, Mr. Keene. And thank you again for your help. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, Mr. Clancy. Goodbye, Miss Wilkins. So long. Well, what's on your mind, Mike? Sir? I noticed how you stared at Miss Wilkins as she talked. What were you thinking about? You want me to come right out with it, boss? Well, you usually do. In my opinion, the killer just walked out of this office. And how did you reach that conclusion? Well, sure, and jealousy was written all over her face. She kept house for the man, Mr. Brooks, for years. And then he marries a younger, prettier woman, an actress. And when the bacon contest comes up at the county fair, the housekeeper slips some poison into the wife's cakes so the wife would get the blame for his murder. Well, Mike, that's not a bad theory. Yeah, and look how anxious she is to nab the wife. Why, well, she can't even wait until the police grab her. And she's got to come to you and ask for help. I'm glad she did. This is a strange case and an interesting one. We'll drive out to the Brooks's home this afternoon, Mike. Mr. Brooks's murder is certainly worth looking into. Hey, this is a nice-looking house, boss. Yes, Mike, it is. Mr. Brooks must have been a man of taste as well as wealth. That roadster parked in front of the door has a New York license plate. There was evidently a visitor in the house. Let's go inside. Mr. Keene and Mr. Clancy, please come in. Thank you. Is Ann Brooks's brother here, Miss Wilkins? No, and I don't know where he's gone. He wasn't here when I came back. But Mr. Hilton's here, sir. Mr. Hilton? Lawrence Hilton. He's in the living room. 
And he's a man you might be interested in talking to, if I may say so. Oh, is he? Why? Well, he's young and he's good-looking. And he knew Mrs. Brooks before she married. I'll bet he's an actor, sir. And frankly, I don't care much for actors. What is he doing here? Well, he said he just stopped off to say hello to Mrs. Brooks and her husband. I told him about Mr. Brooks' murder, and he couldn't get over it. But he may be putting on an act. He might even know where she is. And he came here to check up for her. Miss Wilkins. Mr. Keynes, the investigator. What? I'll speak to Mr. Hilton alone, if I may, Miss Wilkins. Oh, well, step right in there, Mr. Keene. I told him you were coming here, and he said he wanted to wait for you. Now, as soon as Mrs. Brooks' brother arrives, please tell him I'd like to speak to him. Yes, sir. I will. So, the more she talks, the sure I am that, that she had something to do with the murder, boss. Well, uh, we'll see soon enough, Mike. Now, let's have a chat with Lawrence Hilton. Mr. Keene? Yes. I'm Lawrence Hilton... Miss Wilkins, the housekeeper, told me you were expected. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, this is my partner, Mike Clancy. Oh, how do you do? Pleased to meet you, Mr. Hilton. Needless to say, I'm still stunned by the news. I can't believe that Ann Brooks had anything to do with the murder of her husband, even though she did disappear right afterward. She's under strong suspicion, however. Yes, I can see that, Mr. Keene. I uh, understand you're a good friend of hers, Mr. Hilton. Yes, I toured with her for months in a Broadway production... She was the leading lady. I must admit, for a while, I almost thought I was in love with Anne. But I was wrong. And I was very happy about her marriage. Hmm. You don't happen to know where she is right now, do you, Mr. Hilton? Why, no. I thought she'd be here. I... I... Oh, great Scott, Mr. Keene, you don't believe I'm the one who's hiding her, I hope. Why, not at all. I uh, just thought you might be able to give me some kind of a clue. No, I'm afraid I can't. Mr. Keene. Yes, Miss Wilkins. Here is... Her brother, John Ainsley. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Ainsley? How do you do? I don't believe I know you, sir. My name is Mr. Silton. Mr. Keene, you're wasting your time here. I don't know where my sister Anne is. And what's more, she's innocent. She didn't murder her husband. That remains to be seen, Mr. Ainsley. However, I hope you're telling the truth about not knowing where your sister is. If you aren't, you're only placing her in further jeopardy. What do you mean? Every hour she's in hiding makes her look more guilty. Now, if she gives herself up willingly, she'll at least show faith in her own innocence. But if she's caught while hiding, I wouldn't give much for her chances of escaping a verdict of first-degree murder. Mr. Keene, you're just trying to scare me into telling you what... In other words, you know where your sister is. Miss Rainsley, I took this case to help your sister if she's innocent, not to convict her. But I see I'm getting no cooperation from you. Perhaps I'd better drop the whole thing and let Ann Brooks face the situation alone. Mr. Keene, you... You really mean you want to help her? If she's innocent, yes. She won't be the first innocent person Mr. Keene's helped to freedom, mister. And don't forget it. Yes, I I know his reputation. I'd put my trust in Mr. Keene if I were you, Ainsley. And I assure you, I'm just as anxious to see Anne in the clear as you are. Mr. Keene, call the Hotel Newton. The number is Central 4, 1174. Ask for Miss Brown in room 103. She's hiding there under an assumed name? Yes, Mr. Keene. Anne may never forgive me for giving her away, but I'm putting my trust in you. Hotel Newton. Miss Brown, please. Room 103. One moment, please. Yes? Is this Anne Brooks? Who are you? My name is Keene. I'm investigating the murder of your husband. I never heard of Anne Brooks. There's no one here by that name. I'm only trying to help you, Mrs. Brooks. If you'll just trust well, keep me... Keep away from me. I warn you, keep away. You're not going to take me. If you try to do it, I won't be responsible for what happens. Hello? Hello, hello? My sister hung up on you, Mr. Keene? Yes, Mr. Ainsley, with a threat. She may try to get away again. Or she may remain there at the hotel and do something foolish when we arrive. But in any case, we're going after her. Come along, Mike. We're heading to the Hotel Newton and a long talk with Mrs. Ann Brooks. In just a moment, we'll return to Mr. Keene and the case of murder with a thousand witnesses. Meanwhile... Beware of unpleasing breath that breeds between teeth. Get Colinell's toothpaste with amazing dental floss action 
for a clean mouth and a pleasing breath. Most unpleasing breath breeds between the teeth, in the deep recesses where food particles can collect and decay. These are the places that must be reached to have a really clean mouth, a pleasant breath. Your dentist knows this to be true. Now, Kalinos toothpaste gives you dental floss action. That is, sends thousands of active cleansing bubbles to penetrate hard-to-reach dental areas. Helps dislodge bits of food that can cause unpleasing breath and tooth decay. What's more, Kalinos has high polishing action. Brightens dingy teeth by removing ordinary yellow surface stains. Kalinos is gentle, safe for even children's teeth and tender gums. Enjoy its cool, clean, minty flavor. Most refreshing toothpaste ever. Test Kalinos in your own way. Keeps your teeth bright, your breath right. Kalinos toothpaste is dentist approved, dentist recommended. Get the Kalinos with dental floss action today. Save 31 cents on the giant economy size. Now back to Mr. Keene and the case of murder with a thousand witnesses. Mr. Keene, the great investigator, and his partner, Mike Clancy, are investigating the murder of William Brooks, a wealthy country squire who was poisoned to death while judging a baking contest at a county fair near his home. Mr. Keene has just discovered that beautiful Ann Brooks, the victim's wife, who was suspected of murder, is hiding in a nearby hotel under an assumed name. And as he and Mike reach the room she's occupying... Well, this is it, Mr. Keene. Room 103. we better handle this carefully, Mike. Ann Brooks knows she's under strong suspicion of murder. She may prove to be difficult to reason with. Knock on the door. Well, there's no answer. The hotel clerk said he didn't see her leave. Use the key he gave us. Boss, look. She's sitting in a chair over there, just staring out of the window. Yes. I think she's been weeping, Mike. Mrs. Brooks. Yes? I'm Mr. Keene. This is my partner, Mike Clancy. Who? Come to turn me over to the police? We've come to talk to you. I'm glad you didn't try to get away after we phoned. There's no point in running away. I'm tired and beaten. They believe I killed William, my husband. There doesn't seem to be any way to prove my innocence. Perhaps everyone doesn't hold to that theory, Mrs. Brooks. What do you mean? It doesn't seem logical to me, for instance, that you murdered your husband. You mean you really want to help me? I wouldn't be here if I didn't. I would have notified the police at once. I love my husband, Mr. Keene. I didn't kill him. I didn't. Do you feel you can answer my questions calmly now and tell me everything I want to know? Yes. Yes, of course, Mr. Keene. Now, the poison that killed your husband was in the cakes you baked. Tell me, when did you prepare them? The night before we went to the county fair. Why did you enter the baking contest at the fair? I understand you were an actress before you were married, and your domestic experience is limited. I decided to enter the baking contest because of Miss Wilkins. Your husband's housekeeper? Yes, Miss Keene. She worked for the Brooks family for many years. She resented my marriage to William. Perhaps she hoped he'd have married her someday. At any rate, I had to prove something to Miss Wilkins and to William, my husband. What was it you wanted to prove, Mrs. Brooks? That I wasn't useless in the house. That I could cook and clean and do anything I had to do to make him comfortable. So you learned how to bake and tried to win a contest at the county fair to impress your husband? Yes, Mr. Keene. Hmm. Who was in your home the night you prepared those cakes, Mrs. Brooks? William... Miss Wilkins and my brother John Ainsley. I remember I quarreled with Miss Wilkins that night. I was in the kitchen and the cakes were in the stove. She came in while I was mixing the icing. You say Miss Wilkins, the housekeeper, quarreled with you? Yes, Mr. Keene. She accused me of messing up the kitchen. She said I'd left a box of rat poison on the pantry floor and that it was dangerous. Rat poison? Well, I remember looking for something in the pantry, and maybe I took the box out of, of poison out by accident. Well, never mind the quarrel at the moment, Mrs. Brooks. Just tell me, what happened to that box of rat poison? Miss Wilkins said she replaced it where it belonged. Hmm. Now, while you were mixing the icing for the cakes, did you leave the kitchen for any length of time? 
Why, yes, I did, for five minutes. I wanted to talk to my husband. About what? Uh, I thought Miss Wilkins was going too far. I decided to have it out with my husband about her. But I changed my mind when I found him in the study. He was upset. He... Yes, Mrs. Brooks? Why was your husband upset? He asked me a very odd question. He wanted to know if I'd ever been involved in a scandal before he married me. Mm -hmm. What did you tell him? I was amazed. I denied it, of course. He seemed to take my word for it, Mr. Keene, because he looked relieved. And then you returned to the kitchen and the cake icing, eh? Yes. Now, tell me, Mrs. Brooks, what ingredients did you use for the icing? A prepared chocolate mixture and sugar, mostly. Sugar I... from a bowl? Uh, yes, Mr. Keene. And did you leave the bowl in plain view when you were out of the kitchen? It was on a table next to the stove. Mike. Yes, boss? I think I have an important clue to the murder of Mr. Brooks. I'm going to take you back to your home, Mrs. Brooks, and give you a chance to clear yourself. Your brother is there with Lawrence Hilton. Lawrence? Is he a good friend of yours? Why, yes. He's an actor, and we toured in the same theatrical company. I haven't seen him in quite a while. I asked them both to wait at your home. Oh, um, just one thing more, Mrs. Brooks. Uh, can we get inside the house and into the kitchen without being seen by anyone in the living room? Why, yes. There's a service entrance, Mr. Keene. Good. I think we'd better get started. Uh, incidentally, can you brew a good pot of coffee, Mrs. Brooks? <laughs> yes, Mr. Keene. But what's coffee got to do with all this? It may enable you to go free and point an accusing finger at your husband's murderer. <laughs> We are, Mr. Keene, Mr. Clancy. This is the kitchen. Be very quiet, Mrs. Brooks. Where is that sugar bowl you used the night before your husband's murder? Usually kept in this cabinet. Yes, here it is, Mr. Keene. It's empty, boss. Well, that doesn't matter, Mike. We'll fill it up again with sugar. Very well, Mr. Keene. Now you start to brew that pot of coffee, Mrs. Brooks, and serve it when it's ready, exactly as I instructed you to. All right. Meanwhile, Mike and I will join John Ainsley, Miss Wilkins, and Mr. Hilton in the living room. And I, I still don't see what you're getting at, boss. You may find out, Mike, that a murderer can be caught with a bowl of sugar. Good evening. Oh, it's Mr. Keene and his partner, Mr. Clancy. We didn't hear you come in the front door, Mr. Keene. We came in through the service entrance, Miss Wilkins. Did you see my sister? Yes, I did, Mr. Ainsley. How is she? Anne hasn't done anything foolish, I hope. On the contrary, Mr. Hilton. Mrs. Brooks is in the kitchen right now, preparing some coffee for us. Coffee? At a time like this, Mr. Well, Keene? As good a time as any, Miss Wilkins. And that means Anne's been cleared of suspicion. She's free? Not quite. She must turn herself over to the police tonight. But what? Anne... Good evening. Here, let me help you with that tray, Mrs. Brooks. Oh, thank you, Mr. Clancy. I think everyone can use a cup of coffee. It's going to be a strenuous night, I'm afraid. Would you serve, Mrs. Brooks? Of course, Mr. King. This is crazy. We're sitting here drinking coffee as if nothing... Sugar, Mr. Ainsley? Oh, I don't care. Either way. Give your brother two teaspoons of sugar, Mrs. Brooks. How about you, Miss Wilkins? Yes, I'll have some coffee. Sugar? Please. And now, Mr. Hilton... I don't care for coffee, thank you. You don't, Lauren? Why, well, I remember how fond of it you used to be when we were on the road together with the play. Was I? All right, I'll have some, uh, but no sugar. I already put sugar in it just a moment ago. I also remember how you liked your coffee. Very sweet. I'll have a cup, Mike. And take one for yourself. It certainly smells good. Oh, you're not drinking your coffee, Mr. Hilton. I... I don't feel very well, Mr. Keene. I believe I'll leave. Not until you had that coffee. What? You heard what the boss said. You either drink up, Mr. Hilton, or I'll take you over my knee and feed it to you. That's not a bad idea, Mike. No! Let go of me! No! That's all I wanted to know. Put the handcuffs on him, Mike. Get out of my way! Never leave with your right, Mr. Do <sighs> you have a little more of the same, or you behave yourself? I think he'll be quiet now, Mike. Well, these bracelets will make sure of that, boss. I... I don't understand. What's it all about, Mr. Keene? Lawrence Hilton murdered your brother-in-law, Miss Drainsley, and tried to place the blame on your sister Anne. But, but how could he have done it? I think I can reconstruct the story now, Miss Wilkins. 
Hilton was hiding outside the kitchen window when you and Ann Brooks quarreled about that rat poison. When you both left the kitchen, he placed some of the deadly poison in the sugar bowl. And when Mrs. Brooks returned, she innocently mixed it in with the cake icing. That's why Hilton refused to drink the coffee just now. He thought the poison was still in the sugar bowl. And that's how I hoped to trap him. But why, Mr. Keene? Why should he want to murder Mr. Brooks? Well, from what Mrs. Brooks has told me, perhaps I can guess that too. William Brooks asked his wife if she had ever been in a scandal before she married him. Obviously, someone had told him she had and tried to blackmail him. Am I right, Hilton? You may as well talk, mister. You don't have a chance to get away with it anymore. All right. Brooks said he was going to turn me over to the police for blackmail. He threw me out of the house. I killed him to protect myself. In other words, after you saw William Brooks, you hid outside on the grounds, trying to find a way to strike back at him. And then when you overheard his wife's conversation in the kitchen, you thought you had your perfect opportunity. I wanted to marry her once. She refused. Who did she think she was, a goddess? You didn't love me, Lawrence. You only wanted to marry me because I was the star of the show and a good friend of the producers. And you thought I could further your career. So you saw through Hilton even then, Mrs. Brooks? Yes, Mr. Keene. But I never dreamed he'd resort to murder. When he heard of your advantageous marriage, he thought he'd cash in on it. So he tried to blackmail your husband by creating a sordid lie about your past. And he hoped he'd be able to strike back at you for turning him down. Hilton, you thought your plan for murder was clever. But it really wasn't at all. And I think you'll agree with that when you are convicted of murder. Mr. Keene finds the solution to the case of murder with a thousand witnesses. It's time now for Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. Ladies and gentlemen, Anison and Kalinos present Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction and one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday at the same time, the famous old investigator takes from his file and brings to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. Tonight's case is entitled, The Case of the Man Who Invented Death. If you want incredibly fast relief from the pain of headaches, neuritis, or neuralgia, try Anison. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, it contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients that give effective relief. If you've not been introduced to Anison by your own physician or dentist, let me urge you to try it yourself. You can get Anison tablets at any drug counter. For most effective relief, use only as directed. I'll repeat the name for you. Anison, A N A C I N. Now for Mr. Keene and the case of the man who invented death. Our scene opens in a rather shabby rooming house in metropolitan New York. A well dressed, middle aged man is just descending the stairs to the second floor as a heavy set woman in an apron calls up to him irritably. Who's there? Who's climbing up them steps? His name is Marley, George Rockwell. Well, if you come to see that crazy Amos Piper, he's not in. But he must be. Well, I tell you, he's not in. The more I got half a mind to lock him out. He hasn't paid his rent in over three weeks. And I'm not running a charity home. It's the poor landlady who's trying to get along. All right, Mrs. Marley. I understand. I'll pay Amos rent for him. Well, that's more like it. But I'm sure he must be in. I had a very important appointment with him at this hour. I know he wouldn't break it without letting me know. Did you see him go out, Mrs. Marley? No. It's just that I haven't heard him tinkering around with his fool inventions all morning. Anyway, what with the electricity going bad? I've had more trouble this morning. The electricity has gone off? I called for the service man, but he, he hasn't Mrs. come Mrs. Marley, yet. do you smell smoke? Well, sure I do. 
It is smoke. It's coming from under Amos Piper's door. Quick, open it up with your key. All right, I will. Oh, but the place is on fire. <laughs> There's smoke. <coughs> it's just a burned electric wire. This is Molly. Look. Oh, it's Amos Piper. He's lying on the floor. Don't touch him. Call the police. Amos has been electrocuted. He's dead. Are you sure that Amos Piper's death wasn't an accident, Mr. Ruckel? Positive, Mr. Keene. But if Mr. Piper was fooling around with high-voltage electricity, as you say he was, seems to me he was just letting himself in for trouble. And I agree with my partner, Mike Clancy. Tell me, Mr. Ruckel, why are you so sure it was murder? Because someone had tampered with Amos Electric Equipment, Mr. Keene. The police agreed with me when I pointed it out. Certain wires had been deliberately changed and an electric booster had been added, raising the amperage and the voltage. That's why the lights in the rooming house blew out. Amos had used that equipment many times before. It would have happened much sooner if the invention had been dangerous as it was when we found the body. Just what was he trying to invent, Mr. Ruckel? A machine for turning base metals like lead and brass into gold. Saints preserve us. What do you think he was, a magician? Well, many years ago, Mike, certain men who were called alchemists believed it was possible to turn cheap metal into precious gold. Yes, that's true, Mr. Keene. But in modern times, we recognize how impossible that is. Amos Piper must have been an eccentric. I suppose he was, but he was also a dreamer. One of the kindest men I've ever known. And I'm going to miss him. How long had you known each other, Mr. Rockwell? At least 20 years. When we were younger, we both dreamed of being important scientists and startling the world with our inventions. But I was more realistic than Amos. I knew after a while that dreams alone won't make one successful. So I entered business and forgot about inventions. I see. I now own a manufacturing plant, but Amos kept right on trying to invent things. Did he ever hit the jackpot, Mr. Rockwell? No, Mr. Clancy. His big ambition was the gold machine. Once or twice he turned out a few trifling inventions which he sold. He managed to eke out a small livelihood on his royalties from those. But more often than not, I had to come to his rescue financially. Although, most of the time, he never knew. I can see that you felt very close to Amos Piper, Mr. Rockwell. Tell me, did he have any enemies that you knew of? No, Mr. Keene. He was a man who never harmed a living soul. Some fiend devised a way to get rid of him for some reason. And I want to do everything in my power to see that the murderer doesn't go unpunished. I understand. That's why I came to you, Mr. Keene. You have a reputation for being one of the greatest investigators in the country. Not only that, but you have a genuine sympathy for the underdog, for people who are wronged. Well, Amos was wronged. No matter how eccentric his ideas were, he was a good man. And no one has the right to take anyone's life, Mr. Rockwell. Then you'll enter this case and investigate it along with the police? I'll do everything I can. Thank you, Mr. King. I knew I could count on you, sir. Now tell me one thing more before Mike and I have a look at the scene of the crime. You say the day you found Amos Piper's body, you had an important appointment to see him? Yes. He phoned me the night before and begged me to come over on the following morning. Did he tell you why? No, Mr. King. He just appeared very excited and said he was on the verge of some great discovery. Up to now, neither the police nor I have been able to find out just what that discovery was. Well, perhaps this mysterious discovery might provide us with an important clue to Amos Piper's murder. At any rate, we'll keep it in mind, Mark. As we try to put our hands on one of the cleverest killers we've ever come up against. There's no doubt of his cleverness, Mr. King. When you think of the way he set up that contraption to electrocute poor Amos. We can bring him to justice, Mr. Rockwell. We'll show him a more reliable electric machine invented by the state. The electric chair for murderers. <laughs> Yes? Are you Mrs. Marley, the landlady? I am. My name is Keene. This is my partner, Mike Clancy. Mr. Keene, the famous investigator? Well, please come in, sir. Oh, thank you. Uh, what can I do for you, Mr. Keene? I'd like to look at the room where Amos Piper lived before he was murdered. Oh, why, of course. Uh, come this way, please. It's on the second floor front. Seems everybody wants to look at that room. First the police, and Mr. Decker, and now you. And who is Mr. Decker? Oh, he's quite a gentleman. 
He comes here lots of times to see Amos Piper. Uh, he's in some kind of business, uh, uh, office equipment, I think. Uh, he's in the room right now. Um, there's the room, Mr. Keene, right in front of you. Well, thank you. Uh, um, I just want you to know that I was a friend of Mr. Piper's, a good friend, and the murder was a terrible shock to me. If I can help you in any way... I'll I... be certain to let you know, Mrs. Molly. Oh, very well, Mr. Keene. She was certainly anxious to prove what a pal of Amos Piper she was, if you ask me, boss. Yes, I noticed that too, Mike. Well, let's go in. Oh, <laughs> excuse me. That's quite all right. I was just leaving. Are you Mr. Decker? Uh, Norris Decker, yes. And you are... Mr. Keene. This is Mr. Clancy, my partner. Oh, yes, yes, of course. The, the great investigator. I presume you're here to look into the death of Amos Piper? Yes. Is there anything you can tell us about it, Mr. Decker? You can find out all I know, or the police for that matter, by examining that apparatus in the corner. That's what killed Amos. I'll have a look at it, boss. Do that, Mike. It was an unfortunate affair, to say the least. When I first heard about it, I was sure it was an accident. But after talking to the police, I realize now it was premeditated murder. What made you think it was an accident at first, Mr. Decker? Because of Amos Piper's idiotic scheme to turn lead into gold. <laughs> For a while, he almost had me believing it, too. Hmm. You're a close friend of his? No, I was interested in his work in a business way. I'm an investor, Mr. Keene. I use my money to back inventions that are worthwhile, particularly ideas in new business equipment. And is that what you were seeing Amos Piper about, Mr. Decker? Yes. He told me of an invention he had for a new type of carbon paper, thin enough and strong enough to make over 50 copies at once. I see. Well, it, it seemed like a saleable idea, and I thought we could both make a bit of money out of it. But then he was killed, and the invention has disappeared. And that's why I came here today. I, I wanted to see if I could find the sample. That's some contraption, boss. It's set up like some kind of, a, of an electric oven. Hmm. That was another of Piper's ideas for turning base metals into gold. He was an extraordinary man, but a bit on the eccentric side. And his private life seemed to be even more peculiar. How do you mean, Mr. Decker? Well, once I walked in here, Mr. Keene, and found him in an argument with a lovely young girl, at least 30 years younger than he. She wore a mink coat and was fashionably dressed... As I came in, I noticed her motor car and chauffeur in front of the door. Who was the girl? I don't know. She left when I walked in, and the landlady told me later that the girl had come once before and had had a terrible row with Piper. I see. Did she know why? No, and neither of us knew how a man as simple, a man as poor as Piper, could have any relationship with a woman who was obviously very wealthy and... Uh, well, young enough to be his daughter. She couldn't have been his daughter. I'm told that Piper never married. Well, whoever she was, Don't we... Don't decide in the room now, miss. The police? Well, there's Mr. Keene, the famous investigator. I'll come back some other time, Mrs. Martin. Mr. Keene, that yeah. sounds like the voice of the girl I was just telling you about. Don't say anything about my being here, please. Boss, look at the car parked in front of the door. It looks like one of them fancy foreign makes. Mike, come along. I don't want that car to get out of our sight. We'll follow it and find out a bit more about this mysterious girl and her connection with Amos Piper. She just went into that house, boss. Oh, it's certainly an elegant one. Let's drop in for a chat, Mike. Well, I'm looking for a young woman who just entered here. My name is Keene. We What uh, young woman? Sure, and the pretty one with the fur coat. A chauffeur just left her at the door and then drove away. You must have the wrong house. I'm sure we haven't. And I say you have. Oh, this young fellow must think we're a couple of kids, boss. Maybe he'd like we us to... He may have been mistaken, Mike. What, Mr. Keene? We were halfway up the block when she disappeared. She could have gone around the corner. But Mr. Keene, with me on two eyes... I'm so sorry to have troubled you, Mr... Uh... Webb. The name is on the door. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Good day. Mr. Keene, you don't really think we made a mistake, do you? Of course not, Mike. But Mr. Webb was lying so obviously, I prefer to find out in our own way what he was up to. 
What time is it now? It's a uh, little after six. It'll be dark soon. We can enter the house through the rear. Perhaps we can get a little more information from Mr. Webb and the young woman we followed when they least expect it. Information that might lead us to Amos Piper's killer. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to Mr. Keene and the case of the man who invented death. Meanwhile, beware of unpleasing breath that breathes between the teeth. Use Kalanos toothpaste with dental floss action. Those cracks and crevices where food particles can decay must be reached to have a really clean mouth, a welcome breath. Your dentist knows this to be true. Use Kalanos toothpaste with dental floss action. Kalanos gives amazing dental floss action. That is, sends thousands of active cleansing bubbles to penetrate hard-to-reach dental areas. Helps dislodge bits of food that can cause unpleasing breath and tooth decay. Use Kalanos toothpaste with dental floss action. Kalanos has high polishing action, too. Brightens dingy teeth by removing ordinary yellow surface stains. Kalanos is gentle, safe even for children's teeth and tender gums. Enjoy its cool, clean, minty flavor. Kalanos is dentist recommended. Cleans your teeth bright, keeps your breath right. Use Kalanos toothpaste with dental floss action. Get Kalanos with dental floss action today. Now back to Mr. Keene and the case of the man who invented death. Mr. Keene, the famous investigator, and his partner Mike Clancy are investigating the strange murder of Amos Piper, an eccentric inventor who was electrocuted when one of his inventions was cleverly tampered with by the murderer. Now Mr. Keene has followed a strange young woman to a well-to-do house in the suburbs. A woman who Mr. Keene believes may have a strong bearing on the case. At the door, however, Mr. Keene and Mike were blocked by a rather belligerent young man. Now, a short time later, the two investigators decide to enter the house through a rear entrance. There's a light in the room right in front of us, Mike. Let's see who's inside. Right, boss. I'm leaving the house, Elliot. Wait, Mike. And I say you're staying here. You want to be picked up by Mr. Keene? I have nothing to hide. And maybe I can help him solve Uncle Amos's murder. Now you listen to me, Lorna. I've got a reputation to think about. You want to ruin me in business? Doesn't my Uncle Amos mean anything at all to you? No. Besides, he's dead now, and there's nothing anyone can do about it. That's where we disagree, Mr. Webb. Elliot, who are these men? How did you get in here, Keene? My partner and I decided to enter without an invitation, Mr. Webb. Inasmuch as you were so anxious to keep us out. Why, I'll throw the two... Elliot! It won't do any good, and you know it. Not only won't it do any good, but I'm not so sure he can manage it. I overheard you say that Amos Piper was your uncle. Yes, Mr. Keene. I'm Lorna Webb. And Elliot here is my husband. May I ask why you made those secret visits to your uncle before he was murdered? I'll answer that for you, Keene. She was trying to keep me from finding out. Is that right, Mrs. Webb? Yes. But after your uncle was murdered, didn't you realize how serious the situation was? Didn't you think of contacting the police and identifying yourself even then? No, Mr. Keene. Why not? I... I don't know. Go on, Lorna. Tell him. Tell him you think I'm a murderer. Turn your own husband into the police for a crime he never committed. Elliot, why do you talk that way to me? We used to be so happy. That was before I found out you were seeing Amos again, in spite of what you promised. What was your objection to Amos Piper, Mr. Webb? He was nothing but a lazy sponger, Mr. Keene. He knew Lorna married a man with money, and he was just biding his time to take advantage of it. That's not true, Elliot. I begged Uncle Amos to come and live with us, but he refused. I... I know I handled this the wrong way. And I know you were jealous of Uncle Amos. Jealous? I don't quite understand the situation, Mrs. Webb. Perhaps you can explain. Mr. Keene, I'd been fond of Uncle Amos ever since I was a child. I worshipped him then. But Elliot, my husband, didn't want me to worship anyone. Even a poor old man. He wanted all my affection for himself. I'm afraid now I've made a mess of things and I'm going to regret it. Mr. Webb. Does that explain your attitude? Mr. Keene, I... I admit I, I didn't like Amos Piper. But I wasn't jealous enough to kill him. That's ridiculous. And there's no basis for believing it. Well, is that what you believe, Mrs. Webb? No, Mr. Keene. Of course I didn't believe my own husband killed my uncle. If I did, I... I wouldn't be here now. 
We followed you here from the rooming house where your uncle lived, Mrs. Webb. Why did you return there today? To get Uncle Amos things, to look for his invention. He has a sister, my Aunt Martha, who is old and very poor. Whatever Amos had should go to her as his closest survivor. Exactly what invention were you looking for? The carbon paper or the machine he hoped would turn metal into gold? No, I was looking for the dye. The dye? Does that have anything to do with the new type of carbon paper he invented? I don't think so. I remember Uncle Amos telling me something about that carbon paper. He said the idea had been stolen from him. Did he know who stole it, Mrs. Webb? No, but he really didn't care. He didn't think it amounted to much. But the dye seemed to be worth something. Even Elliot thought so. I don't know anything about it, Lorna. When I described it to you, you said it might make a fortune. Well, maybe it was another one of your uncle's crackpot ideas. Like the gold machine. Just what do you know about the dye, Mr. Webb? Well, Mr. Keene, according to Amos, it was, a, it was a brighter, faster, and cheaper dye than any other now on the market. That he could make it in all colors. But he, he might have been dreaming again. Hmm. I wonder if Mrs. Marley, the rooming house keeper, would know anything about that dye. Or the carbon paper, for that matter. Mrs. Webb, would you get your coat? What for? I want your wife to accompany me back to Mrs. Marley's rooming house, Mr. Webb. You've got nothing on Lorna. I won't let you involve her in that murder. Then you do care what happens to me after all, Elliot. Do you think I ever really stopped caring? Oh, then we have nothing to be afraid of. You come too. Let's do everything we can to help Mr. Keene and Mr. Clancy. Is it okay if I go along, Mr. Keene? Of course, Mr. Webb. As a matter of fact, I want everyone involved in this case to be present when we discover the solution to Amos Piper's murder. Mrs. Marley, the Roman housekeeper, doesn't seem to be in, Mr. Keene. The door may be open, Mike. Try it. It is, Mr. Keene. Good. Come inside, Mr. and Mrs. Webb. All right, Mr. Keene. Come along, Lorna. The house is pitch dark, sir. There's no one here. Chance preservers, what's that? What is it, Mike? I stumbled into something here on the floor. Wait till I get my flashlight out. <gasps> Mr. Keene. It's the body of a man. Boss, it's Mr. Rockwell. Yes. And his neck's been broken. Oh, no! Steady, Lorna. Keep your flashlight on his body, Mike. I just noticed something on his wrists. It looks like some kind of paint. It's a dye. A green dye. What was that? Sounded like Mrs. Marley. She's upstairs, boss. Yes, yeah, she's probably in the room where Amos Piper was murdered. Mr. Webb, you and your wife, stay down here and don't touch the body. Come on upstairs, Mike. Certainly. After I turn you over to the police. Mrs. Marley and Mr. Decker, boss. Oh, Mr. Keene. Oh, you've come at precisely the right time. Well, what's going on here? If you're looking for Amos Piper's murderer, there she is. That's a lie. I didn't kill him. Are you also going to deny you stole one of his inventions and sold it in your own name before it was patented? How do you know about this, Mr. Decker? Because I caught her one day coming out of the patent office, Mr. Keene. And I investigated. She stole Amos Piper's invention. Then killed him so he wouldn't turn her in. Do you deny that, Mrs. Marley? Mr. Keene, I'll admit I stole it and sold it to someone. But I only made a couple of thousand dollars on it. And I certainly didn't kill the old man for that. What about George Rockwell? What? The dead man downstairs. Dead man? You mean another man's been murdered, Mr. Keene? Yes, Mr. Decker. Didn't either you or Mrs. Marley see the body down there in the front hall? Oh, I didn't, Mr. Keene. Who entered this room first? She did. I found her here when I came up. I was still searching for that new invention of Amos Piper's. I found her here fooling around with that, that devilish contraption in the corner that killed Amos. Well, what have you to say for yourself, Mrs. Marley? Uh, I didn't mean any harm, Mr. Keene. I, I just wondered if there was anything in what Amos Piper believed, that he could turn metal into gold. I thought maybe I'd find something... And this was the first chance I got to look for myself. Up to now, this room's been filled with policemen and investigators. But I never touched that machine. Why, I'd be afraid to. We've caught you red-handed and you know it. Take her away, Mr. Keene. I'll be happy to testify against her. I imagine you would be, to save your own skin, Decker. What? 
Decker, did you say you caught Mrs. Marley red-handed? Well, I've caught you green-handed. <laughs> you mean here on my hand? <laughs> why, why, this is just pain. Really? And when did you get it on your fingers? Well, two or three days ago. Odd that it took so long to dry. You left some of it on George Rockwell's wrists. What? Only a man with strength could have killed Rockwell. He was a pretty big man himself. But someone with a knowledge of, well, let's say, judo or jiu-jitsu could have accomplished it. You must know a little something about judo yourself, Keen. Enough to tell when it was used to break someone's neck. Search him, Mike. Don't make a move, I warn you. Oh, he's even got himself a gun, boss. Now, you're pretty clever, Keen. I've got to hand it to you. I imagine you even know where this green dye came from. Amos Piper's invention. Right. And tonight I found a sample of it at last, along with a formula. <laughs> the old fool never even realized he had something that would bring a fortune on the world market. But you did, Decker. I most certainly did. I also knew I had to take care of Rockwell. You see, he was a little too close to Amos Piper. And sooner or later, he might have surmised why Piper was killed. And then he'd have thought of me. I'm afraid you won't get away with it, Decker. You pose as an old man's friend and benefactor to defraud him of his valuable invention, then killed him to cover your fraud. You're not going to get away with either the theft or the murder. And who's going to stop me? Maybe I will, mister. Come on and try it if you want a bullet through your head. Don't move, Mike. He means what he says. <laughs> I'll say I do. And what's more, I'm... Oh! He tripped on the machine! Uh, help me! Help! Mr. King! Cut your electricity off outside quickly, Mrs. Marley. I want Mr. King. Oh, boss, he's getting a terrific electrical shock. Don't touch him until the current's been cut, Mike. He'll pass the shocks on to you. Sands preservers. He's dead, Mr. Keen. Yes. He shorted some wires in that machine when he fell over it. You mean he died the same way his victim died, boss? In Amos Piper's case, the electrocution was deliberately planned. Decker's was caused by a short circuit as he tripped over the machine. In any event, Mike, the result was a form of poetic justice. Amos Piper may have thought he was inventing a machine that turned things into gold. But it appears as though he actually invented death. And so Mr. Keene finds the solution to the case of the man who invented death. The next time you're suffering from the pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, try Anison. You'll bless the day you heard of this incredibly fast way to relieve these pains. Now, the reason Anison is so wonderfully fast-acting and effective is this. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing Anison tablets from their own dentist or physician, and in this way have discovered the incredibly fast relief Anison brings from pain of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. So next time such pain strike, take Anison. For most effective relief, use only as directed. Your druggist has Anison in handy boxes of 12 and 30, and economical family size bottles of 50 and 100. The name is Anison, A-N-A-C-I-N. <laughs> The Community Chess asks you only once a year to contribute or to pledge your share in their wonderful red feather services, which benefit your community the year round. The list of services supported by the Community Chest is almost endless. Whether day nurseries, guidance clinics, scouts visiting nurses help, YMCA or neighborhood centers, the value of all their services to you and to your community is very great. Everybody benefits, so everybody gives. Mr. Keene 
Tracer of Lost Persons is based on the novel Mr. Keene. The radio sequel is originated and produced by Frank and Dan Hummer. Dialogue by Lawrence Clee. Bennett Kilpack plays Mr. Keene. It is on the air every Thursday at this time. Don't miss Mr. Keene next Thursday when the kindly old Tracer turns to the Silver Dagger murder case. It's time now for Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. Ladies and gentlemen, Anison and Kalinos present Mr. Keene, the tracer of lost persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction and one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday at the same time, the famous old investigator takes from his file and brings to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. Tonight's case is entitled The Silver Dagger Murder Case. When you think of a headache, think of Anison. When you have a headache, get Anison. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, it contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients. It gives incredibly fast, effective relief from the pain of headaches, neuritis, or neuralgia. Millions have turned to Anison tablets for this reason. If you're one of those who have not already been given Anison by your own physician or dentist, let me urge you to try it. Results will surprise you. For most effective relief, use only as directed. I'll repeat the name, Anacin, A-N-A-C-I-N. All drug counters have it. Now for Mr. Keene and the Silver Dagger murder case. Our scene opens in a three-story, privately owned white stone house in metropolitan New York. On the first floor, in a handsomely furnished study, decorated with curios from many parts of the world, a beautiful woman sits at her desk, deeply engrossed in writing a letter, unaware that death is lurking just outside her door. And this is to tell you that we must not see each other again. Apparently, you misjudged my motives... And made a grave mistake. I am not in love with you, and I never was. Good luck, and the best of everything. Edna. Who's there? Who? What are you doing here in my apartment? I thought I made it plain that you were not to see me again. How dare you touch my things? Leave that dagger on the wall. Did you hear what I said? What are you doing with that dagger? No! No, don't! Uh, you... You... Uh, uh. Sorry to disturb you, Mr. Keene. Oh, that's quite all right, Mike. Well, there's a strange-looking fellow in the outer office. He wants to see you. A strange-looking man? And he's got a French accent, but he's he's wearing an outfit like a moving picture extra. Says his name is Lafarge, and it's a matter of life and death. Hmm. Well, I'll see him at once, Mike. Right, sir. And wait till you get a look at his makeup, boss. Sure, all he needs is a camel, and he'd be set for a trip across the desert. You wanted to see me? You are Monsieur King? Yes. My name is Lafarge, Monsieur Jean Lafarge. I am grateful that you can send to see me, Monsieur King. The the uh, situation cannot wait. Please sit down, Mr. Lafarge. You've met my partner, Mike Clancy. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, can I ask you one question, Mister, before you tell the boss what's on your mind? But naturally, Monsieur Clancy. Where did you get that outfit? I am a North African, Monsieur. My home is in uh, French Morocco. Part of this costume is Arabian. Oh. You don't mind my saying so, Miss Lafarge. You don't look Arabian to me. I am French, Monsieur Keene. My parents left France and moved to North Africa to Casablanca when I was a child. What was it you wanted to see me about, Mr. Lafarge? Murder, Monsieur. Saints preserve us. What's going on? 
Last night, a woman named Edna Coring was killed in a home here in New York. Edna Coring? Seems to me I've heard that name before. She was a very wealthy and beautiful woman, Mr. Keene. Much in the news. Well, I didn't read about a murder in the papers this morning. It was kept from the papers, Monsieur Clancy. The police believe they will have a better chance to catch the killer if there is no publicity at the moment. Then how did you learn about it, Mr. Lafarge? I had an appointment with Edna, Miss Coring, last night. When I reached the house, the police were there investigating her murder. The man who found her body, a servant, told me what happened. And you spoke to the police? No, monsieur, I did not. I left immediately without going upstairs. I see. But please, let me explain everything first. Very well, Mr. Lafarge. I, uh, I first met Miss Coring in North Africa three years ago. She was on a tour, and she came to my place of business... I am an exporter of African curios, Mr. Keene. And she was fond of collecting odd souvenirs on her travels. What sort of odd souvenirs? Oh, masks, silverware, and knives. It, uh, it was a solid silver knife that I sold her. A dagger. It was used by her murderer. And is that why you were so reluctant to speak to the police? Because you had sold her the murder weapon? That and uh, my relationship with Edna Coring, we were very good friends, and nothing more. But the police may think... Mr. Keene, it is not for myself alone that I beg for your assistance. Edna Coring was a wonderful woman. It is only fitting that I should ask you, one of the greatest investigators in the country, to see that her murderer is caught. It seems to me, Mr. Lafarge, that your story isn't complete. Monsieur, are you holding anything back from me? You are a very discerning man, Monsieur Keene. Yes, there is something else. I only hesitate because I don't want to involve a young man who may be innocent. Who is this young man? His name is Alan Cody. He is a young, ambitious playwright who is still unknown. I have every reason to believe that Edna Coring was in love with him. She told me about young Cody. You also have reason to believe Alan Cody may have murdered her? She told me several days before her death that she was breaking off with him. She said that she intended to send him a letter, but I could see it was making her nervous. She wasn't quite sure how he would um, react. Why was Edna Coring breaking off with this young man? She said there was too much of a difference in their ages, at least 14 years. Perhaps there was another reason, I do not know. However, if I may suggest it, Young Cody would be the man to question first about her murder. Yes, obviously. Here is my card, Mr. Keene. I will write young Cody's address on the back for you. Very well. You have no idea how grateful I am for your help. This, this horrible thing has become a nightmare. But now I feel safe. You're safe, Mr. Lafarge, as long as you remain on the list of innocent people. I beg your pardon? If I accept this case... I intend to make a thorough investigation of everyone connected with it, Mr. Lafarge, including you. I understand that, Monsieur Keene. Very well. Mike Clancy and I will have a talk with Alan Cody. Perhaps he'll prove to be a starting point in our search for Edna Coring's murderer. <laughs> Yes? We're looking for Alan Cody. Does he live here? Why do you want to see him? I'll explain when I meet Mr. Cody. Who is it, Juliet? Someone to see Alan. Oh, someone else? May I ask who you gentlemen are? Uh, my name is Juliet Forsythe, and this is Mrs. Cody, Alan's mother. My name is Keene. My partner, Mike Clancy, and Keen. I... I knew it. Something awful has happened to Alan, Mrs. Cody... Mr. Keene's a private investigator. Calm yourself, Juliet. I trust my boy implicitly. I knew those other men who came here this morning were policemen, even though they weren't in uniform. And now, Mr. Keene... Mrs. Cody, has someone questioned you about your son, Alan? Yes, Mr. Keene. They were looking for him. They didn't tell me why, but they acted like plainclothes police. They probably were. You see, your son is involved in a murder case. No! Juliet... 
Please leave me alone with these gentlemen. I'll phone you at your flat later on. Very well, Mrs. Cody. I'll expect to hear from you. Miss Forsyth and your son are friends, Mrs. Cody? Yes, Mr. Keene. Juliet and Alan have been friends since childhood. She's a wonderful girl and my son is a good boy, no matter what they think he may be involved in. Where is he now, ma'am? I don't know, Mr. Clancy. And if I did, I wouldn't tell you until you've explained what Alan has to do with all this. A woman named Edna Coring was stabbed to death in her apartment last night. Edna Coring? You knew her, Mrs. Cody? Yes, and so did Alan. That's why we want to question but him. But if you think my son had anything to do with it, Mr. King... I understand your son was in love with a murdered woman. That's not true. Then what was his relationship with her? Well, it was purely business. He's just finished writing a play, and Edna Coring was interested in helping him get it produced. She had money and... I know that. However, my information links your son with Mr. Coring in more than a business way. Then your information is wrong, Mr. Keene. Mrs. Cody, please don't think I've come here believing your son had a part in Miss Coring's death. All I'm looking for are facts, and I thought he might be able to help me. I haven't seen Alan in three days, Mr. Keene. Hmm. Does he live here with you? Most of the time, but he also has a small studio where he often works when he wants privacy. Where is that studio, Mrs. Cody? I don't know. You mean you won't tell me? Mr. Keene, Alan is my boy. He's all I had left in the world after his father died. I'd sooner die myself than do anything to hurt him. I respect your feelings as a mother, Mrs. Cody. But I don't blame you. But if I could only convince you that we're here to help him if he's innocent. Perhaps you'll cooperate. I... I don't want to be rude, but I've said all I'm going to say. Very well, Mrs. Cody. Let's go, Mike. Mr. Keene. Yes? I swear to you, my son is innocent. For your sake, Mrs. Cody, I hope I can prove it. But my mission is to find Edna Coring's killer. And when I do, I don't intend to spare him. The penalty that all murderers must pay for their crimes. Well, this is Edna Coring's house, Mr. Keene hmm. She hasn't owned this entire Whitestone building Well, perhaps there's someone inside well, No one seems to be in, boss I beg your pardon are you looking for someone? Oh, do you happen to know if anyone is home in Miss Coring's residence? Are you friends of hers? My name is Keene. My partner and I are private investigators. Oh, yes. I'm Anson Howe, Edna's husband. Her husband? I didn't know she was married. Edna and I were secretly married one week ago in Chicago. I've just come from police headquarters, Mr. Keene. I was told that you two were investigating Edna's murder... Please come inside. I, I have a key to the house. I only found out about Edna this morning when I arrived from Chicago. I'm not able to control my emotions completely as yet, so please forgive me. I understand, Mr. Howe. But perhaps you can tell me... Uh... Boss, what was that? Something hit the floor in that room. There must be a prowler in the house. Keep your gun handy, Mike, and let's investigate. Right, boss. I'll open the door. Fast. Stand where you are, young fella. Don't make a move. Who are you? I... I just came to see Edna Coring. Is I... your name Alan Cody? Yes. I thought so. How did you get in here? The door was open. It happened to be locked when we came in. Sure, and he climbed through that open window, boss. Well, all right. But I haven't taken anything. Except my own property. You mean that manuscript under your arm? If you'll let me pass, please. Just a moment, Alan. Let me see that manuscript. It's mine. I gave it to Edna to read, and I've taken it back. The boss asked for the script, young fella, so just be polite and hand it over. Give that back to me. Now, take it easy. Here it is, Mr. Keene. Hmm. Alan, your play has an interesting title. Has it? The Dagger. It's a mystery melodrama. So I gathered. Sit down, Alan. What are you going to do, Mr. Keene? I'm going to read your play from cover to cover. It might prove to be as interesting as its title. The Dagger. 
Edna Coring, you remember, was stabbed to death with a silver dagger. In just a moment, we'll return to Mr. Keene and the silver dagger murder case. Meanwhile, beware of unpleasing breath that breathes between the teeth. Use Kalanos toothpaste with dental floss action. Those cracks and crevices where food particles can decay must be reached to have a really clean mouth, a welcome breath. Your dentist knows this to be true. Use Kalanos toothpaste with dental floss action. Kalanos gives amazing dental floss action. That is, sends thousands of active cleansing bubbles to penetrate hard-to-reach dental areas. Helps dislodge bits of food that can cause unpleasing breath and tooth decay. Use Kalanos toothpaste with dental floss action. Kalanos has high polishing action, too. Brightens dingy teeth by removing ordinary yellow surface stains. Kalanos is gentle, safe even for children's teeth and tender gums. Enjoy its cool, clean, minty flavor. Kalanos is dentist recommended. Cleans your teeth bright, keeps your breath right. Use Kalanos toothpaste with dental floss action. Get Kalanos with dental floss action today. Now back to Mr. Keene and the Silver Dagger murder case. The murder of beautiful, wealthy Edna Coring brings Mr. Keene, the famous investigator, and his partner, Mike Clancy, to the scene of the crime. Miss Coring's New York residence. There, Mr. Keene discovers that the victim had been secretly married to a man named Anson Howe, and had apparently also had a close relationship with Alan Cody, a young playwright. Mr. Keene has surprised young Cody in the study, attempting to get hold of a copy of his latest play, which the murdered woman had had in her possession. Now, as Mr. Keene reads the manuscript of the play, which is titled The Dagger... When did you finish this play, Alan? Four weeks ago, Mr. Keene. Have you read it, Mr. Howe? Yes, my wife showed it to me. Edna said she was interested in producing it to help this young man, Alan Cody. I'd never met him, but I know who he is. You mean... You were married to Edna Corey? Yes. Mr. Howe and Edna were secretly married last week, Alan. By the way, Mr. Howe, why did you and your wife keep your marriage a secret? We only kept it a secret so there wouldn't be too much newspaper publicity, Mr. Keene. And I thought she loved me. Edna told me all about you. She said she befriended you because she thought you were talented, but that you became infatuated with her. Apparently that's the theme of this play of Alan. A young man falls in love with an older woman and stabs her to death. Uh, Mr. Keene. Yes, Mike. Will you just look at the walls of this room? I noticed them before, Mike. Edna Coring had some odd souvenirs. My wife collected these masks and weapons as a hobby, Mr. Keene. The silver dagger that was used to kill her was taken from the empty space on that wall over there. Hmm. Mr. Howe, do you know a man named Lafarge? Jean Lafarge, the French Moroccan? Yes, he was also in love with my wife before I married her. But he was a sensible man, Mr. Keene. Alan Cody here was different. What do you mean? I mean that I think you had something to do with my wife's murder. You have anything to offer as proof, Mr. Howe? You've just read his play, haven't you, Mr. Keene? Yes, but that's not proof of murder. It might have been a coincidence. The money he filched from my wife was no coincidence. Why, you lying... Just stay put, young fella. What money are you referring to, Mr. Howe? Edna gave Alan Cody $15,000. You'll find three cancelled checks in her bank statements... For 5000 each, endorsed by Alan Cody. I don't know a thing about that money. Mike, look through that desk and see if you can find those bank statements. Oh, I'll find them for you. They're right here in this drawer. You'll find them in this bundle of checks, Mr. Keene. For all I know, Cody tried to squeeze more money out of Edna. She refused, so he killed her. And if it's the last thing I do, I'll make certain he pays for it. Alan, Mr. Howe is telling the truth. Here are those checks, totaling $15,000 and endorsed by you. But, but that isn't my handwriting, Mr. Keene. It's a forgery. Write your name on this sheet of paper, quickly. Write my name? Yes, here's a pen. There you are, Mr. Keene. Hmm. Look at this, Mike. Well, sure, and his handwriting isn't the same as on those checks, boss, but... Maybe he's disguising his signature on purpose. Well, isn't anyone on my side? Do you all think I'm guilty? Even your mother knew how you felt about Edna. She came here once and quarreled with Edna. Threatened her if Edna didn't break off with you. Leave my mother out of this. I'm sorry, Alan, we can't. In view of what Mr. Howe just said about threats. 
please phone your mother now. Look, Mr. Keene, arrest me if you want to, but leave her alone. I've caused her enough unhappiness already. Alan, will you phone your mother or must I? All right. I'll do it. Juliet? Yes. Is this Alan? Yes. Let me speak to Mother, please. She's ill, Alan. She's in bed. The doctor just left. What's the matter with her? The strain was too much for her. Worrying about you. You'd better come home right away. I'll be right over. Mr. Keene, my mother's been taken ill. I've got to see her. Please give me a break. I won't try to run away. You'll find me there with my mother when you want me. On my word of honor. Your word of honor isn't enough in this case, Cody. Keep out of this, Howell. I think we can trust him, Mr. Howell. Go on, Alan. But don't leave your mother's flat until you hear from me. Thank you, Mr. Keene. How could you let him go, Mr. Keene? Suppose he... Alan Cody didn't murder your wife, Mr. Howell. At least he never endorsed these checks that were made out to him. Tell me, did your wife make these out herself? Is this her handwriting? Yes, of course. She told me she'd sent money to Alan to help him produce his play. And did she tell you that she sent these checks to him directly? Why, no, I just took that for granted. When we're dealing with murder, Mr. Howe, we take nothing for granted. Suppose we all follow young Cody to his mother's house. I have an idea that the solution to your wife's murder is there. <laughs> Mr. Keene, please come in. Thank you. Juliet, you know my partner, Mike Clancy, and this is Mr. Howe, Miss Juliet Forsyth. How do you do? How do you do? How is Mrs. Cody? A little better. May we see her? Of course. She's in the bedroom with Alan. Please come with me. Mike, let me have that statement I made out before we left Edna Coring's study. Uh, here it is, boss. I still don't understand why you typed that thing out, Mr. Keene. You have complete authority to investigate the case. You don't need a statement to that effect from anyone. I prefer it this way, Mr. Howe, for my own reasons. Please come in, Mr. Keene. Mr. Keene. How do you feel, Mrs. Cody? A little better, thank you. The doctor said Mother would be all right, providing she wasn't subject to any more strain. It's her heart. Mrs. Cody, I'm convinced now that your son is innocent of Edna Coring's murder, and I'm going to prove it. Oh, Mr. Keene... Do you really mean that? The boss never meant anything more in his life, ma'am. Incidentally, this is Mr. Howe. He's married to Edna Coring. <gasps> married? Then I was right about her. After all, she was shameless. Take it easy, Mother. I'm all right, son. I just want you to know that when I interfered in your behalf, I knew what I was doing. Then you saw Edna Coring, Mrs. Cody. Uh, Mr. Keene, I knew she was only amusing herself with Alan... I saw her and warned her never to speak to him again or I wouldn't be responsible. Mother, be careful of what you say. I'm not afraid. I have nothing to hide. Perhaps not. But you made one mistake, Mrs. Cody. Edna Coring was only trying to be fair to Alan. She never led him on. Is that right, Alan? Yes. But if you think my mother's quarrel with Edna had anything to do with her murder... Alan, right now all I want is complete authority to investigate this case thoroughly. But you already have that, Mr. Keene. I need it in writing, Mrs. Cody. I've prepared a statement to that effect, and Mr. Howe has already signed it. I want the rest of you to add your names. Mike, your pen, please. Okay, boss. Here, here you are. Uh, Miss Cody, sign here, please. There you are. Alan? There. Well, I guess that's all we... Oh, wait. Uh, suppose you sign it, too, Juliet. After all, you're involved in this, too, as Alan's best friend. I'd be glad to sign, Mr. Keene. There you are, sir. Oh, thank you, Juliet. Now I don't want to cause Mrs. Cody any more distress, so I'll leave you for the time being. May I stay here with Mother, Mr. Keene? Yes, Alan. It's quite all right. Oh, uh, Mr. Howe. May I speak to you in the living room before I leave, please? Very well. And you too, Juliet? Excuse me, Mrs. Cody. I'll be right back. What is it, Mr. Keene? Mr. Howe, I wanted to tell you that I found your wife's murderer. 
What? But I prefer to finish this case out here so as not to excite Mrs. Cody. Mr. Keene, you mean you know who killed Edna Coring? Yes. Who? You did, Judith. What? Don't try to deny it. A moment ago when you signed this statement I pretended to need, I saw that your signature matched the endorsements on these checks of Edna Coring's. You write with your left hand, Juliet, which gives your handwriting a peculiar slant. But, Mr. Keene, how did this girl get hold of those checks for my wife? Your wife believed Juliet Forsyth could be trusted as Alan's best friend. She wanted to help him produce his play, but thought perhaps he wouldn't accept her money after she broke off with him, and that Juliet could persuade him. But Juliet promptly forged Alan's signature and cashed the checks herself. No, that's a lie. Now listen, young lady, you raise a rumpus and scare that old lady inside and I'll carry you out my back. Edna Coring took Alan away from me. All my life I hoped he'd marry me. But he... he never knew. And Edna Coring stole him away. Are you trying to say that you killed Edna Coring because of your love for Alan? Don't you see, Mr. Keene? I wanted to protect him from her. I admit I was terribly jealous, but I, I thought of him as well. In other words, Juliet, you're looking for sympathy. Well, I'm going to disappoint you. There is no excuse for murder and no sympathy for it, even less in your case. How can you say that? Look at me. Am I pretty? Am I rich and beautiful like Edna was? No. All I had was Alan and she... You claim you loved Alan, yet you stole money that was rightfully his. Love such as yours is false, Juliet. You stabbed Edna Coring to death to cover your theft and forgery. No! No! Maybe jealousy had a part in it, too. <laughs> Maybe your mind did become twisted over the years. But the fact remains that you murdered primarily for profit. That's how you'll be tried. Take her away, Mike. I'll put in a call to Lieutenant Hale at police headquarters and tell him that the Silver Dagger murder case is finally solved. And so Mr. Keene finds the solution to the Silver Dagger murder case. The next time you're suffering from the pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, try Anison. You'll bless the day you heard of this incredibly fast way to relieve these pains. Now, the reason Anison is so wonderfully fast-acting and effective is this. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing Anison tablets from their own dentist or physician, and in this way have discovered the incredibly fast relief Anison brings from pain of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. So next time such pain strike, take Anison. For most effective relief, use only as directed. Your druggist has Anison in handy boxes of 12 and 30 and economical family size bottles of 50 and 100. The name is Anison, A-N-A-C-I-N. Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, is based on the novel Mr. Keene. The radio sequel is originated and produced by Frank and Ann Hummer. Dialogue by Lawrence Clee. Bennett Kilpack plays Mr. Keene. It is on the air every Thursday at this time. Don't miss Mr. Keene next Thursday when the kindly old Tracer turns to the Martin Street murder case. It's time now for Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. Ladies and gentlemen, Anison and Kalinos present Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction and one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday at the same time, the famous old investigator takes from his file and brings to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. Tonight's case is entitled The Case of the Ruthless Murderers.
People appreciate Anison most when they want quick relief from sudden pain of headaches, neuritis, or neuralgia. At times like that, you don't want to wait. You want fast relief. So get Anison and keep it handy. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, it contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Many people have been first given Anison tablets by their own physician or dentist. So for your own sake, let me urge you to try Anison. For most effective relief, use only as directed. You can get Anison, A-N-A-C-I-N, at any drug counter. <laughs> Mr. Keene and the case of the ruthless murderers. Our scene opens in the office which Mr. Keene, the famous investigator, shares with his friend and partner, Mike Clancy. At the moment, Mr. Keene is in his private office, while Mike is at the outer office file case, unaware that trouble is about to make a sudden and unexpected appearance. Hmm, let's see now. Where did this go in file C? Yes, mister. Can I... Stay where you are. Don't make a move or I can shoot. You're still pretty fast on the draw, Clancy. Fast enough to be one step ahead of you, Rod Marble. Turn around. I'm not carrying a gun. You think I want to spend another five years stretching the pen? What's the trouble, Mike? Take a look at who just come into the office, boss. Rod Marble, isn't it? That's right, Mr. Keene. I'm the man you helped send to jail for bank robbery five years ago. I got out this morning. Boss, do you remember the last thing this fellow said at the trial when the judge asked him if he had anything to say? Yes, Mike. I remember very well. I said I'd kill you in cold blood, Mr. Keene, when I got out. But you can tell your partner here to put his gun away. I didn't come here to your office to start anything. Well, he's not carrying a gun, Mr. Keene, but I wouldn't trust him anyway. All right, Mike. Let's hear what Rod Marble has to say. Mr. Keene, I'm sorry I made that threat against your life. Huh. Apologizing, is he? Now I'm sure he's got something up his sleeve. Five years in prison gives a man plenty of time to think and change his mind. I forgot my ideas about getting revenge and hitting back at you long ago. All right, Marble. If you didn't come here to get revenge, why did you come? I wanted to ask you one question, Mr. Keene. What question? Someone gave you the evidence that helped send me up. Someone squealed, one of my old gang. Who was it? I'm sorry. That's something I can't tell you. Look, Mr. Keene, give me his name and you'll never hear from me again. What's more, I'll give you every dollar I own if you'll tell me. Do you want to go back to prison, Marvel? This time it might be the electric chair. I don't care. If I could just get my hands on the rat who squealed on me and sent me to the You pen, won't I'd... get that information from me, Marvel. Okay. But I'm going to find out who he is if it's the last thing I do. And there's a man who's looking for trouble, Mr. Keene. And if I ever saw a fellow who was out for blood, he's it. If it's trouble he wants, Mike, I'm afraid he'll get it. And it may be more than Rod Marvel bargained for. The car's parked on the corner, Mr. Keene. Uh, this way, sir. This is my special edition of the afternoon papers, Mike. Yeah, I wonder what the extra is. I'll get a copy from that newsboy, boss. Extra business, my word. Extra paper, mister. Yeah, here you are, boy. Here you are, the body. Extra business, my word. Look at the headline, Mr. King. Extra. Prominent businessman found murdered. His name is Neil Justin. Neil Justin? Let me see that paper, Mike. Sure, and he's some kind of a big manufacturer, isn't he, Mr. King? Yes, was found with three bullets in his body in a phone booth downtown. There were no witnesses to the crime, the paper says. And it took place at about four this afternoon. That was just an hour ago. Rod Marvel was in our office at three. He could have had time to leave, track down Justin and murder him. Yeah, but Mr. Keene, what would Marvel have to do with a, a man like Neil Justin? Mike, Mr. Justin was the man who gave me the information five years ago that helped send Marvel to jail. Saints preserve us. Then Marvel must have murdered him. He must have come to our office to establish an alibi by saying that he was with us at the time of the murder. It's entirely possible. Mike, perhaps you'd better drop me off at police headquarters. I think I'll have a talk with Lieutenant Hale. Okay, Mr. Kitt. Well, looks as if someone made a mistake. 
A mistake, Mike? Yeah, there's a woman sitting in our car, boss. So I notice. Excuse me, ma'am. Don't you have the wrong car? Are you Mr. Keene, sir? No, I'm Mike Clancy, his partner. Mr. Keene's right here. Oh, one of the elevator boys in your office building pointed your car out to me, Mr. Keene. My name is Rena Soffer. I, I just had to see you. Why didn't you come up to my office? I didn't have an appointment, and I thought someone in your office might not let me see you. Mr. Keene, you've got to help me. They've arrested my husband, Tom, and he's innocent. Arrested him for what, Mrs. Soffer? The murder of Neil Justin. I, I know how you've helped people, sir. Everybody's heard how kind you are and how fair. And Tom's innocent. He didn't kill Neil Justin. If your husband is innocent, I'm sure the police will give him every chance to prove it, Mrs. Soffer. But you don't understand. Tom has a record, a criminal record. Now I remember his name, Mr. Keene. Tom Soffer's been under suspicion at police headquarters. They think he's a gang killer. No, that's not true, Mr. Clancy. My, my husband's weak, I know. I, I've tried to keep him away from his bad companions, but... He's not a murderer. He'll get a chance to prove that, Mrs. Soffer. Mr. Keene, please just, just go down to the jail and talk to Tom. That, that's all I ask. And if he doesn't convince you that he's innocent, I, I won't bother you again. Very well, Mrs. Soffer. Uh, there's a phone booth in that cigar store, Mike. We'll call Lieutenant Hale and ask if we can see Tom Soffer. Oh, thank you, Mr. Keene. I'll, I'll never forget your kindness as long as I live. I'll go back now and tell Tom you're coming. All right. But I warn you, if your husband is guilty, I may have to help convict him. I'll take that chance. Goodbye, Mr. Keene. Goodbye. Let's make that phone call to police headquarters, Mike. Right, boss. Well, here's an empty phone booth, Mr. Keene. I I'll make the call, sir. You know, Mike, this case isn't as obvious as it appears. It may prove a lot more difficult to solve than we imagine. Hello? Police headquarters? Lieutenant Hale, homicide squad, please. Lieutenant, Mike Clancy. I, I'm calling for Mr. Keene. We hear you've just picked up a man named Tom Soffer for the Justin murder. Huh? What's that, Lieutenant? Uh, just a second. Mr. Keene. Yes, Mike. Tom Soffer broke away from his arresting officer. He's loose. Well, let me talk to Lieutenant Mike. Lieutenant Hale, it's Mr. Keene. I suppose you sent out a general alarm for Tom Soffer. Well, I suggest you send out another alarm for Rod Marble. That's right. Marble was just released from the state penitentiary. Yes, I'll explain when I reach your office in 15 minutes. Goodbye, Lieutenant. Sure, now it's beginning to look as if this fellow Soffer may be just as guilty as Marble, Mr. Keene. Well, they both didn't kill Neil Justin, Mike. And there's always a chance that someone new may enter this case. In any event, I'm going to the lieutenant's office and then home. Get in touch with me there if you learn anything new of importance. <laughs> Are you Mr. Keene, sir? Yes. I've been waiting for you here in front of your apartment for the past two hours. I'm Arthur Justin, Neil Justin's son. Oh, uh, come in, Arthur. Please sit down. Thank you. Mr. Keene, you've read about my father's murder. I've come here to ask you to help solve the case. I'll be glad to help you, Arthur. I happen to be working on the case already. You are? Yes, a criminal named Rod Marble is involved in it. Have you ever heard his name mentioned? No, sir. But if you think he murdered Dad, you're wrong. What makes you so sure, Arthur? Because I think I know who the killer is. Although I need some evidence. That's why I want your help, sir. Who is the suspect you have in mind? A man named Luke Homer. My father was very worried for weeks before his death. He said someone was shadowing him. Dad was in fear of his life. Mm -hmm. What did this man Homer have against your father? Well, I, I don't know, Mr. Keene. And I never knew why Dad didn't go to the police either. But I did something about it. What did you do? I trailed Homer. I spotted him outside the house a few days before Dad's murder. And I followed him from then on. I found out his name and occupation. He's a mechanic. 
I can point him out to you, Mr. Keene, and you can do the rest. Where is he? He gets home from work about nine every night, and this is his address. If you meet me on this corner at five of nine this evening, sir, you'll be able to put a pair of handcuffs on my father's murderer. Well, we can certainly question this man, Luke Homer. Very well, Arthur, I'll meet you. Uh, perhaps I ought to come alone, however, without my partner or the police. If Homer sees his house is being watched, he may not show up. All right, Mr. Keene. Then I'll see you on the at street corner tonight at nine, and we'll proceed from there. Arthur, is that you? It's Mr. Keene, over here. Is that you up? Mr. Keene! Mr. Keene, where are you? Over here, Arthur. I heard two shots. Are you hurt, sir? Let me help you. In just a moment, we'll return to Mr. Keene and the case of the ruthless murderers. Meanwhile... Beware of unpleasing breath that breathes between the teeth. Use Kalanos toothpaste with dental floss action. Those cracks and crevices where food particles can decay must be reached to have a really clean mouth, a welcome breath. Your dentist knows this to be true. Use Kalanos toothpaste with dental floss action. Kalanos gives amazing dental floss action. That is, sends thousands of active cleansing bubbles to penetrate hard-to-reach dental areas. Helps dislodge bits of food that can cause unpleasing breath and tooth decay. Use Kalanos toothpaste with dental floss action. Kalanos has high polishing action too. Brightens dingy teeth by removing ordinary yellow surface stains. Kalanos is gentle, safe even for children's teeth and tender gums. Enjoy its cool, clean, minty flavor. Kalanos is dentist recommended. Cleans your teeth bright, keeps your breath right. Use Kalanos toothpaste with dental floss action. Get Kalanos with Dental Floss Action today. Now back to Mr. Keene and the case of the ruthless murderers. Mr. Keene, the great investigator, and his partner, Mike Clancy, have been investigating the murder of Neil Justin, a well-known businessman. Although Mr. Keene already has two suspects, Rod Marble and Tom Sopper, both men with criminal records, Neil Justin's son, Arthur, has come to Mr. Keene accusing still a third a man named Luke Homer. Arthur Justin has told Mr. Keene where Homer lives and made an appointment with a famous investigator to meet nearby at nine in the evening. Now, as Mr. Keene keeps his appointment and waits for Arthur Justin, he's suddenly ambushed. Mr. Keene! Mr. Keene, where are you? Over here, Arthur. I heard two shots. Are you hurt, sir? Well, let me help you. It was only a miracle that saved me. Some instinct made me drop to the pavement just before he fired. Did you see who he was? No, no, I'm afraid I could never identify him. Please forgive me. It was my fault. If I hadn't been a few minutes late for our appointment, I would... It doesn't matter, Arthur. It's quite possible if you had been here, you'd have been killed yourself. Mr. Keene, the man who tried to kill you was the murderer of my father. It was Luke Homer. It must have been. Well, there's no point waiting around here any longer. You'll never come back. I'm going to return to my office, Arthur. At this hour of night, Mr. Keene? I have a complete file of every known criminal in the country. And perhaps I'll find Luke Homer's name in it. We've sent out a general alarm for two other suspects involved in your father's murder, Rod Marble and Tom Soffer. Now we'll add this man, Luke Homer, to the list. <laughs> Well, there's nothing in the file here about a man named Luke Homer, Mr. Keene. Oh, just about gone through the list. What time is it, Mike? It's almost midnight, sir. You know, I just had an idea. Seems to me... It's Rod Marble, boss. Don't move, Mike. He's armed. I've got six bullets in this gun, Keene, for you and your partner. I know he was lying, boss. That story about having a change of heart was full. I wasn't lying. I meant every word I said. Keen's the one who changed my mind. And how did I do that, Marble? By telling the police to send out an alarm for me for Justin's murder. 
You're trying to frame me, Keene, and I'm going to put you away just as I promised I would five years ago. Watch out, boss. Are you... Well, he's out cold, sir. And I'll relieve him of that gun. That's nice work, Mike. If you hadn't timed that blow so well, we'd both have a few bullets in our heads. Well, I'll bring him around and then lug him down to police headquarters. The boys will be glad to see this bucko, Mr. Keene. Undoubtedly. But I'm not so sure he's the man they want for Neil Justin's murder. After all this... And after what you told me about being ambushed? That's just it. Mike, I think I have an important clue to follow up. A clue that may prove to be an amazing revelation. Take Rod Marble to headquarters, then get a good night's sleep. We'll both need all our energy when we return to this affair tomorrow morning. Yes, you can reach me here in my office, Lieutenant Hale. I'm still working with Neil Justin's son, Arthur, on the Luke Homer angle. But so far, Homer seems to have completely disappeared. However, I have an idea of my own that I've been working on for the past two days. Yes, of course, Lieutenant. I'll keep in touch with you. Goodbye. Mr. King. Oh, hello, Arthur. Uh, has there been anything new, sir? Any any clues to my father's murder? No, nothing yet. Oh, I, I want you to meet my wife, Alicia, sir. Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Justin? I'm very glad to know you. I've heard so much about Mr. Keene, the famous investigator. And I'd like to help you in any way I can, sir. Arthur's father meant almost as much to me as he did to my husband. I think I understand, Mrs. Justin. Alicia's worried, Mr. Keene. She thinks they'll try to get at me in some way. Oh, oh no, that's not why... I... What were you about to say, Mr. Justin? Oh, Mr. Keene, I want to speak to you alone. Alicia, what's the trouble? Are you hiding something from me? Oh, Arthur, I beg you to trust me and do as I say. I can't keep this to myself any longer. I want to see Mr. Keene in private. You know, I've always trusted you, Alicia. I'll do as you ask. I'll be waiting in the car downstairs. Well, Mrs. Justin... What is it you want to tell me? Mr. Keener, I just couldn't bring myself to say this in front of Arthur. It'd tear down all his ideals. But I believe I know who murdered his father. Do you? Neil Justin was involved with a woman named Sarah Blows. He'd known her ever since his wife died, and before as well. I see. I believe he tried to break off with Sarah, and she took revenge. She's a violent type, Mr. Keene, I know, because I've met her. Do you know where the Sarah Blows can be located? Yes. But what do you intend to do, Mr. Keene? See her, of course, immediately. If what you say is true, I'll break this case wide open, Mrs. Justin, inside of an hour. Yes? Are you Sarah Blows? That's right. My name is Keene. Mr. Keene, the famous investigator. I'd like to talk to you about a man named Neil Justin, who was murdered a few days ago. Neil, please uh, come in, Mr. Keene. Step into the living room and we can talk. A couple of friends of mine are anxious to join the conversation. What? Don't move, Keene, or we'll blow your head off. What is this? A trap? <laughs> so this is a guy who's supposed to be the biggest investigator of them all. Take a look at him, Pete. I'm looking, Tracy. You don't look smart enough to trail a giraffe. Stop being a comedian, Tracy. Get rid of him and get it over with. Okay, take it easy, sir. Pete. Yeah? We better tie him up in the garage. It's way in the back. If we stay here, somebody on the street might hear us. Get moving, Keen. Somebody might hear you do what? Put a bullet behind your rear, Keen. Well, the great Mr. Keene is tied up good and tight, Tracy. Want me to plug him now? Take it easy, Pete. I'm enjoying this. It ain't often we get a fish as big as Keene to fry. I suppose you two know what the penalty for murder is. The electric chair. Listen to him talk, Tracy. <laughs> You're the one who's getting the death sentence, Keene. Only we're doing the job with a gun. I warn you. You won't get away with this. He's talking too much to suit me, Tracy. Let's get started. Let him talk. 
His mouth ain't gonna be much good for talking in a couple of minutes. Pull that box out and put Keen in it. Mm -hmm. No, 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 wait. You know what this box is for, Keen? You. You and a load of quicklime. We're gonna freeze you in solid, then drop you in the river. No, no, please, have mercy. I'm an old man, but I, I don't want to die. Listen to them crawl. Just like they all crawl when their number's up. I'm not asking you to spare my life. But at least give me my choice. What's he talking about? What choice, Keen? I always feared this day. The day when I'd be cornered and helpless. Because of that fear, I carried a tiny bottle around with me, filled with deadly poison. So what? I've carried it to make it easy. When I knew there was no other way out to spare myself torture, at least let me take the poison. Holy smoke, he wants to make it easier for us. It'll make it easier for both of us. I'll have no pain. You can get away with this crime. I don't get it. All you have to do is leave my body here with the empty bottle of poison in my hand. The police will obviously think I was a suicide. It's a lot safer, Tracy, than having my body discovered full of bullet holes. Because the police would never rest until they'd caught you. What do you think, Tracy? I'm not sure, Pete. Yeah, what do we got to lose? If the old guy's nuts enough to want to do the job on himself, let him. Okay, we'll give Keen a break. Well, thank you. The poison is in a small bottle in my vest pocket. Look, I'm not taking them ropes off you, Keen. You can just open your mouth and we'll pour the stuff in. Anything you say. Just open the bottle and let me drink the poison. Here's a bottle, Tracy. Open it. The bottle is filled with it. I can't see. I'm blind. The door. Where's the door? The door. Come out with your hands up and no funny business. Mike. Mr. Keenboss. Are you all right, sir? Here, I'll help carry out. Just, just hang on. I got your message just in time. Oh, that's good work, Mike. And there's a squad of plain clothesmen outside, sir. We got the others, too. Here's the door, boss. Easy now. I'm all right. Let me cut them ropes, Mr. Oh, thank you, Mike. That invention of mine, the condensed bottle of tear gas, saved my life. I had to put on quite an act to get them to open it. But when they did, the results were perfect. I'm sure, and that was one of the, the slickest inventions I've ever seen, boss. Tear gas condensed in a tiny bottle. Everything okay in there, Clancy? Everything's under control, Casey. Send in the other two. They're putting Sarah Blows and them two murderers into the patrol wagon, boss. But here are two more I know you're looking forward to seeing. I put the handcuffs on them 15 minutes ago and brought them here. Well, Arthur and Alicia, what have you got to say for yourselves? All I've got to say, Keen, is that if I didn't have these handcuffs on... Oh, I'd... take your medicine like a man, Arthur. Keen was too smart for you. I've had my eye on you a lot longer than you think, Arthur. Did you? There was no such man as Luke Homer. You made up the name. Just to lure me into an ambush. And the boss saw right through that Sarah Blows story, mister, and tipped off the police. Then he told me to nab you and keep you under arrest until he located the rest of your outfit. You and your wife were responsible for the murder of your father, Arthur. And it was a horrible crime. And maybe I can tell you why they killed him, Mr. Keene. <gasps> it's Rod Marble. Yes. The man who was a member of your room ring of criminals five years ago, before he was sent to prison. I didn't know it before, Mr. Keene, but you saved my life when you had me picked up on suspicion. Arthur Justin here was planning to put me out of the way along with you. You squealer! Keep your trap shut, Marble. Why shouldn't I squeal? Didn't your father squeal on me to save his own skin so I had to take a five-year rap? That's right, Marble. At the time, Neil Justin's ruse worked. We believed he was a respectable businessman. Instead of a gang leader. I'm willing to talk to Mr. Keene. If I get a break... You'll get justice, Alicia. No more, no less. Keep quiet, Alicia, do you hear? I won't keep quiet. Mr. Keene, do you know why he killed his father? He wanted to take over the racket. His father wanted him out of it. But Arthur got big ideas. And who gave me those big ideas? You did, Alicia. What else have you two got to say? Mr. Keene... Arthur's father had warned him that Marble might talk and convict the gang. So Arthur decided the only way to, was to get rid of you and Marble after he shot his father. Well, that just about cleans things up, boss. I think I'd be taking these two lovebirds outside to the police. Mr. Keene, you certainly put one over on Tracy and Pete with that tear gas invention of yours. Tracy said he thought you were going to take poison and kill yourself. No man ever has the right to take his own life, Marble. That's for God or the law. And as long as you're feeling so grateful to the boss, Marble, maybe there's one request I think he'd like to make. 
Mr. Kane would appreciate it if you said nothing about that trick bottle of tear gas. Yes, Mike, it might help me in the future. When I get into a spot like that again, if the invention would remain a secret. Mr. Keene, you can depend on me to keep it under my hat. All right. Mike will accompany Arthur and Alicia Justin and the others to police headquarters, where we can write the finish to the murder of Neil Justin, a finish that will end in the death house for all concerned. <laughs> And so Mr. Keene finds a solution to the case of the ruthless murderers. It's time now for Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. Ladies and gentlemen, Anison and Kalinos present Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction in one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday at the same time, the famous old investigator takes from his file and brings to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. Tonight's case is entitled The Forgotten Cave Murder Case. It's so unnecessary to suffer from the pain of headaches, neuritis, or neuralgia when Anison gives you such incredibly fast relief. There's a scientific reason for this fast action. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, it contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients. If you're one of those who've never been given Anison by your own physician or dentist, let me urge you to try it. Get a handy box of Anison tablets at your druggist tonight. For most effective relief, use only as directed. It's spelled A-N-A-C-I-N. Anison. Now for Mr. Keene and the Forgotten Cave murder case. Our scene opens in the dark, damp recesses of a cave located deep in an oceanside cliff on Long Island. Two men, both with small electric flashlights are clambering over the slippery rocks, going deeper inside the tomb-like cave. Take it easy, Jim. These rocks are covered with slime. Yeah, let's have another look at that map, Ed. Well, we can't be far from what we're after. Look, Jim. The cave breaks into two passages right ahead of us. And the map doesn't say which one to take. Well, maybe they come together again, farther up. I'll tell you what, Ed. I'll take the left passage and you take the right. No, listen, Jim. Let's get out of here. I'm afraid. Oh, forget it. We may be a hundred yards away from a million dollars. And I'm seeing it through. I'm going into this part of the cave on the left. Jim. Jim. I'm going back. I'm not staying in this cave another half. Jim. Jim. Jim, what happened? Did you fall? <gasps> There's a knife in his back. He's dead. I must see Mr. Keene right away. Right away. Oh, take it easy, young fella. What's got you so excited? I'm Mike Clancy, Mr. Keene's partner. Please let me see Mr. Keene immediately. Either I'm mad or there's been a murder. Saints preserve us. A murder? I uh, overheard what this young man said, Mike. Come in, will you? Let's hear about it. My name is Ed Johnson, Mr. Keene. And I'll never rest until I find who murdered my friend Jim Ramsey. And got away with his body besides. Got away with his body, Mr. Johnson? Uh -huh. Well, that sounds strange. Are you sure your friend was murdered? Mr. Keene, the local police thought I was a crank. They wouldn't believe my story. That's why I came here. Well, Mr. Johnson, I suggest you sit down quietly and tell me just what happened. We were in a cave when Jim was murdered. In a cave? What were you doing there? Looking for hidden gold, Mr. Keene. Maybe pirates. <laughs> That sounds like one of the fairy stories I heard at my mother's knee. Pirate's gold. Well, let him proceed, Mike. Go ahead, Mr. Johnson. I realize it all sounds crazy, Mr. Keene, but it's true. I've known Jim Ramsey for over a year now. We were in the clam and oyster business on 
the Long Island coast. We bought a tract of land for our business. I see. On a deserted part of our land, near the coast, there was an old abandoned house. The place was falling apart, but I've always been pretty handy with tools, and Jim was too. So you decided to repair the house and live in it together near your work, That's eh? right, Mr. Keene. And how did you get this idea of pirate's gold in a cave, Mr. Johnson? We were repairing the chimney, Mr. Mr. Clancy, and... We found a map under some bricks. A pirate's map and a chimney in an old house on Long Island. Well, it still sounds like a like a fairy story to me. Mr. Johnson, I'm afraid Mike doesn't believe in buried treasure. But the map led us to an old forgotten cave. The cave was near the house, about 30 feet underground. That's where Jim Ramsey was murdered and disappeared. Hmm. I guess you don't believe me either. But Jim's death was real. He was murdered. A knife in his back. I saw his body. Well, after the local police left, Mr. Johnson, did you return to the cave to look for your friend's body? I didn't have the map anymore. It was in Jim's pocket when his body disappeared. Besides, I was afraid I'd be murdered like Jim was. Mr. Keene, you're known as one of the cleverest investigators in the country. Someone's been murdered, and something must be done about it. Well, I'm honest to say this whole thing sounds fantastic, Mr. Johnson, but I'll look into it. You mean you'll help me? I'll do what I can. When can you come to Long Island? Sometime this afternoon. All right, there's a train at 1. You'll get to Shellview at 3.30. I'll meet you at the station. Very well. Goodbye, Mr. Keene. Mr. Clancy. And thanks again. Goodbye, Mr. Johnson. So long. Sure, and you're not going to waste your time on a yarn like that, Mr. Keene. I'm almost as suspicious of it as you are, Mike, and yet I'm curious, too. But even the local police think this fellow Johnson's a little off balance. Still... Why would he come here to ask my help? There certainly is a cave. The police were there. Well, boss, do you think that he and his partner may have fallen in with some dope smugglers or something like that? You mean a gang who'd be using that cave to hide their loot? Sure. Well, it's possible. Mike, I see you're becoming just as curious as I am. Well, there's only one thing to do about it. We're going out to that old house in Long Island and that secret cave and see for ourselves. <laughs> Johnson said he'd meet us at the station, but uh, I don't see him, Mike. Well, I know it, Mr. Keene. He's got us way down here in Long Island on a wild goose chase. Are uh, you gents looking for a taxi? I got one right over here. Hire him Webb, gents, at your service. Oh, uh, do you happen to know where the Johnson house is? Uh, you mean that old busted-down hen coop those two fellas lived in? Sure, I can take you there. Come along, Mike. Okay, Mr. Keene. Uh, Mr. Keene, the great investigator. Well... I guess you're here to look into that disappearing body business. Do you know anything about it, Hiram? I mean, how Jim Ramsey disappeared so mysteriously? Uh, maybe I do. Maybe I don't. One thing I do know, though, this section of the country, I know it backwards and forwards. And maybe I can help you out. Oh, thanks, Hiram. Uh, step into the taxi, gents. She ain't very fancy, but she'll get us there. Excuse me. Is this a public taxi? Sure is, ma'am, but she's taken now. Oh, please. I, I'm sure these gentlemen won't mind. This is very urgent. I've got to get up to the Ramsey house immediately. The Ramsey house? Maybe it's known as the Johnson house. It's an old place my husband bought with Ed Johnson. Oh, you're Jim Ramsey's wife? Yes. Margaret Ramsey. Do you know my husband? No, my name is Keene. My partner and I are on our way to that house ourselves. Mr. Keene... According to Johnson, wasn't this lady's husband the one who was murdered in that case? <gasps> murdered? Jim? I... No. No, I don't believe it. I'm sorry, Mrs. Ramsey, but it hasn't definitely been established. All we know so far is that your husband's body has disappeared. I guess you won't object now if I go in the taxi with you, Mr. Keene. Why, of course not. All right, Hiram, let's head directly for that old house. My husband, Jim, left me almost a year ago, Mr. Keene, and I only found out where he was during the past two weeks. We had a bitter quarrel. About what, Mrs. Ramsey? Another woman. She was very beautiful and artist, and she'd fallen in love with Jim. 
But we've been through so much, I felt it was the final straw. How do you mean you've been through so much? Uh, Jim was a dreamer and something of a mystery, even to me. I never heard him mention a word about his family. Oh, I see. He always believed he'd be able to find the, the gold at the end of the rainbow. Every time he came home with a new and sillier scheme to make money, my patience wore thin. Then his relationship with Ann Wharton finished me. And Ann Wharton was the artist who was in love with him? Yes, Mr. Keene. Now you tell me that Jim may be dead, that he was murdered. We're not absolutely sure, Mrs. Ramsey. Oh, saints preserve us. Don't jam your brakes on like that, mister. This taxi will fall right apart. Uh, that feller's half blocking the road. Looks as if his car's bust down. Sorry if I'm in your way. I broke an axle on my car a few minutes ago. You know, if there's a phone nearby, I'd like to call for a tow car. Uh, no telephones in these parts, mister. We're 11 miles from town. Yeah, I know that. I'm going to drop these folks off up the road a bit. If you want to come along, I'll take you to town on my way back. Well, if these gentlemen and this lady don't mind... Well, not at all. Get right in the taxi. Thanks a lot. My name's Bly, Sanford Bly. Mine is Keith. This is Mrs. Ramsey. How do you do? And my partner, Mr. Clancy. Hello. Glad to know you. Did you say Keene, sir? Yes. The well-known investigator? Well, I'm a salesman myself, Mr. Keene. Wristwatches. Long Island's my territory. Uh, there's the Johnson house now, Mr. Keene, up ahead of us. Yeah, sure. And the place looks as if it's ready to fall apart. I wonder where the cave is. The cave? What cave, Mr. Keene? Well, there's supposed to be a secret cave nearby, Mr. Bly. I was inside that cave a long time ago. It's underneath the house. Uh, we can stop right here, I reckon. Uh, what do I owe you, Hiram? Three fifty. Mr. Keene. What is it, Mrs. Ramsey? Look, there's a woman on the ledge near the edge of the cliff. Yes, I see her. She seems to be painting something on an easel. It's Anne Wharton. My husband Jim's been seen her, and I was right. Oh, no. Don't jump to conclusions, Mrs. Ramsey. I suggest we have a talk with Miss Wharton first. Uh, Hiram. Yes, Mr. Keene? Would you mind waiting here with your taxi for a few minutes? Sure. I'll stay. Mr. Bly, would you mind if we delayed you? Not at all. I'll wait in the taxi. Well, come along, Mike. We'll go over there with Mrs. Ramsey and have a talk with Ann Wharton. Okay, boss. You can hear the surf now, Mike. Now that cliff must overlook the sea. This place looks like a desert, boss. Nothing here but sand dunes, rocks, and that broken-down old house. Why my husband came here to such a deserted place, I'll never understand. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Are you looking for... Oh, Mrs. Ramsey. Yes, I'm Mrs. Ramsey. May I ask what you're doing here, Miss Wharton? I'm painting a picture. The view is beautiful from this cliff. How far down is the sea? I'd like to take a look. May I ask where Mr. Johnson is, Miss Wharton? Mr. Johnson? Well, who's he? I don't know him. He's my husband's partner. And I'd like to know where my husband Jim is, too. I had no idea he was anywhere in the vicinity, Mrs. Ramsey. I don't believe you. Mr. King, boss, come here, quick. What is it, Mike? Look down below, Mr. King. Say it's preserve us. It's a man's body floating there in the water. A man's body, did you say? Boss, look at his face. You see who that fella is? He's the one who came to our office. Yes, Mike. It's Ed Johnson, Jim Ramsey's friend. And even from this distance, it's easy to tell that the man is dead. In just a moment, we'll return to Mr. Keene and the Forgotten Cave murder case. Meanwhile... Beware of unpleasing breath that breathes between the teeth. Use Kalanos toothpaste with dental floss action. Those cracks and crevices where food particles can decay must be reached to have a really clean mouth, a welcome breath. Your dentist knows this to be true. Use Kalanos toothpaste with dental floss action. Kalanos gives amazing dental floss action. That is, sends thousands of active cleansing bubbles to penetrate hard-to-reach dental areas. Helps dislodge bits of food that can cause unpleasing breath and tooth decay. Use Kalanos toothpaste with dental floss action. Kalanos has high polishing action, too. Brightens dingy teeth by removing ordinary yellow surface stains. Kalanos is gentle, 
Safe even for children's teeth and tender gums. Enjoy its cool, clean, minty flavor. Kalinost is dentist recommended. Cleans your teeth bright, keeps your breath right. Use Kalinos toothpaste with dental floss action. Get Kalinos with dental floss action today. Now back to Mr. Keene and the forgotten cave murder case. Mr. Keene, the famous investigator, and his partner, Mike Clancy, are investigating a situation that seems to grow more dangerous and mysterious with every passing hour. First, a man named Edward Johnson came to Mr. Keene and said his business associate and friend, Jim Ramsey, had been murdered in an old forgotten cave on Long Island, and the body had disappeared. Now, when Mr. Keene and Mike appear at the scene of the crime, they find that Johnson himself has suffered his partner's fate, and his body pushed off a cliff into the sea. A few minutes later, Mike has succeeded in recovering the body, and as he and Mr. Keene examine it on the beach at the foot of the cliff, was stabbed, Mr. Keene. There's a knife between his shoulder blades. Yes, Mike. Ed Johnson was stabbed and pushed into the sea. We'd better send word to the police in town. Well, we'll tell that hillbilly Hiram Webb to drive back in his taxi. Oh, here's Sanford Bly, the salesman we picked up on the road. What's the trouble, Mr. Keene? I... Holy smoke. Is he dead? Yes, Mr. Bly. He was murdered. Wait a minute. I've seen that man before. You have? Where? On the road, Mr. Keene, about a half an hour ago. Just before my car broke down, I passed a man and a woman walking along the side of the highway. And Johnson here was the man? Yes, sir. Look up there in the cliff, Mr. Bly. Mrs. Ramsey is standing near the edge with another woman, a Miss Wharton. Why, that's the woman who was walking with Johnson on the road. Are you sure? Positive. She was wearing a beret like an artist. I guess you and your partner, Mr. Clancy, here want to report this murder immediately. Yes. Right now, I intend to have a talk with Ann Wharton. Well, here's Miss Wharton, boss, and Mrs. Ramsey. What happened to that man who was floating in the sea, Mr. Keene? It was Mr. Johnson. He was dead, Miss Wharton. He was evidently murdered by the same person who killed Jim Ramsey. You mean Jim is dead, too? Yes. But up to now, his body hasn't been discovered. I... I never knew. I never dreamed. Didn't you? Then what were you doing here? You didn't come to paint a picture. Miss Wharton, just why did you come here to this old house, if not to see Jim Ramsey? All right. I'll admit it now, Mr. Keene. I did come to see Mrs. Ramsey's husband. I hoped I could make up with him. What do you mean, make up with him? I'm afraid I made a mistake about Jim. I thought he'd left his wife for good when I fell in love with him. Later, when he broke off our relationship, I realized I was wrong. It was his wife he loved, not me. Then why did you follow him here? I wanted to help him make up with you, Mrs. Ramsey. I don't believe her, Mr. Keene. It's true. Miss Wharton, you said before that you didn't know Jim's partner, Mr. Johnson. But Mr. Bly told me that he saw you walking along the road with him. That's right. He was the man whose body you just found. But I didn't lie to you, Mr. Keene. I only asked him the way to the ocean. I didn't know that man's name was Johnson. Oh, Miss Wharton, I suggest that you and Mrs. Ramsey wait inside the house. Mr. Keene, you mean you're holding me on suspicion of murder? I'm holding you as well as everyone else until this murder case is solved. I'm sorry if I implicated Miss Wharton, Mr. Keene. I didn't mean to make a suspicious character out of her. For that matter, I suppose I fall into that category myself. Why, Mr. Bly? Well, after all, my car broke down just a short distance from here. And I was near the scene of the crime. But only a homicidal maniac would murder for no reason, and you don't appear to be a maniac. Oh, by the way, do you have the correct time? The police will want to know exactly when we found Johnson's body. Why, uh... It's five minutes to five, Mr. Keene. Ah. Boss, there's the taxi, but where's the hillbilly taxi driver? Oh, here he comes now. Well, Mr. Keene, I guess I may as well start back to town. Where have you been, Hiram? Just looking around a bit. We just discovered the body of a murdered man. What? I want you to report it to the town police immediately. Oh, I'll get back to town in my taxi as fast as I... 
Mr. Keene. What is it? Come over here and look at this. What's the trouble? My tires. All four of them are flat. The car is useless. Four flat tires isn't exactly a coincidence. I'll say it ain't. Someone must have punched holes in them. Who's going into town to tell the police, Mr. Keene? May I make a suggestion? What is it, Mr. Bly? Well, my car's broken down, too, but I have four good tires. My car's the same make as Hiram's, only much newer, of course. Now, if you wanted to take the trouble to switch tires, it might solve the problem. That's not a bad idea, Mr. Keene. Well, we can try it anyway, Mike. Well, between Hiram, Mr. Bly, and myself, why, we can do the job in an hour. All right. Meanwhile, I'm going to take a look at that forgotten cave. Uh, the entrance is just below the cliff over there on the right, Mr. Keene, near the old house. Well, Mike, uh, perhaps you can switch those car tires yourself with only Mr. Bly's help. Oh, I think we can manage it, boss. What about me? You seem to know your way around here quite well, Hiram. I'd like you to guide me to the forgotten cave, to the place where Jim Ramsey's body was last seen. <laughs> Here's the spot, Mr. Keene. At least this is as far as the police went. And how far into this cave did you go, Hiram? Well, no further than this. I don't mean on the day Ramsey's body disappeared. I mean half an hour ago. What? When you left your taxi a little while ago, you came to this cave again. How do you know that, Mr. Keene? I noticed there was slime on one of your hands. And it came from these damp walls. I wasn't trying to put something over on you, Mr. Keene. I swear I wasn't. Then what were you doing in this cave? I, I was just snooping around. You found something, though. I can tell by your manner that you're hiding very important facts from me. Mr. Keene, I, I found the body. Jim Ramsey's body. Where? Come over here, Mr. Keene. See for yourself. <laughs> Bend down. And reach behind this flat rock. All right. Do you feel anything? Yes. The body of a man. It's undoubtedly Jim Ramsey. There's a small tunnel in there. But nobody would have found it except me. I don't see how you found it either, Hiram. Uh, I used to play in this cave years ago when I was a little shaver, Mr. Keene. I know every nook and cranny in the place. Just a minute, I can... Feel something in Jim Ramsey's pocket. Ah, there it is. Well, I'll be darned. Well, this is the so-called treasure map, Hiram. Do you know anything about it? No, Mr. Keene. I, I, I've been telling you the truth. I, I had nothing to do with them murders. Well, Hiram, I'm going to give you a chance to put yourself completely in the clear. Now, if you follow my directions carefully... You'll prove your innocence. I'll do anything you want me to do, Mr. Keene. Then go back to my partner, Mike Clancy, and give him this message. And make certain no one else is present when you do. And if things develop as I think they will, our killer may discover it's not so easy to get away with murder. Mike! Is that you? Right, boss. Where are you, Mr. Keene? Over here, behind the ledge. No. Oh, Saints preserve us. This cave gives me the creep, boss. Uh, did you follow my instructions, Mike? Yes, sir. I went back to the house with Mr. Bly, and I told the two women you had found Jim Ramsey's body here in the cave, yeah. and that you and I were going to town to report to the police. Then I started the taxi and drove it out of sight and circled back here to the cave on foot. Did you search that car? Yes, Mr. Keene. What did you find? Nothing at all. Well, you may not know it, Mike, but you found a great deal. Let me see. It must be at least 20 minutes since you left them in the house. We ought to have a visitor inside this cave within... Boss, someone's coming. Yes. Our murderer, Mike. Hold your gun and your flashlight ready. Right, sir. Flash your light, Mike. What? Don't move, Mr. Bly. If you do, Mike Clancy will shoot to kill. Keen. Put this man under arrest, Mike, for the murder of Jim Ramsey and Edward Johnson. You're crazy, Keen. I never even knew Edward Johnson. You murdered Edward Johnson because he evidently ran into a clue that would have sent you to the electric chair for Jim Ramsey's death. 
That's a lie. You proved your guilt, Bly, by coming to this cave just now. Jim's body was hidden behind that rock where we caught you stooping. Only one other man knew that body was there, Hiram Wade. Then why don't you accuse him? Because the man who killed Ramsey wanted his body hidden forever. That was an important part of the plan. You came back to hide Ramsey's body in some other place, knowing we'd found it. And what was my motive, Keen? You can't just pick up a watch salesman and accuse him of murder. You're no watch salesman, Bly. You claim your line is wristwatches. And yet, when I asked you for the time, I saw that you carried a pocket watch. Not a very good advertisement for a man in your trade. Besides, I searched your car, mister. Since when does a salesman travel without samples? You were also clever about puncturing the tires of Hiram's taxi. At first, you thought it might prevent us from getting word to the police. Then you decided it would be smarter to lend us the tires from your car, just to make you appear more innocent. You still don't have a murder motive, Keene. Go, go through his clothes for identification, Mike. I have a feeling his name isn't Bly. No, don't you touch oh, me. Take it easy, mister. Or maybe we get, get tough, tough with you. Here. This is wallet, boss. Mm. Oh, Bly, is it? Mr. Keene, his name is Ramsey. Sanford Ramsey. It's on this car registration. So you're related to Jim Ramsey. Look, I'll make a deal with you, Keene. In six months, I'll come into $3 million. Let me go free and we'll split 50-50. $3 million, eh? Whose money are you inheriting? My uncle's. It was left to Jim, but it goes to me if Jim dies. Jim left California six years ago and disappeared. But I finally caught up with him and decided to play this my own way. Now I understand why you wanted Jim's body to be missing. Jim Ramsey was gone for six long years. And one more would have made it seven. A man is declared legally dead after seven years. And you'd have inherited the money. The way I planned it, Keen, no one will be the wiser. I knew about this old house and the cave... Then I put the map in the fireplace, knowing Jim would fall for it. Thinking he could find hidden gold, search the place. I made that map myself, Keen. And you've also made a case for the state that's foolproof. You mean you won't play along with me? Of course I will. As far as a prison cell and a judge and jury... Why, you... Put the handcuffs on him, Mike. Mr. Sanford Ramsey, or Bly if he prefers, is going on trial for murder in the first degree. And so Mr. Keene finds a solution to the forgotten cave murder case. The next time you're suffering from the pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, try Anison. You'll bless the day you heard of this incredibly fast way to relieve these pains. Now, the reason Anison is so wonderfully fast-acting and effective is this. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing Anison tablets from their own dentist or physician, and in this way have discovered the incredibly fast relief Anison brings from pain of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. So next time such pain strike, take Anison. For most effective relief, use only as directed. Your druggist has Anison in handy boxes of 12 and 30 and economical family size bottles of 50 and 100. The name is Anison, A N A C I N. Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, is based on the novel Mr. Keene. The radio sequel is originated and produced by Frank and Ann Hummer. Dialogue by Lawrence Clee. Bennett Kilpack plays Mr. Keene. It is on the air every Thursday at this time. Don't miss Mr. Keene next Thursday when the kindly old tracer turns to the engaged girl murder case. It's time now for Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. <laughs> Late 
Ladies and gentlemen, Anison and Kalinos present Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction in one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday at this same time, the famous old investigator takes from his file and brings to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. Tonight's case is entitled The Engaged Girl Murder Case. When you are suffering from headache, neuritis, or neuralgia pain, you want fast relief. Well, just try Anison. Anison gives incredibly fast, effective relief. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, it contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients. Many people first discovered Anison tablets through their own physician or dentist. Next time you want effective relief from the pain of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, get Anison. For most effective relief, use only as directed. Anison, A-N-A-C-I-N, comes in boxes of 12 and 30 tablets or in economical bottles of 50 and 100. Now for Mr. Keene and the engaged girl murder case. Our scene opens on a wealthy, fashionable estate in Connecticut. A number of people are riding across the estate on horseback, but two of them have fallen behind, not realizing that they are both about to become participants in a tragedy. Better hurry, Audrey. The others are getting ahead of us. Herbert, wait. Let's walk the horses a bit. I I want to talk to you, and this is the first chance I've had to see you alone all day. Oh, what's the matter, darling? You look concerned about something. I am concerned. About your sister, Martha. Martha? Herbert, I I don't think she wants you to marry me. But that's sheer nonsense. Martha's very fond of you. She pretends to be in front of you. But I believe she hates me. Now, Audrey, don't you think you're being oversensitive? Herbert, I know how much you love your sister, and I didn't imagine you'd believe me, but it's true, and I just can't... What's that? That sounds like one of our dogs. Yes, it is. It's Sultan, my sister's dog. There he is, Audrey, near that clearing. Come on, let's ride over there. What's the matter, boy? Herbert, look! It's my sister, Martha, lying in the thicket. Hold my horse while I dismount, Audrey. What's happened, Herbert? Has she been hurt? Audrey, she's been struck on the head. Martha's dead. <laughs> The police said, Mr. Keene, that someone must have struck my sister Martha on top of the head with a heavy club and killed her instantly. And this occurred while you and your guests were out riding, Mr. Langley? Yes. Uh, was your sister Martha part of the group who were on horseback? Yes, I, I thought she'd gone on ahead with the others. Well, hitting a horseback rider on the head with a club when you stand on the ground, well, that ain't an easy trick. Somebody on the horse must have followed the girl and struck her from the saddle. My partner, Mike Clancy, has a good point there, Mr. Langley. Tell me, were all your guests questioned by the local police? Yes, Mr. Keene, but none of them was held. They were all Martha's close friends and mine. It, it's unthinkable that any of them would have wanted to harm her in any way. In other words, you can't put the finger of suspicion on any of them. No, Mr. Keene. My sister Martha was a beautiful, intelligent woman... Very popular with men, though she never married. I loved her as much as I've ever loved anyone in this world. With the exception of Audrey, perhaps. Mr. Langley, tell me a little more about your fiance, Audrey Stafford. She's a wonderful girl. We met last summer on a cruise to Bermuda. She was on vacation at the time. She, she worked for a banking firm. But she resigned her position at my request shortly after we announced our engagement. I see. I'm wealthy. My late father left his entire estate to my sister Martha and to me. I didn't think it was necessary for my future wife to retain her job. Well, what about that incident you mentioned when you told us the story before, Mr. Langley? What incident, Mr. Clancy? I imagine Mike is referring to your talk with your fiancée, Audrey, just before you found your sister's body, the talk concerning her unfriendly attitude toward Audrey. Oh, 
Oh, that... It was nothing. I shouldn't even have brought it up. Mr. Langley, I presume you came here to ask me to solve the mystery of your sister's murder. Yes, Mr. Keene. I came to plead with you to enter the case, for Martha's sake. And also for Audrey's? What do you mean? From what you told me, Mr. Langley, I imagine there is one suspect in this murder case. You mean my fiancé? Yes. You said that Audrey told you that Martha was against your marriage. But Audrey would never have murdered my sister for that, or for any reason. That still remains a question to be answered. However, uh, I can't accept the case, Mr. Langley, unless you tell me everything openly and truthfully. I should have known better than to try to hide my real feelings from you, sir. Yes, I want Audrey protected. So far, no one knows that she quarreled with Martha before the murder. Over you? Yes, Mr. Keene. I overheard the argument. I said nothing to Audrey, thinking it would pass over after the wedding. Why did your sister want to stop the marriage, Mr. Langley? For a very silly reason. Martha thought Audrey wanted to marry me for my money. I never believed that, Mr. Keene, and I never will. At the same time, if I accept the case, you must be prepared to have me include your fiancé as a possible suspect. I understand that, Mr. Keene, and I'm willing to meet those terms. All right. Now, how far is your estate from here? It's just over the line in Connecticut. Oh, excuse me. Mr. Keene's office, Mike Clancy speaking. Is Mr. Herbert Langley there, please? This is Mrs. Wrightson, his housekeeper. Uh, just a minute. Uh, your housekeeper, Mr. Langley. Oh, well, yes, I told her where I'd be in case there were any messages. It must be important. Well, here you are. Thank you, Mr. Clancy. Hello. Mr. Langley, this is Mrs. Wrightson. Yes, Mr. Ernest Porter's here to see you. He says it's very urgent, and he wants to know when you'll be home. Is he near the phone, Mrs. Wrightson? No, he stepped out in the garden. Well, tell him I expect to be home within an hour. Mr. Porter didn't say what his business was, did he? No, sir, but he acted like it was a matter of life and death. All right, Mrs. Wrightson, I'm on my way. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Langley. It's a neighbor of mine named Porter, Mr. Keene. He seems to have something terribly important to tell me. Who is he, Mr. Langley? He has an estate near mine. He and his nephew, Alan, come over quite often. I can't imagine what he's got in his mind. Unless it refers to my sister Martha's murder. It probably does. The sooner we find out just what it is, the better. Mike Clancy and I will go with you to your home right now. Just a moment, Mr. Keene. I have a key to the front door. Well, Mike, while I'm inside the house, suppose you take a look around. You know, the usual checkup. Right, sir. Come in, Mr. Keene. Oh, Mr. Langley, I, I didn't hear you come in. This is Mr. Keene, Mrs. Wrightson. Mrs. Wrightson, my housekeeper. I've heard of Mr. Keene, the great investigator. I'm very glad to know you, sir. How do you do, Mrs. Wrightson? Where's Mr. Porter? In the study. Oh, Mr. Keene and his partner, Mr. Clancy, will be staying overnight. Would you have one of the maids prepare a room? Of course, Mr. Langley. Oh, um, Miss Audrey called. She said she's coming out to see you at five o'clock. Well, it's almost that now. Show her in when she arrives, please. Yes, sir. This way, Mr. Keene. Well, this is quite a handsome house you have here, Mr. Langley. It's been in the family for generations. Oh, here's Mr. Porter. Herbert, I want to speak to you alone. This is Mr. Keene, the famous investigator, Ernest. Mr. Keene? You mean he's taken over the investigation of your sister's murder? Yes. Well, then I suppose I ought to say what I have to say in front of him. I think you should, Mr. Porter, if it concerns the murder of Martha Langley. It does, Mr. Keene. Then what is it you want to tell us? Well, I have a nephew, Alan, of whom I'm very fond. He's been living with me since his parents died. And I'd stand behind him under any circumstances. What are you trying to say, Mr. Porter? Mr. Keene, you can accuse me for that matter or anyone else who was along on that morning ride. My nephew's innocent and completely honest. What are you driving at, Ernest? I think I know what Mr. Porter's trying to say, Mr. Langley. Apparently his nephew, Alan, is connected with your sister's murder in some way. And Mr. Porter is attempting to clear him, even before he's been accused. Well, Mr. Keene, knowing you for what you are, a fair man, I, I don't mind putting my cards on the table. My nephew, Alan, came to me today and confessed that he was the first one to find Martha's body. You mean he found her there near the woods before I did? Apparently, Herbert. How did he happen to find Martha's body, Mr. Porter? Well, he dropped behind the rest of us as we were riding through the woods. 
The reason he said nothing about it up to now was that he didn't want to become involved, Mr. Keene. That's not a very good excuse. The boy was excited, frightened perhaps. At any rate, he admitted the truth, didn't he? Yes, and it's in his favor. Mr. Porter, is there anything else you wanted to say to Mr. Langley? No. Except that he has my deepest sympathy. I appreciate that, Ernest. And thanks. In recent months, you and my sister Martha have become fast friends, and I... I know you miss her, as we all do. In recent months, did you say? Well, Mr. Keene, Martha Langley and I were better than friends. I dared to hope that she would marry me. I didn't know that, Ernest. I said nothing, Herbert, because she turned me down. It was too bad. Both our families are rich and would have been a most advantageous marriage, as well as a happy one for me. I'm glad you brought that out by yourself, Mr. Porter. You mean if I'd hidden it, I too would have become a suspect? Well, Mr. Keene, as far as I could... That sounded like a gun. It was. It came from the back of your house. Both you gentlemen remain where you are. I'm going out to investigate. <laughs> All right, young fella. Just stay where you are. Uh, what's happened, Mike? Well, Mr. Keene, I heard this fella prowling around in the shrubbery. And when I yelled, he started to run. I fired two shots in the air to scare him. He stopped in a hurry. Well, who are you? Alan Porter is my name. I thought I was being attacked by a maniac. That's why I tried to run. You are Ernest Porter's nephew? Yes. Mr. Keene, there's a car coming up the road. Take young Porter back to the house, Mike. I'll join you in just a minute. Okay, me bucko. Let's go. Good evening. Who are you? My name is Keene. Oh, the famous investigator. I'm Audrey Stafford. I'm glad you come, Audrey. I wanted to ask you a few questions in regard to the murder of Martha Langley. Leave her alone. I beg your pardon. Oh, it's you, Mrs. Wrightson. Please, Mrs. Wrightson, I can handle this alone. Audrey hasn't done anything, Mr. Keene. You have no right to question her. Oh, aren't you taking a few liberties, considering that Mr. Langley... Ask me to investigate this case? And you're one of his employees? Oh, it's not meant as disrespect, Mr. Keene, but... Oh, I've come to look on Miss Audrey as my future mistress, and I want to protect her. What makes you feel that she needs protection? You suspect her of being one of Miss Martha's enemies, don't you? I haven't mentioned that to anyone. Neither has Mr. Langley, I'm sure. Oh, then... Then I made a mistake. I beg your pardon, Mr. Keene. However, you're not far from wrong. What? I do suspect Miss Audrey. Mr. Keene, you don't... You can't that. suspect Miss Audrey. She admitted to Herbert Langley that his sister Martha was against their marriage. And that alone could be construed as motive enough for murder. Don't say it, Mr. Keene. Don't say that word. Mother, or... please, Mother, don't... Audrey, did you say Mother? She lied. I'm not her mother. That I... won't help, Mrs. Wrightson. It ties in with your strange desire to protect someone who should be almost a stranger to you. So, Audrey is your daughter. No one knew, up to now. There are many more things that are still concealed in this murder case, Mrs. Wrightson, but I intend to bring them all to the surface, and at the same time bring Martha Langley's killer to justice. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to Mr. Keene and the engaged girl murder case. Meanwhile, beware of unpleasing breath that breeds between the teeth. Use Kalanos toothpaste with dental floss action. Those cracks and crevices where food particles can decay must be reached to have a really clean mouth, a welcome breath. Your dentist knows this to be true. Use Kalanos toothpaste with dental floss action. Kalanos gives amazing dental floss action. That is, sends thousands of active cleansing bubbles to penetrate hard-to-reach dental areas. Helps dislodge bits of food that can cause unpleasing breath and tooth decay. Use Kalanos toothpaste with dental floss action. Kalanos has high polishing action, too. Brightens dingy teeth by removing ordinary yellow surface stains. Kalanos is gentle, safe even for children's teeth and tender gums. Enjoy its cool, clean, minty flavor. Kalanos is dentist recommended. Cleans your teeth bright, keeps your breath right. Use Kalanos toothpaste with dental floss action. Get Kalanos with dental floss action today. (laughs) 
Now back to Mr. Keene and the engaged girl murder case. The murder of wealthy Martha Langley brings Mr. Keene, the great investigator, and his partner Mike Clancy to the fabulous Langley estate in Connecticut, where Mr. Keene begins a difficult investigation. He has just discovered that Mrs. Wrightson, the Langley housekeeper, is actually the mother of Audrey Stafford, who is about to marry the victim's brother, Herbert. After learning of this startling revelation on the driveway in front of Herbert Langley's palatial home, Mr. Keene continues to question Mrs. Wrightson and Audrey in the hope of obtaining further information. Mrs. Wrightson, I advise you to be truthful with me if you really want to protect your daughter, Audrey. As long as you know my secret, Mr. Keene, I'll tell you everything. But not in front of Audrey. You shouldn't have made me keep that secret, Mother. I wanted Herbert to know about it. Please, dear. Let me speak to Mr. Keene alone for a few minutes. Very well, Mother. Audrey, you'll find your fiancé, Herbert Langley, in the house, along with his neighbors, Mr. Porter and his nephew, Alan. I'll talk to you later, Mother. Yes, darling. Mr. Keene, there's one thing you must understand. My daughter, Audrey, is no snob. She pleaded desperately with me to allow her to tell Mr. Langley I was her mother. And why didn't you? I thought it would hurt her marriage, at least socially, since I'm Mr. Langley's housekeeper. I was so happy knowing she'd get those things in life I always dreamed she'd have. Wealth, social position, and happiness. Go on, Mrs. Wrightson. It was easy to keep the secret as far as our names were concerned. I married twice. Audrey's name is Stafford, but I kept the name of my second husband, John Wrightson. I did it thinking that one day I might not want Audrey to admit that her mother was poor and ordinary. I wouldn't call your love for your daughter ordinary, Mrs. Wrightson. Her meeting with Herbert Langley was just a coincidence. I came here to work as his housekeeper after Audrey left on her cruise to Bermuda, and she didn't know about my new job until she got back. Then I cautioned her to say nothing about it to Mr. Langley. I see. Is there anything else you'd like to tell me, Mrs. Wrightson? Only that Herbert Langley wasn't the only millionaire who wanted to marry Audrey. Who else was there? Alan Porter. He was mad about her. And he's very rich, Mr. Keene, a well-known polo player. He wanted to marry Audrey, too. But she loves Herbert. And Martha Langley, Alan Porter, and his uncle all together couldn't change that love. How do you mean, Mrs. Wrightson? Did they try to stop the marriage? Mr. Keene, two hours before Martha Langley's body was found, I happened to pass by the Chinese tea house. The Chinese tea house? It's a small cottage on the estate over there in the woods. Inside the tea house, Martha Langley, Mr. Porter, and Alan were having a conversation. What were they saying, Mrs. Wrightson? Mr. Porter was saying that Audrey and his nephew, Alan, would make a good match. Martha Langley seemed to be irritated. She asked young Alan why he hadn't been able to win Audrey away from her brother. And what was Alan's answer? He didn't have time to answer, Mr. Keene. That moment, my daughter Audrey walked into the tea house, so they changed the conversation. It's very interesting, Mrs. Wrightson. It puts a new aspect on the case. What do you mean, Mr. Key? I'll explain later. Meanwhile, would you please ask my partner, Mike Clancy, to meet me inside the Chinese tea house immediately and tell him it's very important. <laughs> Mike. Is that you, Mr. King? I'm over here on the tea house porch. Sure, this is certainly a fancy shack, isn't it, boss? Well, it looks like something from a Chinese palace. Mike, uh, come inside for a moment. I want to show you something. Oh, look at this. Saints preserve us. Why, someone must have tried to tear the house down, Mr. King. There's a hole right through the wall. The walls are flimsy, Mike. But they've been reinforced with short, narrow beams. That's the one part of this tea house that isn't authentically Chinese. One of those wooden beams, small but solid, has been pulled out right here. Mr. Keene, that missing piece of wood could have been the murder weapon. Exactly. And here's something else, Mike. Why, it's a bit of cloth. I found it hanging on this nail head here where the beam was torn out. Now, if you wanted to tear a beam out of this wall with the aid of a chisel, say, how would you brace yourself? Well, I'd stick my knee up against the wall on this side for leverage. That's just what the killer did, Mike. But he unknowingly left this bit of cloth on the head of that nail. 
This bit of cloth comes from heavy riding breeches. So the killer probably never even scratched himself or herself. Herself? Well, nowadays women wear heavy riding breeches too, Mike. Yeah, but Mr. Keene, that still leaves us with the job of picking out the killer. Several people were riding that day when Martha Langley was murdered. I know that. However, I think I have an idea. Tomorrow morning, Mike, we'll all go riding here on the Langley estate and turn my murder theory into a fact. Mr. Keene, would you like to ride with Audrey and me? We're going through the woods. No, you better ride on ahead of us, Mr. Langley. My partner, Mike Clancy, and I will join you in a few minutes. All right, Mr. Keene. Come on, Audrey. Well, our horses ain't exactly in my line, boss, but I <laughs> I try to keep up with you. You ride very well, Mike. Well, not half as good as you do. Hold up there, you old burner. Take it easy. Well, sure, they were all pretty curious about why you wanted to take that ride this morning. My uh, reason paid dividends, Mike. It, it did, boss? Yeah, I know who murdered Martha Langley. All I need now is proof of how it was done. That's what... Here comes Alan Porter. Mr. Keene. Yes, Alan? I, I don't know why you suggested this ride, but uh, I feel I owe you an explanation. Of what? Last night, when Mr. Clancy fired at me, I wasn't prowling. I only... Well, it was a natural mistake in all our parts, Alan. But you seem to take it more seriously than it warrants. Well, I just wanted you to know that I'm being honest. And I have nothing to hide. I'll see you later, Mr. Keene. Sure, and he sounded like a young man with a guilty conscience, boss. You might have a very good reason for that, Mike. I found out last night, after seeing a picture of the murder girl, Martha Langley, that she and Audrey were the same height and often wore identical riding habits. Well, what does that mean, sir? Alan realizes that I may know that Audrey refused his proposal of marriage and so may have wanted to take revenge. You mean that he may have killed the wrong girl because they... They looked alike in their riding clothes? Yes, it's possible. Mike, do uh, you see that thicket over there under the apple tree? Mm, that's where Martha Langley's body was found. Mm. Seeing it gave me an idea. Here, let's get near the tree. Oh. All right, Mike. Right here. Ah, would you mind dismounting? It'll be a pleasure to get off this night, boss. Oh, hold there. Oh! Come on, the critter ran away. We'll round him up later. Mike, the lowest branch of this tree is just a little above the head of a rider on horseback. Climb up there and I'll explain what I'm getting at. Well, I do my best, boss. From riding horses to tree climbing, it's preserves the investigating business is sure getting to be strenuous. That's good work, Mike. Now... Unless I look up and peer very carefully through the branches, I wouldn't see you. Well, then, Mr. Keene, the killer could swing from here in the tree and, as his victim came by on horseback, hit her on the head. Yes, Mike. I'm convinced that's the way it was done. Yeah, but who was the murderer, boss? He seems to be joining us right now. Be quiet, Mike. Stay up there in the tree, out of sight. Tired of riding with the others, Mr. Porter? What are you doing here, Mr. King? Solving a murder. That's why you decided to see what I was up to. What do you mean? The man I intend to arrest for Martha Langley's murder is you, Porter. You think you can prove that I killed Martha? Very easily. I have a tiny piece of cloth torn from your riding breeches. When you pulled your murder weapon, a wooden beam out of the tea house wall. And there's the hole in your breeches. I saw it just before we left the house. Don't spur your horse, Keener. I'll shoot you out of the saddle. That gun won't help, Porter. The others are riding half a mile away by now, and you seem to have lost your partner, too. I think this gun may help a great deal. Why did you kill Martha Langley? I don't mind telling you. You'll never get a chance to pass it on to anyone else. I killed Martha to protect myself, Keen. Protect yourself? How? Five years ago, my brother left two million dollars to his son, Alan, and made me his guardian until he came of age. Alan comes of age tomorrow. He's 21. Did you steal his inheritance? No, I spent it. I knew how to enjoy it. 
I not only spent most of that money, but I left it in some of the most fashionable gambling houses in the world. And how did you think you'd get away with it when your nephew, Alan, became of age? It would have been simple if it wasn't for Martha Langley. I was going to tell Alan his parents lost the money in those gambling houses. And that I kept it from him all these years just to save their reputation. But Martha Langley found out the truth? Yes. She made a deal, though. Said if I could get my nephew, Alan, to marry Audrey, she'd keep my secret. And I had $50,000 in the bargain. But you didn't succeed. No, that fool nephew of mine was crazy about Audrey. But she fell for Herbert Langley. I think I know the rest, Porter. Do you? Martha Langley became angry when you couldn't fulfill your part of the bargain. It was her only hope of separating her brother from Audrey. You thought she'd give you away, and you killed her to prevent that. The way I'm killing you, Keen, right now. Look out, boy! Good work, Mike. Wait a minute, I'll dismount. He's out cold, Mr. Keene. When I hopped on his head from that branch, I fell right on top of him. and He hit the ground first. Yes, Mike. Porter met justice on the same spot he committed his crime. He lured Martha Langley over here when she became separated from the others. Probably by calling her as he crouched in the tree. And then he struck from above. Now he'll pay for his treachery in a court of law. And so Mr. Keene finds a solution to the engaged girl murder case. The next time you're suffering from the pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, try Anison. You'll bless the day you heard of this incredibly fast way to relieve these pains. Now, the reason Anison is so wonderfully fast-acting and effective is this. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing Anison tablets from their own dentist or physician, and in this way have discovered the incredibly fast relief Anison brings from pain of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. So next time such pain strike, take Anison. For most effective relief, use only as directed. Your druggist has Anison in handy boxes of 12 and 30, and economical family size bottles of 50 and 100. The name is Anison. A N A C I N. Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons, is based on the novel Mr. Keen. The radio sequel is originated and produced by Frank and Ann Hummert. Dialogue by Lawrence Cleek. Bennett Kilpark plays Mr. Keen. It is on the air every Thursday at this time. Don't miss Mr. Keen next Thursday when the kindly old tracer turns to the concrete cellar murder case. It's time now for Mr. Keen, tracer of lost persons. Ladies and gentlemen, Anison and Kalinos present Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction and one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday at the same time, the famous old investigator takes from his file and brings to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. Tonight's case is entitled, The Case of the Rushville Murder. This program is brought to you by the makers of Anison, the remarkable tablets that bring incredibly fast and effective relief from the pain of headaches, neuritis, and neuralgia. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, it contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing Anison tablets from their own dentist or physician. Perhaps you, too, have been introduced to Anison this way. Then you know how effective Anison is. If not, try it yourself. 
Whenever you want incredibly fast relief from the pain of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, you'll be delighted with the results. For most effective relief, use only as directed. Just ask for Anison at any drug counter. It's spelled A-N-A-C-I-N. Anison. <laughs> Mr. Keene and the case of the Rushville murder. Our scene opens in the home of Dr. Prentice, a well-known physician and psychiatrist who resides in the small New Jersey community of Rushville. The doctor's daughter, a tall, lovely young girl, is just reaching for the telephone, which has been ringing insistently, as if aware of the urgency of this particular call. Hello? Laura? This is Dad. Oh, where are you, Father? At the hospital. But I'm coming right home, Laura. After I hang up, be sure to shut and bolt all the doors and windows. Why? What's happened, Dad? One of my patients has just escaped from the hospital. She's a homicidal maniac, Laura, and extremely dangerous. Father, there was something I wanted to tell you. Later, my dear. Right now, you do as I ask. This insane patient of mine is under the delusion that I'm her enemy, and she may head for the house immediately. I've already informed the police. All right, Father. And don't let anyone inside the house. I'll be home in 20 minutes. Goodbye, Laura. Goodbye. There. I've shut and locked all the windows. Who's there? Oh, no. No, we're not going to... No. No, don't touch me. Put down that knife. No! <laughs> My daughter was found by the police five minutes after I had phoned her, Mr. Keene. She'd been stabbed to death with a kitchen knife. Tell me, were all the windows and doors in your home locked as you had asked, Dr. Prentice? No, Mr. Keene. The windows were shut, but apparently Laura never had time to lock the back door that leads to the kitchen before Natalie Craven, the insane patient, reached the house. Chance preserve us. Well, Dr. Prentice, your insane patient seemed to head for your home immediately after escaping from the hospital. Yes. That's a little odd in itself. But I told you how this patient felt about me, Mr. Keene. I'd treated her for a mental disorder for two years, but she developed a fixation about me and began to feel that I was her mortal enemy. Well, you were devoting your time to bring her back to sanity. Yes, Mr. Keene. But what I meant, Dr. Prentice, was this. You were in the hospital at the time of the insane woman's escape. Now, if she wanted to murder you, why didn't she attack you after you left the building? Why did she come to your home instead and attack your daughter? The mind of a psychiatric reacts, reacts in odd ways, Mr. Keene. This woman, Nettie Craven, may have thought I'd left the hospital. Then, finding I wasn't at home, she must have attacked my daughter, Laura, to revenge herself on me. Oh, I see what you mean, Doctor. Since the death of my wife, Mr. Keene, there have been only two things in my life. My work and my daughter, Laura. Laura is gone now. But I still have my work. And I intend to carry on. Naturally. I... I don't want Nettie Craven punished for the crime. She's completely insane. But she must be caught and returned to the hospital before she claims another victim. You, for instance, Dr. Prentice? Oh, I wasn't thinking of myself. I'm thinking of others. That's why I've come to you, Mr. Keene. The police are on the case, of course. And if an investigator of your ability also enters it and works along with them, the woman will be captured all the sooner. I intend to do everything I can, Dr. Prentice. Oh, thank you, Mr. Keene. Needless to say, you'll be doing a great public service. Yeah, but we're also thinking about you, Dr. Prentice. Oh, please don't worry about me, Mr. Clancy. Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to do a little prescribing in this particular case, Dr. Prentice. Uh, where is your home? In New Jersey, a town called Rushville. Well, Rushville is just across the river. That's right, Mr. Clancy. Dr. Prentice, I'd like to exchange house keys with you. I'd like you to stay in my apartment until this case is over. And Mike and I will stay in your house. But my work, Mr. Keene, my practice... Well, it'll be better for you to miss a few days' work now, Doc, than to end up with no work at all. You mean, you think Nettie Craven will try to make me her next victim? If this insane woman killed your daughter, yes. I insist that you take these precautions, Doctor. Well, in that case, I'll do as you ask, Mr. Keene. Fine. And be careful yourself. I needn't remind you that a homicidal case like Nettie's is most dangerous. Well, I'm aware of that, Dr. Prentice. There's just one thing I'd like to add, Mr. Keene. 
If a young man named John Digby calls, try to break the news of Laura's murder as gently as possible. John is Laura's husband. A husband, eh? Was he living in your home too, Doctor? No. As a matter of fact, my daughter Laura had just come back to my house the day before. She and John were married only a month ago. They had a childish quarrel. I see. Oh, it was nothing at all, Mr. Keene. John's a fine boy, and I was certain I could have patched things up between them. You tried to notify him of Laura's death, didn't you, Dr. Prentice? Yes, but I couldn't reach him anywhere. Very well, Dr. Prentice. You can proceed to my home immediately. I'll notify the hospital you won't be available for a few days. Meanwhile, Mike and I will bend every effort to put our hands on this Rushville murderer before another victim is added to the list. Well, the light switch must be on this wall here, Mr. Keene, sir. Oh, here it is. Well, Dr. Prentiss seems to have a very comfortable home, Mike. I'm sure, and it's too bad he lost his daughter. It's pretty tough for a man to go through something like that, Mr. Keene. Oh, yes, but he still has his work, and he's one of the best in the profession. If we can... Boss, just a minute. I thought I heard someone move around the next room. It's all right, Mike. There's someone here. Open that door. I'd better have my gun handy, just in case. Who are you? Stand where you are, mister. Don't move. What are you, thieves? No, young man. We happen to be working with the police. The police? What are you doing here in Dr. Prentice's home? Come to talk to my wife. His wife? This must be young John Digby, boss. Laura's husband. How did you know my name? Your father-in-law, Dr. Prentice, told us about you, John. My name is Keene. This is my partner, Mike Clancy. May I ask how you got into this house? Why, there was a kitchen window open. I didn't want to ring the front doorbell because I thought that Laura wouldn't let me in. We'd quarreled like a couple of silly kids, and she'd left me. I've come back to apologize to her. Saints preserve us, but she hasn't even heard. Heard what? Sit down, John. What is it? Why are you both looking at me like that? Where have you been for the past two days? I was so miserable after our quarrel. I went to a little town near Philadelphia. That explains why you didn't learn of the tragedy. What tragedy? It's going to be a shock, John, so prepare yourself. Your wife, Laura, was murdered. Laura? Murdered? By a maniac. No. No, I don't believe it. It's true. And I'm sorry. One of your father-in-law's patients, an insane woman, escaped from the hospital... And they think she attacked your wife. I should never have let Laura leave our apartment. It's all my fault, Mr. Keene. Sometimes fate works out things in her own peculiar way, John. And you think it was that maniac who killed Laura? Well, that's the general opinion. Well, it isn't my opinion. What do you mean, John? Mr. Keene, a few days ago, Laura was troubled by something important she wanted to tell her father. She started to tell me about it when I got home. But I interrupted her and... That's when we had our quarrel. You don't know what it was that worried your wife? I can guess. We fought because I was jealous, Mr. Keene. Jealous of a man named Arthur Halliday. And who is he, John? He used to be a medical student at the university in town. Dr. Prentice is a member of the examining board in that university. The board that passes on a student's character before he's permitted to graduate as a doctor. Yes, go on. Halliday drank a lot. Gambled. The examining board found out and dismissed him from the medical school. They decided he was too weak to accept the responsibility a doctor must take. You say you were jealous of this Arthur Halliday? Yes, Mr. Keene. He, he used to see a lot of Laura before we were married. The other day, I saw them together on the street. She never told me she was seeing him. Now it's beginning to be clear to me. Halliday was probably trying to use Laura's influence with her father to have himself reinstated at the medical school. She refused and he made a threat. That's what she wanted to tell her father, Dr. Prentice, about. Well, you don't mind my saying so, John. You're taking a lot for granted. But it is worthwhile looking into, isn't it, Mr. Keene? If I ever find out that Arthur Halliday was responsible for Laura's death, I'll... I'll... Oh, you look a little pale, young fella. News is too much of a shock for him, Mike. Would you like to lie down inside for a while, John? 
Yes, sir. I think I'd better. I'll be all right, Mr. Keene. I... I just want to be alone for a few minutes. I'll answer that, Mike. Is... Is Dr. Prentice in, please? No, not at the moment. My name is Maud Craven. Craven? Mr. Keene, she must be related to that insane patient who escaped. She's my sister, sir. Come in, Miss Craven. My name is Keene. I happen to be looking for your sister. Mr. Keene, the famous investigator? Oh, you won't put Nettie in prison, will you, sir? She doesn't realize what she's doing. All I want is to return her to the hospital where she belongs. I, I know they're looking for Nettie. They think she murdered the doctor's daughter, Laura. I came here to tell Dr. Prentice how unhappy it made me when I heard about what happened. You know where your sister may have hidden, Miss Craven? If I did, Mr. Keene, I'd call the hospital. I know how dangerous Nettie is. I don't want to give her the chance to do to someone else what she did to poor Miss Laura. Excuse me for a moment, please. Hello? Dr. Prentice? He's not in the moment. Who's calling, please? Arthur Halliday. When will I be able to reach him? Why, very shortly. Is it important? I'll say it's important. To me, anyway. I... Who is this? A friend of the doctor's. Well, you can give him this message. He's kicked me around long enough. Because of him, I can't get into a medical school in the country. And if he doesn't stop hounding me, I'll square accounts. Hello? 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 Who was that, Mr. King? That was Arthur Halliday, Mike. The young medical student John Digby told us about. I wish I could have gotten his address. But if he was a student in the town university, they can tell you where to reach him, Mr. Keene. If you want me to, I'll... <gasps> what is it, Miss Craven? The, the window. Sense preservers. There's someone outside, boss. Yes, she's staring in the window. Look at that face. She looks like an animal. It's Nettie. It's my sister. Grab her, Mike. Mr. Keene. Isn't she there? There's no one in sight, sir. She's disappeared like a ghost, boss. It's too dark out here to see where she went. She couldn't have gotten far, Mike. Something tells me she's still close by. Come on. We're going to search every inch of these grounds. In just a moment, we'll return to Mr. Keene and the case of the Rushville murder. Meanwhile... Beware of unpleasing breath that breathes between the teeth. Use Colonos toothpaste with dental floss action. Those crevices where food particles can decay must be reached for a clean mouth, welcome breath. Colonos toothpaste gives you dental floss action. That is, sends thousands of cleansing bubbles to help dislodge bits of food that can cause unpleasing breath and decay. Colonos is dentist recommended. Cleans teeth bright, keeps breath right, and listen, listen. Now save 31 cents on Kalinos toothpaste in the new giant economy size. Go to your dealers today. Take advantage of this great bargain. Save 31 cents on new giant economy size Kalinos. Get Kalinos toothpaste today. Now back to Mr. Keene and the case of the Rushville murder. Mr. Keene, the great investigator, and his partner, Mike Clancy are investigating the murder of Laura Digby, the married daughter of a well-known physician, Dr. Prentice, who's attached to a hospital for the insane. One of the patients, an insane woman named Nettie Craven, escaped from the hospital, and she's the one who is under suspicion for the crime. Now, Mike and Mr. Keene have just seen Nettie's face peering in through a window of Dr. Prentice's home, and as they search the grounds for her... She was standing right over here, Mr. Keene, near this window. Yes, she was, Mike, but I don't see any footprints. It's starting to snow, boss. Well, we better go back inside the house. Maybe Nettie Craven managed to slip away after all. Uh, Mike. Yes, boss. Come over here for a moment. Look at this. Why, it's a pair of doors leading right into the ground. No, it doesn't lead into the ground, Mike. It probably leads into the cellar of the house. Some of these old-fashioned houses have cellars built this way. Uh, see if you can open it, Mike. Well, I'd try. No. No, it won't budge, Mr. Keene. That he must have bolted it on the inside. You think she's hiding in there? Yes. By now, she must be somewhere inside the house, Mike. Here, let me have your handcuffs. 
Here, hang on, Mr. Jean. Put these handcuffs through the rings on the cellar doors. Lock them from the outside. There we are, Mike. Now she won't be able to get out the way she came in. Now let's go back inside the house and find her. Mr. Keene, did you find my sister, Nettie? Not yet, Miss Craven. We think she's got inside the house through the cellar. She's in here? Why, you're not afraid of your sister, are you? I don't know, Mr. Keene. I used to be able to reason with Nettie, but lately she's been so violent. Well, you better stay right here in the living room while we make a search, Miss Craven. First, Mike, we'll phone the police in the hospital and tell them to send help. Well, here's the telephone, boss. Hmm. It's funny. What's the trouble, Mike? Well, it sounds like the phone is dead. Just a minute. Let's see where the phone wire runs to. Goes to this wall... And runs along the woodwork to the window. Uh, open up the window, Mike. Well, Mr. King, the phone wire has been pulled right out of the outside wall. Mike, this window faces the side of the house where we saw Nettie Craven. Well, then Nettie Craven must have pulled the phone wire out just before she went through the cellar doors, Mr. King. There's a car coming down the driveway, Mike. Yeah, but he's not coming all the way, boss. He's stopping on top of that small hill where the driveway goes up and turns out to the main road. That's peculiar. Now he's put his headlights out. Mike, uh, search this house. See if you can find Nettie Craven. But be careful. I will, Mr. Keene. Get hold of John Digby to help you. I'm going outside again and see what our latest visitor is up to. Who's there? Who are you? My name is Halliday. Arthur Halliday, the medical student? The ex-medical student. If it wasn't for Dr. Prentice, I might have been practicing now. If your character had been what it should have, Dr. Prentice and the school board wouldn't have stood in your way. You must be the man I talked to on the phone a few minutes ago. That's right. My name is Keene. Get out of my way. It's Prentice I want to see. Now, just a moment. Do you happen to know that Dr. Prentice's daughter, Laura, has been murdered? Laura? Murdered? You didn't read about it in the papers? I... I just got back from New Orleans. I tried to get into another medical school down there, but they wouldn't have me. That's Dr. Prentice's fault, too. When a man has a bad reputation, it travels fast, Halliday. I'm not asking you for your opinion, Keene. I asked Laura to help me, but she wouldn't. So I decided to take matters into my own hands. Now get out of my way before I shoot. I had a feeling you were rather stealthy about your movements. Parking your car up there in the hill. And sneaking down Dr. Prentice's driveway in the dark. That gun you have seems to bear me out. I'm going to get square, see? Prentice is my enemy. And if it's the last thing I do... Look out behind you, Halliday. Don't try and trick me. Your car, it's running wild. What? Jump, Halliday. <laughs> Put him over here on this couch, Mike. There. Easy now. His car rolled down the hill and smashed into the house after hitting Halliday. I don't think he's seriously injured, just stunned. I managed to push him partly out of the way. Well, Mr. Keene, how could a man be dumb enough to park a car on a hill with his handbrake off? The brake was on when I left it. Did you hear what he said, boss? Yes, Mike. That means someone deliberately released that handbrake hoping the car would roll down and kill the two of us. Where are John Digby and Maud Craven? Here I am, Mr. Keene. Well, what's happened? This man's been hurt, Miss Craven. Where have you been? I, I heard a noise upstairs and I went up to investigate. I hoped that I might be able to reason with my sister Nettie and save you trouble, Mr. Keene. You haven't left this house? No, Mr. Keene. Where's John Digby, Mike? Well, he wasn't in that bedroom where he went to lie down, boss. So I started to search the house by myself and... Just as I started down into the cellar, I heard the car crash and I... Get up! Chance preserve us. What was that? Mr. Keene, 
Sounded like my sister, Nettie. Sounds like an insane person, all right. Enough to chill you to the marrow. Just listen to her. It's coming from the cellar, Mike. Come on, let's get down there immediately. Mr. Keene, stay where you are. For heaven's sake, don't move. It's John Digby, boss. And Nettie Craven standing behind him, Mike, with an axe in her hands. <laughs> yes, I'm Nettie Craven. Don't move, either of you. Do as she says, Mr. Keene. Or she'll bury that axe in the back of my head. Nettie, why do you want to harm John Digby? Who are you? I'm a friend of yours, Nettie. Are you? <laughs> Won't you put that axe down so we can talk? <laughs> I can talk with the axe in my hand. Where's Dr. Prentice? He's not here, Nettie. That's all they ever do is lie to me. Where is he? I told you, Dr. Prentice is not here. Tell him his patient's here. Tell him the most beautiful patient he ever had is waiting for him. She's as mad as a hatter, Mr. Keene. Mad, am I? I'll show you who's mad! Nettie, wait. I think you're very clever, Nettie. Now, there's a man with sense. How long have you been hiding here in Dr. Prentice's house? None of your business. Do you know that it's snowing very hard outside? Snowing? Wasn't snowing when I came in? No, oh, you'll need rubbers when you go home, or you'll catch a cold. Yes, I will. Wouldn't you like us to take you home in a car? A big car? A very big one. Where do you want us to take you? I want to see Dr. Prentice. Why? I... I don't know. I had a reason. I forget it now. Nettie, but... do you want that ride? In the car? Yes. Yes, I'd love it. Then <laughs> put the axe down. <laughs> She's dropped the axe. Grab her. Let grab me her. handle this, John. Nettie... Did you kill Dr. Prentice's daughter, Laura? I never killed anyone. But you once threatened Dr. Prentice, didn't you? Nettie? Nettie, what are you doing down there? Maud! It's my sister, Maud! Oh, oh thank heaven you found her, Mr. Keene. Is everything all right? Yes, Miss Craven. Mike, you have an extra pair of handcuffs, haven't you? Oh, you, you're not going to handcuff my sister, Nettie, are you? No, I believe I can handle Nettie with a little psychology. We're going to handcuff you, Maud Craven. Me? Put them on her, Mike. What for? The murder of Laura Digby. Oh, it's a lie! A few moments ago, you told me you never left that living room, Maud Craven. Yet your shoes were wet, and I saw snowflakes in your hair. You were outside the house, and you released the handbrake in Arthur Halliday's car. It was Nettie. She did it. No, Maud. I know that your sister Nettie has been inside since it started snowing, because her shoes are dry. The one who released that car brake and tried to kill Halliday and me was the one who murdered Dr. Prentice's daughter, Laura. You can't prove I did that. No? Well, we'll see. There are fingerprints on that brake handle, no doubt. And I have a hunch they'll match with yours. But I was wearing gloves. Yes, of course you were. However, that admission is all I needed. <laughs> oh, you tricked me. You tricked me, Mr. Keene, just now the way Dr. Prentice did. How did he trick you? I thought he was in love with me, but he was only leading me on. <laughs> I knew you fell for him, Maud. I knew it all the time. You used to be there when he came to see me at the hospital to talk to me. I could see it in your eyes. <laughs> But he didn't fall for you. That's right, <laughs> Nettie. Stand up for him. One of the reasons I wanted to get rid of him was because of you. Don't you see, Nettie? Dr. Prentice was the one who said you were insane. He put you in that hospital. You know you hated him. Mr. Keene, look at Maud Craven's eyes. She looks as crazy as her sister Nettie. Yes, I know, John. It appears that both sisters are hopelessly insane. You fool, you idiots. If you try to turn me in, you'll get what Laura got. So that's why you murdered Laura. She must have found out about your mental condition and was going to tell her father. Yes. That must have been why Laura was worried, Mr. Keene. Exactly, John. Your wife, Laura, found out that Maud Craven was as insane as her sister. But before she could inform the doctor, Maud entered the house and killed her. <laughs> Is 
Maud coming with us now? Yes, Nettie, she's coming with you. <laughs> she's going to stay with you in the mental hospital. <laughs> Mark, I think we can take both of them away and consider the case of the Rushville murder as closed. And so Mr. Keene finds the solution to the case of the Rushville murder. Time now for Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. Now for Mr. Keene and the Bride and Groom murder case. Our scene opens in a roof garden restaurant which is located atop a 14-story building in mid-Manhattan. The dance floor is crowded with gay people, while at a small table in the corner, a young man and his lovely young bride gaze out of the large window at the breathtaking skyline which is New York after dark, a skyline that is soon destined to become a backdrop for horror. Oh, what a fascinating restaurant this is, Roy. It's one of the most popular in New York, Olivia. Just look at that view through the window. Yeah, there's a terrace that goes around the roof. It isn't very cold this evening. Would you like to go out and see what New York looks like at night? Oh, I'd love to, darling. Okay, let's go. Out this door. Oh, Roy. What a heavenly view. Yeah, this roof garden restaurant is on the 14th floor. You can see most of Manhattan from here. There's Central Park. And Broadway's over there. See the lights? Mm-hmm. You're happy, darling. Very happy, Roy. This is one honeymoon that's going to last forever. Oh, great Scott, I forgot to phone my mother. Well, must you do it now? Oh, you know how mother is, Olivia. I'd better give her a ring at her hotel. Will you wait here on the terrace for me? I won't be long. All right, Roy. I'll make the conversation a short one. Oh, I never dreamed the city could look so romantic at night. Roy? Is that you? What? What are you doing? What's the matter with you? No! No! Let go of me! Let me go! Don't break me! No! When I returned to the terrace, Mr. King, there was a crowd there. That's when I learned that Olivia, my bride, had been pushed off the roof to her death on the street below. Were there any witnesses, Roy? Well, if someone had seen the killer, I, I wouldn't have come to you, Mr. King. The case would be an easy one for the police to solve. But if there were no witnesses, young fella, how do you know it was murder? Olivia would never have killed herself. My partner, Mike Clancy, didn't mean it that way, Roy. Maybe she slipped or lost her balance. Well, that couldn't have happened. The railing around the terrace was several feet high. Besides, the police are almost certain it was murder. Why, Roy? Well, there was a slight drizzle in the air last night, Mr. Keene, and there were footprints near the spot where Olivia was standing. The police deduced from the footprints that Olivia must have struggled before she was pushed over the rail. I see. We had only been married a week, Mr. Keene. We'd come to New York on our honeymoon. Olivia was the most wonderful girl I've ever known. You mustn't let this tragedy ruin your own life, Roy. You're young. You've got to learn to live with your sorrow. It would make it a great deal easier, Mr. Keene, if I could get my hands on whoever killed my wife. That job will be mine and Mike Clancy's. Now tell me, do you or your wife have any friends or relatives in New York? Olivia's half-brother lives here with his wife. Those are the only people we know in New York. My home is in Cleveland, Mr. Keene. Have you seen your wife's half-brother recently? Yes, he invited Olivia and me to dinner the night before last. We only arrived in New York on Monday. Oh. While you were telling me the story just now, you said you left your bride on the terrace and went to telephone your mother. Does she live in New York? No, but she arrived here yesterday. Mother's a buyer for a department store, and my father is dead. Mother's semi-annual buying trip to New York happened to coincide with our honeymoon. I suppose the news of your wife's death shocked her. Oh, mother was terribly shocked, Mr. Keene. I... I've been worrying about her, too. You, 
You see, she just got out of a hospital. Oh? What was wrong with her, Roy? She was run down and needed a rest. But she recovered quickly and went back to her job. I see. Now, is there anything else you might be able to tell us? For instance, did your wife have any enemies that you know of? No, Mr. Keene. I, I can't imagine who would want to harm her. All I ask is that you put this killer, whoever he is, behind bars. We'll do our utmost, Roy. Where are you staying? At the hotel barrage. Mother's staying there, too. And your brother-in-law? Where does he live? Elliot Warwick and his wife live at 975 East 60th. Take that down, will you, Mike? Right, boss. We'll get in touch with you very soon, Roy. Very well, Mr. Keene. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, Mr. Clancy. So long, young fellow. Goodbye, Roy. Oh, sure, it must be a terrible blow to lose a wife, Mr. Keene. And on a honeymoon, too. Yes, Roy Farnham is a very unhappy young man right now, Mike. I'll take it. Hello? Is this Mr. Keene? Yes. My name is Elliot Warwick. My half-sister was murdered last night. She was pushed off a roof. It hasn't been reported in the papers yet. I'm familiar with the tragedy, Mr. Warwick. You are? Your brother-in-law just left my office. Roy Farnham, what did he want? He asked me to investigate the case on his behalf. He would. How do you mean, Mr. Warwick? Did he tell you his wife, my half-sister, was an heiress? And did he say that he only holds down a $60 a week job? What would that have to do with his wife's murder? Roy Farnham inherits one million dollars from Olivia. I called you myself, Mr. Keene, to ask you to investigate the case. If you could come over to my house now, I'll give you a few facts that might surprise you. In that case, Mr. Warwick, I'll lose no time in getting over there. I have your address. Roy Farnham gave it to me. I'll be waiting for you. Goodbye, Mr. Keene. Goodbye. What's up, boss? Mike, that was Olivia Farnham's half-brother, Elliot Warwick. He implied that Roy Farnham himself might have killed his wife for her money. Saints preserve us. Roy didn't look like that kind of a lad. Well, we're certainly going to investigate. At the same time, it'll give us an opportunity to see how Elliot Warwick and his wife fit into this case. Come in, Mr. Keene. Mr. Clancy. Oh, thank you, Mr. Warwick. Jane! What is it, Elliot? Mr. Keene and his partner are here. I hope we're not disturbing your wife, Mr. Warwick. Well, she's been feeling irritable and out of sorts lately, but it's nothing serious. Uh, Jane, this is Mr. Keene and Mr. Clancy, the famous investigators. How do you do? How do you do? Pleased to meet you, ma'am. You know why they're here, Jane. Yes, Elliot. To investigate your sister Olivia's death. Well, I'm going to put my cards on the table, Mr. Keene, and you can take it any way you wish. I didn't like my husband's sister, and her death doesn't break my heart. How can you talk that way, Jane? Elliot, I'm no hypocrite. Olivia and I meant nothing to each other, and I'm willing to admit it. You're very frank, Mrs. Warwick. Mr. Keene, you'd have found that out yourself in any case. And I refuse to put myself in an embarrassing position. To say nothing of a suspicious one? If you're suggesting that I'm a murderer, Mr. Clancy, why don't you put me under arrest? Oh, just a moment, Mrs. Warwick. You're not under suspicion. My partner and I only want your cooperation, nothing more. Sure, and maybe I talked a bit out of turn, Mrs. Warwick. I'm sorry. That's quite all right, Mr. Clancy. I don't believe I can help you, Mr. Keene. Perhaps Elliot can. If you don't mind now, I'd prefer to rest for a while. I have a splitting headache. Go right ahead, Mrs. Warwick. I'll lie down inside, Elliot. All right, dear. Your wife's face looks familiar, Mr. Warwick. You may have seen her on the screen, Mr. Keene. She was a featured player in Hollywood before we married. Oh, she's given up her screen career? For my sake. Well, Mr. Warwick, if you don't mind, I'd like a more thorough explanation of what you suggested over the telephone. You said that Roy Farnham inherits a large fortune from his murdered wife, Olivia? Yes, Mr. Keene. Olivia married Roy only a few days before she was thrown off that roof and killed. Automatically, he becomes the heir to her estate, which is valued at over a million. A million dollar estate? Yes, Mr. Clancy. To make myself clear, I'm accusing Roy of having murdered my half-sister for her money. You have any proof, Mr. Warwick? Proof? What more do you need than that, Mr. Keene? He was with Olivia on that terrace at the Roof Garden restaurant, wasn't he? That doesn't mean he pushed her to her death. Well, I'm just telling you what I know. A girl has an estate worth a million dollars. Mr. Warwick, did you share in that estate as Olivia's half-brother? Why, no. It was left to Olivia by her father who was my stepfather. We didn't get along. 
I moved from Cleveland to New York several years ago and lost touch with the family. Your accusation is a grave one, Mr. Warwick. And in order to be fair to Roy Farnham, I think I must tell him about it. I'm not afraid of him. All right. Do you intend to leave this house today? No. Then I'll phone you later. I may want to speak to you again in Roy's presence. Come along, Mike. Uh, please say goodbye to your wife for us, Mr. Warwick. For just a moment, Mr. Keene. Yes? <sighs> Nothing. I... I forgot what I was going to say. Goodbye, Mr. Warwick. Goodbye. So long, mister. Mike, we've got something to work on at any rate. Well, boss, do you think that this fellow Warwick knew what he was talking about? Accusing Roy Farnham of murdering his own wife? We'll soon find out when we speak to Roy Farnham once more. Let's go over to his hotel right now. Mr. Clancy. I'm getting in touch with you sooner than I expected, Roy. Come in. My mother is here with me. Who is it, Roy? Mr. Keene and Mr. Clancy, Mother. Mr. Keene, the great investigator. I told you I'd gone to consult him about Olivia's death. I'm very glad to know you, Mr. Keene, and you, Mr. Clancy. Pleased to meet you. How do you do, Mrs. Varnum? My reason for coming here isn't a very happy one. And I was hoping I'd be able to speak to your son, Roy, alone. What is it, Mr. Keene? You have any news concerning Olivia's murder? Perhaps. You can say what you like in front of me, Mr. Keene. My son, Roy, and I have never had any secrets from each other. In that case, I'll be frank. Roy, you've been accused of your wife's murder. What? Like, that's insane. Who accused me, Mr. Keene? Your brother-in-law, Elliot Warwick. Oh, naturally. Mr. Keene, he hates my son. Does he, Mrs. Farnham? Why? Because of Olivia's money. He knows my boy will inherit it now that she's gone. Mother, let's not talk about that now, please. Why not, Roy? We want to be honest with Mr. Keene, don't we? I'm hoping you will be, Mrs. Varnum. But Mr. Keene, Elliot Warwick was in the process of suing his sister Olivia when she married Roy. For part of her estate? Yes. He wanted to have his stepfather's will declared invalid. But he didn't get very far. However, now that his half-sister Olivia is dead, I'm sure he thinks he's got a better chance to share in her money. I'd say he has a very good chance, Mrs. Farnham. But at the same time, he's going to try to make trouble for your son, Roy. Oh, no. No, he can't do that. My son's innocent. And he loved that girl. He he even loved him more than he... Oh, Mother. I... I feel faint. She's... She's passing out. I've got her. Mother, what's the matter? Mother... I'll carry her inside, Mr. Keene. Would you please call the house physician? I will, Roy. Mr. Keene, wait a minute. Look at this. What is it, Mike? This drawer near the telephone's half open. Look what's inside. It's a revolver. And a big one. Now, what would a young fellow like Roy Farnham be doing with a gun like this? That's just one of the questions we're going to find an answer for, Mike, after the doctor treats his mother. Mr. Keene, the famous investigator, and his partner, Mike Clancy, are investigating the death of pretty Olivia Farnham, a bride of less than a week, who was pushed from the terrace of a restaurant located 14 stories above the ground. At the moment, Mr. Keene and Mike are in the hotel suite occupied by the victim's husband, Roy, whose mother has just had a sudden fainting spell on hearing that her son may be implicated in the crime. A doctor has arrived, and after treating Mrs. Farnham, has left now in the living room of Roy Farnham's hotel suite. Has the doctor gone, Mr. Keene? Yes, Roy. I was afraid Mother had a heart attack, but I guess it was nothing serious. She seems to be much better. She should be, young fella. There's nothing like a phony think to get a chance to take things easy. I beg your pardon? What my partner Mike Clancy refers to, Roy, is what the doctor just told us. Your mother didn't think. She only pretended to. But that's fantastic. Mother was upset, Mr. Keene, because you were putting me under suspicion of having killed my wife. Suppose we question her about that now. There's no need for that, Mr. Keene. Mother, the doctor was right. But why? Why did you do it, Mother? I think I can answer that, Roy, with your mother's permission. By the way she behaves, I'd say she was very attached to you. My son means more to me than anything else in the world, Mr. Keene. I... 
I only made believe I was ill to gain time for him to answer those terrible accusations. Miss Farnham, is your last sergeant in the hospital another method of gaining time? What do you mean? Your son Roy told me you were ill and had to go to the hospital just before he was married. What hospital were you in, may I ask? The Central in Cleveland. Mike, would you get them on the long-distance phone? Right away, boss. Just a moment, Mr. Keene. Why do you want to call the hospital? To inquire about the nature of your illness. No. But, Mother, there's nothing to be worried about. Or is there, Mrs. Farnham? I... Mr. Keene, I... I only pretended to be ill. I was trying to stop my son Roy's marriage to Olivia. Mother, you don't mean it. I left the hospital, Roy, and followed you and Olivia to New York. Mrs. Farnham, you mean you were so angry with your son for having married... You came here to try and separate him and his bride? Yes, yes. Roy is my son. He belongs to me. Oh, go on, arrest me, Mr. Keene. I was at that roof garden when Olivia was murdered. Arrest me for the crime. Mother. You phoned me at the hotel, didn't you, Roy? And you got no answers. Well, I followed you. I'd heard you mention at that dinner party that you intended to go to the roof garden last night, and I went there, too. What dinner party are you referring to, Mrs. Farnham? The one the Warwicks gave? Yes, Mr. Keene. Olivia's half-brother invited me, too. Well, what are you waiting for? I'm confessing to Olivia's murder. Why don't you turn me over to the police? Because I don't believe you. You don't? Perhaps you were at the restaurant when your daughter-in-law was killed. But you'd have never murdered her yourself. Why do you say that, Mr. Keene? Because suspicion for the crime would have fallen on your son. And I'm sure you do nothing to get him into trouble. No, Mrs. Farnham. You're only trying to protect him now. And I want to know why. Mother, why are you trying to protect me this way? Be quiet, son. Mrs. Farnham, unless you tell me the truth, I'll have to put your son under arrest for the crime. Because that idiot Elliot Warwick accused him of killing Olivia for her inheritance? And also because of the gun we found just now in that drawer. Show it to the mic. It's as big as a cannon, mister. Is that gun yours, Roy? Yes, Mother, it is. But I have a license for it, Mr. Keene. I've carried it for months. For my own protection. Has anyone threatened you? I've, I've had a hunch that trouble was in store for me. Hunches don't count in a court of law, Roy. A jury might think you carried this gun to use on your wife. In the event, another means of killing her had failed. Oh, no. No, don't say that. Mrs. Farnham, I'm willing to help your son, Roy, if he is innocent. But you're hiding something from me, and I've got to know the facts. Tell Mr. Keene everything, Mother. I have nothing to be afraid of. Very well. Mr. King, the part about my being in the restaurant was the truth. Some insanely jealous reaction made me follow my son around wherever he went with his wife. Go on, Mrs. Farnham. I saw him go out on the terrace with Olivia. Then I heard a scream. I rushed around to the back of the terrace. Olivia had fallen to the street. Do you see anyone else there in the terrace? No, Mr. King, but I found something. What was it you found? It's... It's in my handbag. I'll get it. Mr. Keene, my mother didn't see me there on the terrace because I was inside making my phone call to her. Yes, I remember you told me that, Roy. She had complained of not feeling well and I had promised to phone. Mr. Keene, I'm trusting you with my son's life and I'll show you this. Here. It's a ring, boss. Yes, Mike, a man's gold ring. It has my daughter-in-law Olivia's family crest on it. I knew she'd given it to Roy. I found it... I found it on the spot where Olivia must have been standing before she was thrown from the roof. Is this ring yours, Roy? It looks like mine, Mr. King. And your wife gave it to you? Well, there were two rings like that in her family. One was Olivia's and the other was her half-brother Elliot's. Olivia had hers made larger and gave it to me to wear. But I... I can't imagine how that ring got into the restaurant. I I lost mine two weeks ago. But then, Roy, maybe that ring is Elliot Warwick's. Sure, that excuse is a thin one if you ask me, boss. Roy could have lost that ring, all right, when he pushed his wife over the roof and she put up a struggle. That's not true, Mr. Clancy. Let me see your hand, Roy. Hmm. There's one thing I will say. This ring will lead me to Olivia Farnham's murderer. Roy, he doesn't believe us. Mr. Keene doesn't believe us. <laughs> Oh, 
It's you, Mr. Keene. Mr. Clancy. Good evening, Mr. Warwick. Well, did you accuse Roy Farnham of murdering my half-sister? Yes, I told him you had accused him, and he in turn accused you. What? He accused me? <laughs> What's he trying to do, cover for himself? Mr. Warwick, I understand you were suing your sister to break your stepfather's will. Why, why yes, but that's ancient history. I made up with Olivia long ago. Because you realized your lawsuit wasn't strong enough? I, I don't see... However, now that she's dead, I imagine you'll bring suit again. This time against her husband, Roy Farnham, claiming a share of Olivia's estate. I have more of a right to that money than he has. Tell me something, Mr. Warren. Did Olivia leave any life insurance? Not very much. Just how much? $50,000. Not much, did you say? $50,000. And who is the beneficiary? He is, Mr. Keene. Jane. Oh, it's you, Mrs. Warwick. Elliot, you may as well admit the truth to Mr. Keene. You're finished in this murder case. How can you talk like that, Jane, about me? Your husband, the man you love. The man I love. Ha, don't make me laugh. I married you, Elliot, because you filled me full of lies. Lies about your inheriting half a million dollars. But it was your half-sister, Olivia, who inherited the money. And you knew she would all the time. Is that true, Elliot? True, Mr. Keene, I... I was madly in love with Jane, and I had to make her my wife. Yes, at the cost of my Hollywood career. I quit pictures because of your promises, Elliot. And all I got were lies. Go on, Mr. Keene. Put him under arrest. He killed his sister because she made him her insurance beneficiary. She felt sorry for him because he was too stupid to hold a good job. But Jane, Jane, don't say that. She left him $50,000 in insurance money. I'd say that insurance was definitely one of the motives for murder, Mrs. Warwick. Then why don't you arrest Elliot, Mr. Keene? He wasn't even home the night his half-sister was murdered. And where were you, Mrs. Warwick? I was at home. Can anyone else prove that besides yourself? Why do I have to prove it? Because I have some very interesting evidence in regard to Olivia Farnham's murderer. Mr. Warwick, uh, do you recognize this ring? I believe it has your family crest on it. Why, it looks like the ring I gave to Jane. It's a lie. Well, don't you remember, Jane? Olivia had a ring like that, and so did I. There was a family tradition about those rings. We were each supposed to give them to our future marriage partners when we were engaged. Then, then Roy Farnham had one too, Mr. King. Yes, given to him by his wife. However, this is not the ring he received. How do you know? It's much too small for a man's finger. Uh, Mr. Warwick, let me see your finger. That ring doesn't fit any of my fingers, Mr. Keene. But I'll wager it fits your wife. Don't touch me. Oh, take it easy, lady. Mr. Keene, are you saying that Jane... That my wife... I'm saying that your wife murdered your sister for the same reason she tried to blame the murder on you. Money. She evidently married you, thinking you were heir to a fortune. Then tried to make you one by killing your sister. Not only would you and she have gained Olivia's insurance, but the possibility of sharing her estate as well. Don't come near me, any of you. This ring came off your wife's hand when Olivia struggled for her life to keep from being pushed off the roof garden. No, no. You were very clever, Mrs. Warwick. When I first met you, you used a sly psychology. You thought if you candidly admitted disliking your sister-in-law and casting a slight suspicion on yourself, you disarm the authorities and me. Most murderers do everything they can to hide their guilt. Jane, I can't believe it of you. Your wife was worried when I returned here tonight, Mr. Warwick. And to save herself, she tried to pin the murder on you. All right, Mike. You can put the handcuffs on Jane Warwick. Right, boss. You'll never be able to take me to prison. Do you understand? Boss, look out. She's picked up a fire poker. <laughs> Afraid of me, aren't you? Well, why don't you come again? <laughs> Mr. King, she fell through the window. It's nine stories to the ground. Well, Sean, that's justice for you. Yes, Mike. Jane Warwick, at the same fate she dealt her victim. We'd better go down there to the street. Meanwhile, I'll call police headquarters and tell them we found a little via Farnham's murderer, and the case is closed. <laughs> And so Mr. Keene finds the solution to the bride and groom murder case. Mr. Keene, tracer of lost persons, has been a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service.
the voice of information and education. It's time now for Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. Ladies and gentlemen, Anison and Kalinos present Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction in one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday at the same time, the famous old investigator takes from his file and brings to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. Tonight's case is entitled, The Telephone Book Murder Case. Here is something you should know if you ever suffer from the sudden pain of headaches, neuritis, or neuralgia. It's a way to ease the pain, often within a few minutes. A way that is incredibly fast and effective. It's anison. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven, active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people were first introduced to anison through their own physicians or dentists. But today, it is in such widespread use that all drug counters have it, and anyone may enjoy its benefits. Next time you suffer from the pains of a headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, by all means, try Anison. You'll like the convenience of Anison tablets, and you'll be delighted with Anison's incredibly fast action. For most effective relief, use only as directed. A-N-A-C-I-N. Anison. Ask for it today at your druggist. Now for Mr. Keene and the telephone book murder case. Our scene opens in a fashionable New York mansion, the home of a wealthy bachelor. At the moment, he's standing before a mirror in the drawing room, putting the finishing touches to his evening clothes as his valet stands nearby, both unaware of the impending tragedy which threatens. Well, how do I look, Edwards? Perfect, sir. Your new dinner jacket is an excellent job of tailoring, Mr. Andrews. Thank you, Edwards. Oh, um, you may take the evening off. These bachelor dinners usually go on for hours, and I won't be home until late. Very good, sir. Uh, good night, Mr. Andrews. Good night. Now, where did he put that top hat? Oh, there it is. Something you want, Edwards? I... Oh, I thought it was my valet. I... What are you doing with that gun, you... Oh! 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 I... I should have known. I should have known. Mr. Andrews! Mr. Andrews! Good evening, Edwards. Is Mr... Mr. Temple, come quick. Shot. He's lying over here on the floor, sir. <laughs> no. A doctor won't help, Edwards. Better call the police. Brad Andrews is dead. I, uh, I beg your pardon... But which one of you gentlemen is Mr. Keene, the famous investigator? Mr. Keene's over here, mister. I'm his partner, Mike Clancy. What can I do for you? My name is Edwards, Mr. Keene. Have you read this morning's paper, sir, about Mr. Andrew's murder? Why, we were talking about that a minute ago. We know some of the details, yes. I was Mr. Andrew's valet, sir. I've come to ask you to enter the case, Mr. Keene. I don't have much money, Sit but down, I... Edwards. And try to calm yourself. It's... It's been like a nightmare, sir. I found Mr. Andrew's body only a minute or two after I left him in the drawing room of his home. I heard the shots, but when I ran into the room, he was already dead. According to the newspapers, someone else was there when the police were called. A friend of Mr. Andrew, sir, Mr. George Temple. He rang the doorbell just after I found Mr. Andrew's lying there. He, uh, 
He told me to call the police. I see. Both gentlemen were about to attend a bachelor dinner given in Mr. Andrews' honor. Oh, Mr. Andrews was about to be married? Uh, yes, next week, sir. He, he was a fine man, Mr. Keene, and a generous one. I worked for him as his valet for over two years, and I... Uh, You're I, very upset about the murder, aren't you, Edwards? Uh, Mr. Keene, I... I told you that Mr. Andrews was a generous man. So generous, you even trembled at the thought of his death? Why, I... I... Oh, do you have another motive for coming here? Edwards, if you want my help, you must give me frankness and honesty in exchange. I wouldn't hide anything from Mr. Keene, Edwards. He'll find it out anyway, sooner or later. Just as sure as a shamrock's green. Uh, perhaps I... Perhaps I am a bit concerned for myself, Mr. Keene, sir. Why, Edwards? I was the only one present in Mr. Andrews' home when he was shot. The police didn't hold me after they questioned me, but I've noticed that someone has been following me around, and I'm sure it's a plain-clothes detective. Well, do the cops have a motive, Edwards? Any reason why you might want to murder Mr. Andrews? No, Mr. Clancy, I haven't done anything. Mrs. Lawford can vouch for my honesty and loyalty to Mr. Andrews. Who is Mrs. Lawford? The woman Mr. Andrews was about to marry, Mr. Keene. She was recently divorced from Herbert Lawford, the uh, industrialist. Oh, yes, yes, he is a very wealthy man. Uh, Mr. Andrews was even wealthier, sir. He owned oil wells in Texas and Oklahoma. He was known as the Oil King. Well, Edwards, my partner and I are going to do everything we can to break this case. All I want to know is, are you quite certain you've told me everything? I, uh, I have, Mr. Keene, sir. As I said before, Mrs. Lawford can vouch for me. Well, I'd like to talk to her. You say Mrs. Mr. Andrews was about to marry her? Uh, yes, sir. She has a suite in the Hotel de Glass. Uh, my wife, Lila, is her personal maid. Oh? Uh, Mr. Andrews was instrumental in getting Lila her position with Mrs. Lawford, sir. I see. I, uh... I want to take the opportunity of thanking both you gentlemen for your help. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, and you'll hear from me shortly. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Clancy. So long, Edwards. Well, I still think that gentleman's gentleman is holding out on us, Mr. Keene. Yes, yeah, so do I, Mike. He knows something about that murder. He's afraid to tell us. But it may be easier to find out what it is through his wife. Uh, Mike, when you were a patrolman on the force years ago, you had quite a reputation with uh, several cooks on your beat. <laughs> well, now, sir, I was no Don Juan, but sometimes I'd drop into Maggie Ryan's kitchen for a cup of coffee and a chat, but, well, that was quite a while ago. Well, you're still very good at getting people to talk without using strung arm methods. I'd like you to talk to Lila Edwards in a friendly way and see if you can get any information out of her. While I'm interviewing her mistress, Mrs. Lawford. Well, I'll do what I can, boss. Mrs. Lawford's hotel suite will be our first stop. And then we'll go on to the scene of the crime. Yes, sir? Is Mrs. Lawford at home? Why, who's calling, sir? Mr. Keene and Mr. Clancy. Mr. Keene, the investigator? Oh, please come in, sir. Mrs. Lawford will be back in a few minutes, sir. Please make yourselves comfortable. Oh, thank you. I, uh, I was wondering if I could have a glass of water, miss. Oh, why, of course, Mr. Clancy. I'll get it for you. Oh, don't trouble yourself. I'll go along. I'll, uh, wait here, Mike. All right, Mr. Keene. Here's the pantry. Just a moment, please. Hmm. Sure, and I see you're careful about how you run the water. <laughs> well, it's precious right now. Oh, it sure is. And by the looks of this pantry, I'd say that uh, the cook was careful about the rest of the house as well. Well, I'm not a very good cook, Mr. Clancy. As a matter of fact, my real vocation isn't being a lady's maid either. Oh, no? I'm studying shorthand now so I can get a position as someone's secretary. Well, more power to you. Of course, my husband... Your husband what, miss? Oh, he just doesn't seem to understand that a girl likes to go up in the world. Or sometimes he's so narrow-minded and jealous, I could scream. Oh, that's so. 
But maybe I'm talking too much, Mr. Clay. Oh, sure, and I'm a man with a sympathetic ear, Mrs. Uh... My name's Edwards, Lila Edwards. Oh, and you're married to a jealous man, eh? Why, he even thought I was flirting with his... Oh, that must be Mrs. Lawford. I'd better answer the door. Okay, Lila. Oh, someone's at the door. Uh, yes, Mr. Keene. Mrs. Lawford must have forgotten her key. Any luck, Mike? Did you learn anything from Lila the maid? Well, Lila's a talker, all right, boss. I found out that her husband, Edwards, that valet, is a jealous man. That's interesting. The gentlemen are in the living room, Mrs. Lawford. Thank you, Lila. Mr. Keene? Yes. I'm Mrs. Lawford. Oh, how do you do? This is my partner, Mike Clancy. How do you do, Mr. Clancy? Pleased to meet you, ma'am. I... I imagine you're here in regard to Brad Andrews' murder. Yes, we are. It was a terrible shock, Mr. Keene. We... We would have been married next week. So I understand. You... You must forgive me if I find it difficult to talk about it. I know what a trial this is for you, Mrs. Lawford. But if I'm to solve this case, I need all the information I can get. I know. I'll do my best to help. Now, can you tell me if Mr. Andrews had any enemies... If he had, I didn't know about them. But he had hundreds of friends, Mr. Keene. Did you notice uh, anything unusual about him lately? Was he troubled by anything? No. I... Wait, there was something that bothered him. I remember how moody he became one evening, which was unlike Brad. He was usually so gay. Did you ask him why he was in that mood? I did, Mr. Keene, but he changed the subject. I forgot about it until now. Oh, it's too bad. Perhaps... Oh... Lila, my maid, must be in her room. I'd better answer the door. Excuse me. Well, it looks as though this visit didn't help us much, Mr. Keene. I wouldn't say that, Mike. Your talk with Lila Edwards gave me an idea or two. Mr. Keene, I want you to meet Mr. George Temple, a good friend of Brad's and mine. Mr. Keene and Mr. Clancy George. How do you do? Pleased to meet you. You have no idea how pleased I am that you're investigating Brad Andrews' murder, Mr. Keene. I'm sure we'll have quick results now that you're on the case. We hope to do our best, Mr. Temple. Mrs. Lawford. Yes, Lila. Shall I serve tea, madam? Please. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Keene, I hope you'll be... Eve, is, uh... Is that your maid? Ah, yes, George. How long have you had her? Oh, three weeks. Mr. Temple, why do you ask? Mr. Keene, I saw that girl three nights ago in the Pelican Club. I was there with Brad Andrews at the time. The Pelican Club? Saints preserve us, but that's one of the most expensive nightclubs in town. Yes, Mike, a very expensive place for a girl who works as a lady's maid. But Lila couldn't afford to go to a place like that. Eve, she was there. And she was dressed in the most beautiful gold evening gown I've ever seen. Did you say a gold evening gown? Yes, that's right. Why, I lost a gold lame evening gown about a week ago. You lost an evening gown, Mrs. Lawford? Yes, Mr. Keene. Mr. Temple, can you describe the gown Lila was wearing in that nightclub? Well, it uh, it had sequins on the shoulder and uh, and a long sash. That's my that... gown. I'm sure of it. It was an exclusive design. Perhaps your evening gown wasn't lost, Mrs. Lawford. It may have been stolen. By Lila? Mr. Clancy, you think my maid would steal? We'll find out soon enough. Come into the pantry with me, Mike. Okay, Mr. King. I never would have believed that Lila was a... Pantry door is closed, Mike. It was open just a minute ago, Mr. Keene. Here, I... I... There's no one here, boss. Lila's gone, Mike. That door on the other side must lead to the hotel corridor. You're right, boss. It does. She's run out on us. She must have seen George Temple and recognized him, too. Ask the police to send out an alarm for her, Mike. No. Wait a minute. I got a better idea. She may try to get in touch with her husband, Edwards. Our next move is Brad Andrews' home, the scene of the murder, and another talk with Edwards, his valet. In just a moment, we'll return to Mr. Keene and the telephone book murder case. Meanwhile, you've read about it, Krypton, K-R-I-P-T-I-N. The antihistamine wonder drug that, taken at the start, can kill a cold. Kill it the way no previous cold tablet, no aspirin, quinine, or chest rub could do. In tests at the United States Naval Hospital, Great Lakes, Illinois, Krypton was preferred by patients over all other formulas tested. For spectacular results, take Krypton at the first sign of a cold. Today at your druggist, get Krypton. Handy pocket size, only 29 cents for 10 tablets. 50 Krypton tablets, 98 cents. Less than 2 cents a tablet. 
And now back to Mr. Keene and the telephone book murder case. Mr. Keene, the great investigator, and his partner, Mike Clancy, are investigating the murder of Brad Andrews, a wealthy oil man who was about to marry a beautiful divorcee named Eve Lawford. In Mrs. Lawford's sumptuous hotel suite, Mr. Keene and Mike meet George Temple, a friend of the victim's, who found the body along with Edwards, Brad Andrews' valet. Now it is discovered that Lila Edwards, the valet's wife, who works for Mrs. Lawford, is missing from the hotel suite. And as Mike and Mr. Keene return to the living room... Mrs. Lawford, your maid Lila Edwards is gone. Gone, Mr. Keene? She ran away, ma'am. I guess she figured Mr. Temple here recognized her. I agree with my partner, Mike Clancy. Since Mr. Temple said he saw Lila in an expensive light club, wearing one of your dresses, Mrs. Lawford, she may be afraid of being arrested for stealing. Or perhaps for murder. Murder? But, Mr. Keene, what connection would Eve's maid have with the murder of Brad Andrews? That's what I intend to find out, Mr. Temple. Well, it beats me. Uh, cigarette, Eve? Mm, uh, no, thank you, George. Mr. Keene? Mr. Clancy, will you have a cigarette? I'll have one of my own cigars, thank you, Mr. Temple. Well, Mike, uh, we'd better be on our way. Oh, you're going, Mr. Keene? Yes, to Brad Andrews' home, the scene of the crime. We are going to question Edwards, Mr. Andrews' valet, a little further. Mr. Keene, sir, and Mr. Clancy. I, I wasn't expecting you. May we come in, Edwards? Uh, why, yes, sir. My partner and I want to make a thorough search of Mr. Andrew's house. I'll show you around, sir. Well, that won't be necessary. Mike can find his way. I'd like to speak to you, if I may, Edwards. Is uh, that the bedroom? Uh, yes, Mr. Clancy. Well, I'll start in there. Mr. Keene, have you found any further clues to poor Mr. Andrews' murder? Yes, several, Edwards. Oh, that's fine, sir. One of them concerns your wife. Lila? Where is she, Edwards? Why, uh, she's with Mrs. Lawford in her hotel suite. She's Mrs. Lawford's maid, sir. Yes, she... I know. But she left there almost an hour ago. She did? And she came here. Here? But why, uh, but why, how do you know, sir? I saw a pair of woman's gloves on the foyer table as we came in. Uh, why, uh, th those belong to, uh... Edwards, to, uh... you came to me for help, and I offered to give it to you. In return, all I'm getting is evasions. But, but Mr. Keene, You're I... not being honest with me. I may have to take you to police headquarters for further questioning about Mr. Andrews' murder. No, no, Mr. Keene, please. I, I'm not trying to interfere with your investigation. Then why don't you tell me the truth? I, I will, sir. And I swear I'll never lie to you again. Is your wife in this house, Edwards? Yes, sir. She arrived ten minutes before you did. Where is she hiding? In my room downstairs, Mr. Keene. Will you get her, please? I want a full explanation from both of you. Very well, sir. Mr. King, sir. Yes, Mike. I've just gone through Mr. Andrews' bedroom, and I come up with something odd. This telephone book. Oh, what's odd about it, Mike? Well, do you know where I found it, sir? In one of the bureau drawers, along with these papers. Those papers look like stocks. All except this document. It's an insurance policy. The others are stock certificates issued by the Exeter Oil Company. Well, let's see that phone book. You notice how old this directory is, Mike? It was printed seven years ago in 1943. And why did Mr. Andrews keep it in a bureau drawer along with these valuable oil stocks? Well, that's something we'll... Uh... Mike. Yes, boss. Someone placed a marker in this phone book. Let's find the page. Ah, uh, here it is. Boss, one of the phone numbers in that page is circled with a red pencil. Yes, A.C. Elwood. Mike, call this phone number. If there's no answer... It's been a long time, boss. Maybe Elwood don't have a phone anymore. Then check with the latest telephone book for his name. If that doesn't help, get in touch with the police. Ask them to go through their criminal files for 1943 and check for an A.C. Elwood. Okay, sir. But don't do it here in the Andrews house, Mike. I don't want you to be overheard. Phone from the outside. And then wait for me in front of the door. Right, boss. 
Mr. Keene, here is Lila, my wife. Oh, Mr. Keene, oh, please, sir, I didn't mean to steal that dress. I just wanted to borrow it. Dress? What dress? Edwards, your wife, Lila, was seen several nights ago in the Pelican Club, wearing one of Mrs. Lawford's evening gowns. Who are you with, Lila? I... I... Was it Mr. Andrews? No. Edwards, do you suspect your wife of seeing Mr. Andrews behind your back? Yes, Mr. Keene. That's why I... I was afraid to go to the police when he was murdered. I thought they'd blame it on me. Because of jealousy? I had reason to be jealous. I know that now. No! But apparently you picked the wrong man to be jealous of. When your wife was seen in that nightclub, she wasn't with Mr. Andrews. Then it was someone else. Yes. Yes, it was someone else, John. My cousin Frank. Frank Nils? Yes. You certainly couldn't be jealous of him. Then why didn't you tell me about it, Lila? Because you hated the idea of my going out and having a good time. You didn't want to spend money on me, so I decided to spend it on myself. It was fun to dance and see a show every once in a while. But you're too dingy and narrow-minded to realize that. In case you're unaware of it, there's something more at stake here than a quarrel between a husband and wife. You too, Lila, could be arrested on suspicion of murder. (gasps) No. You might have killed Mr. Andrews to keep him from giving you away on two counts. One to your husband and the other in regard to that stolen dress. I swear I didn't kill him, Mr. Keener. I would never... I'll stand by her, sir. If you say my wife is a killer, I say you've made a terrible mistake. I didn't say she was, Edwards. I only told you how the police might look at it. However, I want you both to remain here until I get in touch with you again. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Then you're not going to turn me into the police, Mr. Keene. Lila, you promised to return the dress you took from Mrs. Lawford. And I'll expect you to keep that promise. As for the murder, I believe I'll have the solution in a very short time. I didn't keep you waiting long in front of the house here, Mr. Keene. What did you learn, Mike? Well, sir, the phone company told me that A.C. Elwood hasn't been a subscriber for seven years. And then I checked with the cops. A.C. Elwood's wanted for murder, boss. They've been looking for that character for years. And I've got a complete description. With that description, Mike, I think we'll be able to put our hands on Brad Andrews' murderer within half an hour. Oh, Mr. Keene. Good evening, Mrs. Lawford. Oh, back again, Mr. Keene? I'm glad you remain here, Mr. Temple. I have some news for both of you. I was just about to leave, but... uh, You can spare a few minutes, Mr. Temple, can't you? Of course. Mrs. Lawford, it occurred to me after I left that I'd heard something about you before. I believe I read an account of your recent divorce and why it occurred. What? My husband and I were incompatible, that's all, Mr. Keene. And in the late Brad Andrews, you found the perfect mate? Yes. Did his wealth have anything to do with it? What do you mean? If I recall correctly, your husband divorced you because of your extravagant habits. You spent over a million dollars within a span of three years. Mr. Keene, it wasn't entirely my fault. My husband didn't love me. I, I, I tried to find some escape in living luxuriously. But I swear I fell sincerely in love with Brad Andrews after I received my divorce. But Brad Andrews was a rich man. This life insurance policy is proof of that. It carries an insurance of one million dollars. What? I didn't know Brad Andrews carried a million dollar policy. Yes, he did, Mr. Temple. Mrs. Lawford here is the beneficiary. Brad took that insurance policy out just before he died. I know what you're getting at, Mr. Keene. You're trying to accuse me of killing the man I love for that insurance money. But I have nothing to be afraid of. Because I'm innocent. You'd have a great deal to be afraid of, Mrs. Lawford, if I hadn't already solved this case. Mr. Keene, you found the killer? Yes. Uh, Mr. Temple, do you have a cigarette by any chance? Why, of course. Oh, thank you. Uh, may I see that cigarette case, Mr. Temple? Here you are. Hmm. Why, well, it's very handsome. Now, I bought it years ago. But, uh, about this murder... Oh, yes. Uh, can either of you... Identify a firm named the Exeter Oil Company? Why, yes, Mr. Keene. That's the company George here is interested in. Yes, it is. It's probably a fraudulent concern. What? Temple, I'm putting you under arrest for the murder of Brad Andrews. Mr. Keene! 
The initials in this cigarette case are A-C-E. A-C-E stands for A.C. Elwood, a man who's already wanted by the police for a murder that took place seven years ago. Don't move either of you. George, good heavens, Mr. Keene, he has a gun. Yes, Miss Lawford. George Temple here is a very dangerous man. He had a date with Brad Andrews to attend that bachelor dinner. He entered Andrews' house, killed his alleged friend, and left. A few moments later, he rang the bell and pretended to have just arrived in order to provide an alibi for himself. That's a very clever deduction, Keene. And I know your motive, too, Temple. Brad Andrews found out in some way that you were A.C. Elwood, the man wanted for murder. He found your real name in an old phone book and connected it with your present alias. He was trying to investigate you more thoroughly when you put an end to his life. Andrews thought he was putting something over on me, letting me go on thinking we were still chummy, when all the time he was trying to send me to the electric chair. I should say he became suspicious of you because of that oil stock which you sold him and which is undoubtedly worthless. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised how much of it I've sold to half a dozen other chumps. And you've made one mistake yourself, Keene. You gave me a chance to pull this gun, and now I'm going to make you pay for that. Oh, Mr. Keene! Oh, I just managed to clip him before he pulled the trigger, boss. Which was lucky for me, Mike. That was fast work. He, he's dead, Mr. Keene. Yes, Mrs. Laughlin. He didn't know that Mike Clancy was hiding in the foyer on my orders. Call the police, Mike. It looks as though A.C. Elwood, alias George Temple, was the one who made a fatal mistake. And it was his last. And so Mr. Keene finds the solution to the telephone book murder case. The next time you are suffering from the pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, try Anison. You'll bless the day you heard of this incredibly fast way to relieve these pains. Now, the reason Anison is so wonderfully fast-acting and effective is this. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing Anison tablets from their own dentist or physician, and in this way have discovered the incredibly fast relief Anison brings from pain of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. So next time such pain strike, take Anison. For most effective relief, use only as directed. Your druggist has Anison in handy boxes of 12 and 30, and economical family size bottles of 50 and 100. The name is Anison, A-N-A-C-I-N. Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, is based on the novel Mr. Keene. The radio sequel is originated and produced by Frank and Ann Hummer. Dialogue by Lawrence Clee. Bennett Kilpack plays Mr. Keene. It is on the air every Thursday at this time. Don't miss Mr. Keene next Thursday when the kindly old Tracer turns to the Weeping Willow Murder Case. When knife-like pains are stabbing you in the back from unusual exercise, lifting, or other muscular strain, it's a good time to try heat liniment. Heat is strong, yet does not burn the skin. You just brush it on the sore place with the applicator, and right away heat starts to penetrate to ease the pain and bring soothing relief. And it keeps on working for hours to bring grand comfort. Get heat liniment at your drugstore. It's H-E-E-T, heat. Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, will be on the air next Thursday at this same time. This is Larry Elliott saying goodbye for Mr. Keene and the Whitehall Pharmacal Company, makers of Anison and Kalinos, and many other dependable, high-quality drug products. It's time now for Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. <laughs> Late 
Ladies and gentlemen, Anison and Kalinos present Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons. One of the most famous characters of American fiction and one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday at the same time, the famous old investigator takes from his file and brings to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. Tonight's case is entitled, The Case of Murder and the Jewel Thief. Physicians and dentists have had much to do with spreading the fame of Anison. Many have been giving their patients Anison tablets and envelopes for years. These people know how incredibly fast Anison acts to relieve the pains of headaches, neuritis, or neuralgia. Why not take this tip when you're suffering from headache, neuritis, or neuralgia pain? Take Anison, the modern way to relieve pain. Anison acts promptly. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, it contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven, active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Next time you suffer pain from a headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, don't wait for relief. Try Anison. You'll be delighted with its incredibly fast, effective action. For most effective relief, use only as directed. Ask for Anison, spelled A-N-A-C-I-N, at your drug counter today. <laughs> Mr. Keene and the case of murder and the jewel thief. Our scene opens in the office which Mr. Keene, the great investigator, shares with his friend and partner, Mike Clancy. The telephone is ringing, and as Mike reaches for the receiver, he is unaware that he's about to raise the curtain on a startling drama. Mr. Keene's office. Is this Mr. Keene? No, this is his partner, Mike Clancy speaking. May I talk to Mr. Keene? It's very important. Well, uh, who's calling, please? Tell him it's Mr. Carl Rollins. Well, just a second. Mr. Keene? Yes, Mike? There's a fellow named Carl Rollins who wants a word with you. He says it's important. Carl Rollins? All right, Mike, I'll take it. Hello? Mr. Keene? Yes? This is Carl Rollins. I've got to see you right away. In regard to what, Mr. Rollins? Well, I... I can't talk about it now, over the phone, but if it means anything to you, I'm also known as Kansas Carl. Kansas Carl? Sans preserve us, Mr. Keene. But isn't Kansas Carl the jewel thief the cops have been after for months? Just a moment, Mike. Hello, Mr. Rollins. Yes, Mr. Keene. Where are you calling from? My room's on 10th Street, number 892, apartment 4D. All right. You'll wait there for me? Yes, I'll... What? What? Mr. Rollins. Hello. Hello. What happened, boss? I'm sure I heard revolver shots, Mike. We've got to get over to Rollins' apartment right away. Well, this must be the flat, Mr. Keene. There's the name over the doorbell. Rollins. I don't think there's any point in ringing, Mike. If the door isn't open, we'll have to break it down. It's open, boss. Well, let's go in and keep your gun handy, Mike. Right, boss. Well, the room is empty, Mr. Keene. So it seems, Mike. You want me to go down and see if I can find the landlady or the superintendent? Just a minute, Mike. Do you smell anything? Sure. I smell powder. A gun was discharged in this room a little while ago. There's no doubt that those were pistol shots I heard over the telephone. Yeah, but nothing's disturbed, boss. The place seems empty. Mike, look at the floor. What? There's blood run along the crack in the wood there. It's coming from under that couch. Quickly, Mike, pull the couch away from the wall. Yes. Oh, Saints preserve us. There he is. It must be Carl Rollins. With two bullets in his head. He's dead, Mike. I'll see if I can find an identification on him. Eh, he's got a, a wallet in his pocket, Mr. Keene. And a little notebook with some addresses in it. Well, let me have the wallet, Mike. I, it identifies him as Carl Rollins, the man who phoned our office. He was shot down before he could say why he got in touch with me. Well, it beats me, Mr. Keene. This fellow was wanted in half the states in the country for jewel robberies. Yes, Kansas Carl was known as the Society Jewel Thief. Well-educated, with impeccable manners, he'd impress rich people and then rob them. But why should he get in touch with you, Mr. Keene? Sure, and he'd have known you'd turn him into the police at, 
at the drop of a hat. Exactly. Maybe that's just why. There's someone at the door, boss. Before you answer it, Mike, pull that couch back and hide the body once more. I'll put a chair over the blood stain on the floor. Okay, sir. There. All right, Mike. Now you can open the door. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. I must have the wrong apartment. Just a moment, madam. Whom did you want to see? Oh, Mr. Rollins. I... You have the right place. Please come in. Let me introduce myself. My name is Keene, and this is my partner, Mr. Clancy. Mr. Keene, the famous investigator. And who are you, may I ask? Mrs. Andrea Mitchell. I'm a good friend of Mr. Rollins. But why are you here? Has something happened to Carl? I'll explain in just a moment. First, I'd like you to tell me, how long have you known Carl Rollins? We met six months ago. As a matter of fact, we're engaged to be married. I'm a widow, Mr. Keene. And what business was Mr. Rollins in, Mrs. Mitchell? He's a jewel importer. Oh, I'll say he was. I beg your pardon? All right, Mike, we shouldn't wait any longer. You better notify the police. The police? Mr. Keene, what's happened to Carl? Please tell me. Carl Rollins has been murdered, Mrs. Mitchell. <gasps> murdered? Oh, oh no. No, he, he could... Oh... She's fainted, Mr. Keene. I'll take care of her, Mike. You call the police and report the murder of Carl Rollins, alias Kansas Carl. Are you feeling stronger, Mrs. Mitchell? Mr. Keene, you... You said that Carl... We found his body in his apartment here just a few minutes before you came in. Well, Lieutenant Hale of the Homicide Squad said he'll be down right away. All right, Mike. Where is Carl's body, Mr. Keene? Perhaps you better not see him, Mrs. Mitchell. Remain where you are in that chair until you feel better. Who killed him? Carl had no enemies. His life was above reproach. Mr. Keene, either the lady never knew what was going on or she's a pretty good actress. Never knew what? Mr. Keene, what does Mr. Clancy mean? Carl Rollins was a well-known jewel thief, Mrs. Mitchell. The police have been after him for months. Oh, no! No, I don't believe it. It happens to be true. But Carl loved me. He, he was a respectable man, Mr. Keene. He, he couldn't... His respectability was just a pose, Mrs. Mitchell. However, I have a feeling perhaps his life had changed sometime before he died. But I'm afraid you'll have to answer a great many questions for the authorities. You don't think they connect me with... With Carl Rollins' past? Perhaps they might. However, if you confide in me, Mrs. Mitchell... I may be able to help you. There's so little I can tell you, Mr. Keene. I... I met Carl at a dinner dance six months ago. Given by Mrs. Arthur Van Burton. The wife of the banker? Yes. I... I'm fairly well known in the city, Mr. Keene. My late husband was Elliot Mitchell, the art dealer. When I met Carl Rollins, he was introduced as a jewel importer. I had no idea... He was actually a world-famous jewel thief. He was very clever about hiding his real identity. We saw a great deal of each other for several months. And then Carl proposed to me. I accepted. And I told my daughter we were getting married in a month. I see. Jean, my daughter is only 17, Mr. Keene. She's at a finishing school in Vermont. I, I don't know what will happen when all this notoriety comes out. I'm not worried about myself. I'm only thinking of Jean. I understand, Mrs. Mitchell. Mr. Keene, if you could help me, I'd be very grateful. I swear I knew nothing about Carl's past. Well, tell me, Mrs. Mitchell, did your husband leave you a great deal of money when he passed away? Oh, no, he didn't. He left debts. Debts I had to pay off with most of his insurance. Did Carl Rollins know about that? Yes, I told him. And he still wanted to go through with the wedding? Oh, yes, Mr. Keene. To tell you the truth, I had to borrow money from him in order to send my daughter back to school. Kansas Carl giving money away? Sure, that takes the cake, Mr. Keene. Mike, I have a hunch that something happened to Carl Rollins' character recently. I believe he changed from being a ruthless thief to a decent citizen. That may have been the reason he got in touch with me before he was murdered. Mr. Keene, I swear to you that there was nothing but good in Carl when he died. You've got to believe that. Because if you don't, I know you won't believe my story. And I need your help desperately for my daughter Jean's sake as well as my own. There's just one thing more I want to ask you, Mrs. Mitchell. 
Did you ever meet any of Carl Rollins' friends or acquaintances? No, Mr. Keene. But there was one woman he spoke of. A woman named Grace Bentley. She was older than Carl, I believe. And when he spoke of her, he almost sounded as if he were talking of his mother, who has been dead for many years. What did he tell you about her, Mrs. Mitchell? Well, just that she was a good friend and he trusted her. Do you know where Grace Bentley can be found? I believe she's a seamstress, Mr. Keene, and lives alone. Oh, I think Carl had her address in a small notebook he always carried with him. Well, that must be the book we found in his pocket, boss. Well, let me see it, Mike. Yes, Grace Bentley's name is in this book, along with her address. Well, Mrs. Mitchell, the police will be here any moment now. Oh, what shall I tell them, Mr. Keene? Just what you told me. But if my name is connected with this murder, my daughter Jean will know. Her friends at school will hear of it and she'll be ostracized. I don't think that'll happen. I'm going to ask the police to keep this case out of the newspapers as long as possible. It may make it easier for us to solve. What about the addresses in that notebook, boss? The police will want to check every one of them, I'm sure, Mike. But we can help them by seeing Grace Bentley ourselves. Perhaps she can shed a little light on... one of the most puzzling cases we've had in months. The number on Miss Bentley's letterbox outside was 12, Mr. Keene. This apartment is number 12, Mike. Remember one peep out of you, you got a bullet through your head. Oh. Boss, did you hear that? Yes, Mike. Listen. Now just sit there until I'm through. Try the door, Mike. Softly. It's locked, Mr. Keene. Get your gun out. Can you smash the lock with one shot, Mike? I think so, boss. Right after you shoot, I'll push the door in. Someone's being held up at the point of a gun inside that room. We've got to take him by surprise. You ready, Mike? Ready, boss. Mr. King, there's a woman tied up in that chair there. In the bedroom. He's, he's in the bedroom. Well, after him, Mike. Are you Grace Bentley, madam? Oh, yes, please. This wire is cutting my wrist. Well, I'll, I'll have it off in a moment. Oh, oh thank heaven you've come. Who are you, sir? Well, my name is Keene, Miss Bentley. Why, oh, the famous investigator. Oh, you don't know how glad I am to see you. And he got away, Mr. Keene. The bedroom window was open and there's a fire escape leading down to the street. Do you know him, Miss Bentley? Yes. His name is George Darcy. He came to my apartment a few minutes ago with a gun in his hand and tied me to this chair. Do you know why? I think it had something to do with a man I know. Carl Rollins. Miss Bentley, Carl Rollins is dead. Dead? Oh, no. Oh, then it's happened. All his hopes, his attempts to lead a new life came to nothing. I knew Carl very well, Mr. Keene. Did you know that he was really Kansas Carl, a famous jewel thief wanted by the police? Yes. And I might say that I was the cause of his turning over a new leaf and going straight. Suppose you tell me the entire story, Miss Bentley, but... Before you start, I want to send out a police alarm for this man, George Darcy. Have you any idea where he lives? No, Mr. Keene, I haven't. What does he look like? He's tall and, and dark, about 30 years of age. He, he doesn't look like a gunman at all. Telephone that description into the police, Mike. Right, boss. Meanwhile, Miss Bentley can tell me what she knows about Carl Rollins. You know, the more this murder case progresses, the more convinced I am that the final picture may be an amazing one. In just a moment, we'll return to Mr. Keene and the case of murder and the jewel thief. Meanwhile, it's the big medical news wherever you go. It's Krypton, K-R-I-P-T-I-N. The antihistamine wonder drug that taken at the start can kill a cold. Kill it not in days, but in hours. In tests at the United States Naval Hospital, Great Lakes, Illinois, Krypton proved remarkably effective. Was preferred by patients over all other formulas tested. For spectacular results, take Krypton at the first sign of a cold. Today at your druggist, get Krypton. Handy pocket size, only 29 cents for 10 tablets. Bottle of 50 tablets, only 98 cents. Less than two cents a tablet. 
now back to Mr. Keene and the case of murder and the jewel thief. Mr. Keene, the famous investigator, and his partner, Mike Clancy, are investigating the murder of Carl Rollins, alias Kansas Carl, a famous jewel thief who preyed mostly on those in the social register. During the investigation, Mr. Keene and Mike rescued a woman named Grace Bentley, a friend of Carl Rollins, who was being held up by a gunman in her modest apartment. The gunman, George Darcy, escaped. But the story Grace Bentley has to tell appears to Mr. Keene to be very important in regard to solving the murder. And as Mr. Keene listens closely... I first met Carl Rollins about a year ago, Mr. Keene. I was taking in washing then and did sewing on the side. That's the way I've been supporting myself. Did you do some work for Rollins, Miss Bentley? Yes. And he was a charming man. Oh, much younger than I, of course. And I felt more like a mother to him than anything else. You didn't know then that he was actually Kansas Carl, a notorious society jewel thief? No, sir. I found that out a few months later. But after I'd gotten to know him well, I realized that there was something fine and decent in Carl that may have been twisted when he was young. So I decided to try to do something about it. What did you do, Miss Bentley? I reformed him. I gave him something more than important to live for than money and jewels. In the last few months, Mr. Keene, Carl Rollins had changed completely. He was a different man. Even a religious man. Oh, I was very proud. What about George Darcy? What did he have to do with Rollins? Darcy was one of Carl's old cronies. They'd often worked together in jewel robberies. When Darcy came here and held me up, maybe he wanted to get even. You see, I was the one who made Carl break off his partnership in crime with Darcy. I just called the police, Mr. Keene, and gave them a description of Darcy. Tall, dark, and around 30. That was the description you gave my partner, Mike Clancy, wasn't it, Miss Bentley? Yes, Mr. Keene. Tell me, Miss Bentley... Do you think George Darcy may have been involved in Carl Rollins' murder? I, I don't know. Mm. Have you ever met uh, Carl's fiancée, Andrea Mitchell? No, but Carl told me about her. I understand that she's a wonderful woman. And I was glad when he said he was going to marry her. I was glad that there'd be someone else who'd keep him on the right path. You must have been very fond of Carl Rollins to worry about him that way. He reminded me of my brother, John. He took up a life of crime and died while trying to resist the police. I thought I'd be doing John's memory a service by helping Carl. I see. Is there anything else you can add that might help us in any way, Miss Bentley? No, Mr. Keene. In spite of his past, Carl had turned out to be a very fine man. When he called you, I think he was giving himself up. That's what I imagined myself. Maybe he thought you'd be able to help him by acting as a go-between with the police. Well, Mike, I guess Miss Bentley has told us everything. I'm going down to police headquarters now to see if I can identify George Darcy in the rogues' gallery. You want me to go with you, boss? No, Mike. Darcy's still on the loose and he's dangerous. I was thinking of Andrea Mitchell, Carl Rollins' fiance. Darcy might try to strike at her in some way. Suppose you go over to her home, Mike, and I'll join you there in an hour or two. Okay, Mr. Keene. George... Darcy undoubtedly holds the key to Carl Rollins' murder. When we finally get our hands on him, he'll have a great deal to answer for. Will you have another cup of coffee, Mr. Clancy? No, thanks, Mrs. Mitchell. Uh, do you mind if I smoke, ma'am? Please do. I'm very grateful to Mr. Keene for sending you over to my home. Even though I never met this man, George Darcy, he worries me. After what you've told me about him. Well, Mr. Keene himself will be here any minute now. Sure, and is that a picture of your daughter, ma'am? Yes, that's Jean. She's 17. That picture was taken just before her father died. Why, she's a fine-looking girl. Mm -hmm. Oh, someone's at the door. It must be Mr. Keene. Just I a second, Mrs. Mitchell. Mr. Keene wouldn't try to come in without ringing first. Unless it was an emergency. There's the doorbell now. Well, I'll go out, get out of sight behind them drapes there, just to be on the safe side. Oh, Mr. Clancy, you think it now, may be... just answer the door, Mrs. Mitchell, like you were here alone. Let me do the rest. <gasps> oh, 
One scream and I'll shoot, lady. Get inside. Okay. Where is it? Where? Where's what? The loot. And don't fool with me. I want it all. I, I don't know what you're talking about. You and Kansas Carl were going to be married. He must have told you what he did with the stuff. Who did he give it to? Where is it? Stand still, mister. Don't raise that gun or I'll pull this trigger. Drop it. Drop your artillery on the floor. Now just put your hands behind your back. I'll slip a nice pair of shiny handcuffs on them. Hey, I guess that'll hold you for a while, mister. That's probably the boss right now, Mrs. Mitchell. Will you let him in, ma'am? Oh, yes, Mr. Clancy. Mr. Keene. Mrs. Mitchell, I see you have a visitor. Mr. Keene, this man just came in and held me up. If your partner, Mr. Clancy, hadn't been here... I had to put the handcuffs on him, boss. I saw this man going to the house ahead of me, Mike, with his gun drawn. I thought I'd cover him from behind, knowing you were here to protect Mrs. Mitchell. What's your name? Darcy. Sure, and this is George Darcy, the fellow we've been looking for, Mr. Keene. So it appears, Mike. What are you doing here, Darcy? Ask her. What? I don't know what he means. No? Take a look at that pin she's wearing, Keene. What about it? It was stolen eight months ago, along with $100,000 worth of jewels. Why, I never knew this pin was stolen. It isn't very valuable. Maybe not, but the rest of that stuff was worth a fortune, and you know where it is. This, this pin was given to me by Carl Rollins. I never dreamed it was stolen. I'm afraid it could make you an accessory, Mrs. Mitchell. Oh. However, by accusing you, George Darcy has opened himself to suspicion of murder. What? Darcy, you thought Mrs. Mitchell was hoarding some of your ex-partner, Carl Rollins, stolen loot. But you wouldn't have dared to come here to get it if you weren't sure Rollins was dead. Well, I... I want the truth, Darcy. Remember, your own life hangs in the balance, too. I didn't kill Carl. I, I knew he was dead because I found his body in his room. You were in his apartment today. Carl was going to turn himself into the police. He was giving up half a million dollars worth of jewelry. A part of that hall was mine, and I wanted to get hold of it. And you came here thinking Mrs. Mitchell knew where those stolen jewels were. She was going to marry Carl, wasn't she? Were you the man who also held up Grace Bentley a few hours ago and tied her to a chair? She told you it was me? Yes, she said you were angry at her because she broke up your criminal partnership with Carl Rollins. I'm not sore at anyone, Keene. It was strictly a business proposition. I wanted my split of those jewels before Carl turned them into the police. All right, Mike. We'll take this man, Darcy, down to headquarters. You're arresting me for murder? No, Darcy. I'm turning you in for attempted robbery. But I'm fairly certain I'll also turn in Carl Rollins' murderer within an hour. lock on that door is still broken, Mike. Open it without knocking. Okay, Mr. Keene, sir. Wait, the place is pitch dark, boss. There's a light under that door over there. Open the door. It's probably the bedroom. Oh, Mr. Keene, why... What are you doing here? Are you going somewhere, Miss Bentley? I see you're packing a bag. I... I was going to Philadelphia to see my sister. Your sister? Is she as much a figment of your clever imagination as your brother was? What do you mean? Mike, take a look in that suitcase. Okay, boss. Keep away from my thing. One side, lady. <laughs> so, you reformed Carl Rollins, Miss Bentley. You also murdered him. Well, you can't prove that. Oh, no? Just take a look at this, Mr. Keene. There's a false bottom in this suitcase. Why, are you... Saints preserve us. There must be a fortune in jewelry here. Yes, Mike. Bracelets, rings, and necklaces that Carl Rollins had stolen over the years, in which he was going to return to the police when Grace Bentley shot him down. Her reforming Rollins was only a device, an excuse to gain his confidence so she could get hold of those stolen gems herself. I've got to hand it to you, Keene. I never thought you suspected me. Would you like to know how you gave yourself away, Grace Bentley? Yes, how? You described George Darcy as being tall, dark, and about 30 years of age. What? He happens to be short, bald, and at least 40. You gave a false description because you didn't want me to catch him. You were afraid he confessed that he suspected you of having Carl Rollins stolen jewels. All right, it's your deal, Keene. But I'll make your proposition. I can get rid of that jewelry and collect half a million dollars in cash for it. I'll split with you 50-50. If you let me go free. That's quite a proposition. 
You must have some very good connections in the underworld. <laughs> I ought to. I spent plenty of time up the river. Then you're actually a professional jewel thief with a record, as I suspect. Look, Keen, are you making a deal or aren't you? I'm not, but you are with the district attorney. Uh, I'll kill you. You're not so fast. Go. go. Let me go before I... Nathan, she's as strong as a man, boss. If she wants to do a little wrestling, she can wrestle with these handcuffs. The handcuffs will hold her, Mike. Until we replace them with iron bars. Miss Bentley did a good job of reforming Carl Rollins. But I think his love for Andrea Mitchell had more to do with his decision to turn over a new leaf. But as far as I can see, there's only one reform for you, Grace Bentley. And that's the death sentence. <laughs> And so Mr. Keene finds the solution to the case of murder and the jewel thief. It's time now for Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. Ladies and gentlemen, Anison and Colinos present Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction in one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday at this same time, the famous old investigator takes from his file and brings to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. Tonight's case is entitled The Case of the Two-Faced Murderer. There's hardly a person who doesn't suffer now and then from the pains of a headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. That's why you'll want to know about Anison. It's a way that thousands of people are using because it acts incredibly fast to relieve such pains. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, it contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients. Literally thousands of people have been introduced to Anison by their own physicians and dentists who have given them Anison tablets at some time or other. For your own sake, when you want prompt relief from the pain of headaches, neuritis, or neuralgia, try Anison. You'll be delighted with the relief it brings. For most effective relief, use only as directed. Ask for Anison, A-N-A-C-I-N, at any drug counter. <laughs> Our scene opens in a modest suburban cottage. A young man is just crossing towards the door, a stubborn, unhappy expression on his face. Suddenly, a very beautiful young woman emerges from another room and pauses in surprise. Russell, where are you going? I'm going out, Jean. But it's nearly midnight. Never mind. I'll spend the night in a hotel. You're angry about something. Why shouldn't I be? It's bad enough to be out of a job. But when someone tells me my wife's been meeting another man behind my back... That isn't true, Russell. Isn't it? No. All right, deny it. But I've got proof. Aren't you going to give me a chance to explain? There's nothing to explain, Jean. I... What are you looking at? There was someone outside the window. What? A, a face was peering in the window just now. It... it looked like Jeffrey Tate. Well, I don't see anyone. You've got Jeffrey Tate on your mind so much, you even believe you're seeing his face wherever you go. Russell, please. I'll call you in the morning, Jean. Russell! Tate. That's all I've been hearing. Jeffrey Tate. Well, she can have him. If Jean thinks that... Who's there? Who's hiding behind... Oh. Are you crazy? Put that gun down. No! No! Don't shoot! Don't! When I heard the shots, Mr. Keith, I ran out of our cottage and found my husband, Russell, lying on our lawn. You say you'd seen a man named Jeffrey Tate peering into your window, Mrs. Owens, just before the murder? Yes, Mr. Keene. But the police haven't picked this Tate feller up yet, boss. 
My partner, Mike Clancy, read the details of your husband's murder in the morning paper, Mrs. Owen. But I haven't had a chance to go over them myself. I told the police that I saw Jeffrey Tate outside our window, Mr. Keith. And they're searching for him. But he left his home last night and they haven't been able to locate him. I see. Jeffrey must have gone out of his mind to do a thing like that. To murder my husband. And he may strike at me. I suppose if he did it, it wouldn't matter very much. Now that Russell's dead, life doesn't seem worthwhile anymore. Living must carry on for the dead, Mrs. Owens, in spite of their unhappiness. Well, at least I'll see that Jeffrey Tate gets what he deserves. That's my one ambition now, Mr. Keene, putting Russell's killer behind prison bars. And I know that you're the man who can do it. Jeffrey Tate is missing, and you're known as one of the greatest authorities on missing people in the country. And that's why I'm here, sir, to ask for your help. Is that the only reason, Mrs. Owens? What do you mean, Mr. Keene? When you describe the events preceding the murder... You said you had a quarrel with your husband. It was evidently over this man, Jeffrey Tate. That's true. Russell, my husband, thought I was seeing Jeffrey behind his back. Were you? I saw him, yes. I have nothing to hide, Mr. Keene, and I've told this to the police. I was seeing Jeffrey Tate because my husband was out of a job, and Jeffrey's engineering firm has a wonderful opening for him. Go on, Mrs. Owens. I knew Jeffrey years ago, but... I believe he was in love with me once. Russell knew that. That's why he was so jealous. Mm. And you believe Jeffrey Tate might have killed your husband because of unrequited love? I don't know, but I saw him there at the window, Mr. Keene. Isn't that enough evidence? Not quite. A murderer would hardly let himself be spotted so easily just before he commits a crime. No, there's something odd in the circumstances. Tell me, is uh, Jeffrey Tate still a bachelor? No, he's been married for years. Well, Mrs. Owens, suppose I investigated this case and found out that Tate wasn't actually guilty of murdering your husband. But who else could have done it, Mr. Keene? Everyone is a suspect in a murder case. That is, everyone who may have had a motive. Even you could be considered a suspect by the police. What? If I take this case, Mrs. Owens, I promise you I'll find the actual killer. No matter who he or she may be. Mr. Keene, just find my husband's murderer and give me a chance to say in my heart that I did everything I could to see that justice was done. Very well, Mrs. Owens, I have your address. And you'll hear from me after I have a chance to go over the details with the police. Thank you, Mr. Keene. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, Mr. Clancy. So long, ma'am. Goodbye, Mrs. Owens. She's a very beautiful young woman, isn't she, Mike? Well, sure, and a girl with looks like that can start trouble pretty easily, Mr. Keene. Well, how do you mean? Oh, this business has seen another man outside of her window. Just before her husband was shot. Well, it's just her word against the other man's, that's all. Maybe she didn't see anyone at all. Just followed her husband out the door with a gun in her hand. And the motive for killing her husband? Well, maybe we'll find that out when we find out if her husband left any money. Well, Mike, in my opinion... Uh... Oh, I'd get it, boss. Mr. Keene's office. Is this Mr. Keene speaking? Oh, this is his partner, Mike Clancy. May I talk to Mr. Keene, please? Well, uh, who's calling, mister? Tell him it's... It's Jeffrey Tate. Hold on a second. Mr. Keene, it's Jeffrey Tate. Who? Oh. It's the fellow the police are looking for for the Russell Owens murder. Well, let me have the phone, Mike. Hello? Mr. Keene? Yes. This is Jeffrey Tate speaking. I've... Just returned to my home, and my wife has informed me that I'm wanted for murder. I'm sure the police want to question you, Mr. Tate. Mr. Keene, I didn't kill Russell Owens, and I'm not afraid to give myself up. Before I do, however, I'd like to talk to you and ask your help. Are you at home now? Yes, I'm here with my wife. My address is 11 North Adams Street. Well, my partner and I will drive up immediately. Please don't inform the police until I've had a chance to talk to you, Mr. Keene. That's all I ask. Very well, Mr. Tate. Since you're doing this voluntarily, I'll keep it confidential for a little while longer. I'll be waiting for you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Get the car, Mike. We're driving to Jeffrey Tate's home immediately. That phone call may put an entirely different aspect on the Owens murder case. <laughs> Yes? 
My name is Keene. This is my partner, Mike Clancy. I'm here in answer to Mr. Tate's phone call. My husband isn't here, Mr. Keene. You're Mrs. Tate? Yes. But he just phoned our office, ma'am, and said he wanted to give himself up. I know that, Mr. Clancy. However, I persuaded him to go away. May we come in, Mrs. Tate? If you wish. However, you won't find Jeffrey here. Who is that man standing in the living room? His name is Frederick Barlow. Oh. But he has nothing to do with this matter. He and my husband are old friends. Now you say Mr. Tate went away? He was crazy to phone you, Mr. Keene. He wouldn't have a chance if he gave himself up. And I'm not going to stand by and see my own husband, the man I love, falsely accused of murder. Try not to get excited, Barbara. Mr. Keene is only trying to do his duty. You're Mr. Barlow? Yes. I'm sorry to meet you under these circumstances, Mr. Keene. I know of your reputation. I've been wanting to make your acquaintance for years. Mike. Uh, yes, boss. Search the house thoroughly. Okay, Mr. Keene. He can search it from top to bottom, but he won't find my husband. Do you realize, Mrs. Tate, how difficult that will make matters for your husband? What do you know? And I would have helped him do it. Now, as a fugitive from justice, he's become even more of a suspect. I don't care, Mr. Keene. I only want to make certain Jeffrey is safe. Barbara, I think you're being very foolish. Please keep out of this, Frederick. Mr. Barlow, were you here when Mr. Tate left the house? Now, wait a minute, Mr. Keene. I had nothing to do with it. Please answer my question. Yes, I was here. Then you know where Jeffrey Tate has gone. Why, uh... Frederick, I... if you tell Mr. Keene, you'll regret it. I'll never speak to you again as long as I live. And Jeffrey will hate you for it. I don't think he'll hate me, Barbara. Jeffrey's not that kind of man. He left here against his will because you started to get hysterical. You know I didn't agree with you, and I thought Jeff should place his faith in Mr. Keene's ability to find the real murderer. Tell Mr. Keene, then. Tell him where Jeffrey went. Go on. Give your best friend away to the police. I have no intention of doing that, Barbara, I assure you. Perhaps the police may compel you to do it, Mr. Barlow. In that case, I'd have no choice, Mr. Keene. However, right now, I know nothing of Jeff Tate's whereabouts, officially. Good night, Barbara. May I have your permission to leave, Mr. Keene? I can't hold you, but I'll have to report your part in all this to the police. As you wish, Mr. Keene. Well, Mrs. Tate, are you going to be reasonable and give me a chance to find out whether your husband is innocent or not? No, Mr. Keene. You can stay here until morning if you like, but you won't get any further information out of me. Mr. Keene, sir? Yes, Mike? Come in here for a second, sir. I found something important. What is it, Mike? Well, it's here in the study, Mr. Keene. But first, take a look at that picture on the mantelpiece. Signed to Barbara with all my love, Jeffrey. Well, that must be a photograph of Jeffrey Tate. Now come over to the desk. Look at this mask. Hmm. Where did you find the mask, Mike? Inside the desk, boss. And it looks as if it's made of some kind of plaster. And it's the image of that fellow there in the picture. Well, you're right, Mike. It is a life-size plaster likeness of Jeffrey Tate's face. It's hollow in the inside. And the signature of the sculptor appears to have been cut into the inside. I can read the name Dario. Well, what do you make of it, Mr. Keene? Well, Jean Owens claims just before her husband was murdered, she saw a glimpse of Jeffrey Tate's face outside her window. It was almost midnight, and the light was probably bad. Well, sure, and maybe... Someone else could have been wearing this mask so as to look like Jeffrey Tate and make him take the blame for the killing. It's an interesting theory, Mike. It's certainly worth looking into. Apparently, this case has taken a strange new twist. If the theory concerning this mask is correct, we're actually looking for a two-faced murderer. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to Mr. Keene and the case of the two-faced murderer. Meanwhile, stop tooth decay and unpleasing breath. Yes, stop tooth decay and unpleasing breath that breeds between the teeth. Use Colonel's toothpaste with dental floss action. Your dentist will tell you, brush your teeth after meals to stop decay. Clean those cracks and crevices deep between your teeth to guard against unpleasing breath. Now, Colonos gives you dental floss action. That is, sends thousands of active cleansing bubbles to help dislodge bits of food that can cause unpleasing breath. What's more, foamy, refreshing colonos brightens teeth by removing ordinary yellow surface stains. Helps stop tooth decay. 
Get Colonos toothpaste with dental floss action today. Now back to Mr. Keene and the case of the two-faced murderer. Mr. Keene, the eminent investigator, and his partner, Mike Clancy, are investigating the strange murder of Russell Owens, who was shot to death just outside his suburban cottage. Among the suspects is a man named Jeffrey Tate, who has disappeared, hiding somewhere at his wife Barbara's insistence. But now, Mr. Keene and Mike have found another clue to the murder in the Tate house. And as Mr. Kane confronts Barbara Tate with the evidence... Mrs. Tate, have you ever seen this plaster mask before? Oh, Mr. Keene, where did you get that? My partner, Mike Clancy, found it in your husband's desk in the study. According to the photograph of your husband, this mask is a perfect likeness of him. Why, I... I haven't seen that mask in years. I thought it was lost. If you really want to help your husband prove his innocence, Mrs. Tate, better you tell us the truth. Mike is right. This mask may be an important clue that might absolve Jeffrey Tate from a charge of murder. How do you mean, Mr. Keene? Well, someone may have used this mask to impersonate your husband. What? Russell Owens was shot late at night. And just before the murder, his wife thought she saw your husband's face peering in through the window. You mean some other man could have worn that mask, trying to place the blame for the murder on my husband? Perhaps, Mrs. Tate. But I'm not fully convinced that's the entire truth. But it's something to work on. Oh, Mr. Keene, I'd do anything to prove that Jeffrey is innocent. But I... I don't know much about that mask. Jeffrey had it when we were married. Do you know where he got it? Yes, I do. Jean Owens gave it to him. Jean Owens, the murdered man's wife? Yes, Mr. Keene. She and my husband knew each other before I met Jeffrey. So she told me. She also said that she quarreled with her husband, Russell, because of Jeffrey. Russell Owens thought she was seeing your husband on the slide. My husband's always been faithful to me, Mr. Keene. Jean Owens may have chased well, according him, but... to Jean Owens, she only saw your husband so as to get a job for Russell in your husband's engineering firm. Mrs. Tate, uh, the signature of the sculptor who called himself Dario is inscribed on this mask. Have you ever heard the name before? No, Mr. King. Now, for the last time, Mrs. Tate, will you tell me where your husband has gone? I don't know. Oh, she's hedging again, boss. No, that's the truth, Mr. Clancy. Oh, I admit I begged Jeffrey to leave the house before you came and persuaded him not to give himself up. But I, I honestly don't know where he went. And I may never see him again, either. Well, will you promise to get in touch with me if you do hear from him? You... You really meant it, Mr. Keene, when you said you'd help him? Yes. If I'm convinced he's innocent of murdering Russell Owens. Very well. I'll do as you ask. All right, Mike, let's get started. Where to, boss? We're going over to the Owens cottage, the scene of the murder. And ask Jean Owens where she obtained this mask before she gave it to Jeffrey Tate. This must be the Owens house, Mike Park over here in front of the door Right, sir Mr. Keene There's another car parked in the driveway Yes, yeah, so I noticed, Mike the house door's open, boss. Look. Well, come along, Mike. I've got a feeling we're running into more trouble. Inside, Mike. This way. Saints preserve us, Mr. Keene. There's a woman's body on the floor. Mike. It's Jean Owens. Oh, she's dead, boss. She's been strangled. Yes. And look at her throat. It's all discolored. But not from the effects of the strangulation. This looks like some kind of play or putty on her neck. Mr. Keene, stand where you are, mister. You don't need that gun. I'm, I'm not armed. Boss, this fellow looks like that picture of Jeffrey Tate we saw in his house. I believe it is, Mr. Tate. Yes, I'm Jeffrey Tate. I, I was just about to phone for the police when I heard you come in. Sure, that's a good story, all right. You've got two victims to your list now, mister. And I'm not letting you add a third. Just a moment with those handcuffs, Mike. Mr. Tate, have you any explanation for being found here with Jean Owens' body? Oh, I, I came into the house just before you did, Mr. Keene, and, and found her on the floor. Why did you come here? 
I wanted to ask Jean why she was so certain that I was the man she saw outside her window just before her husband was murdered. And why did you leave your home after phoning me? Barbara, my wife, insisted that I go. But I was going to give myself up after I talked to Jean Owens and, and tried to find out why she implicated me in her husband's murder. No. Oh, where were you on the night of the murder, Mr. Tate? Why couldn't you be located by the police? I was in my office, Mr. Keene, working. I, I worked so late that I slept there on the couch all night. Can you prove that with a witness? No, I, I was all alone. Well, tell me something, Mr. Tate. Were you in love with Jean Owens at any time? Years ago, I might have been, but not anymore. However, your wife could be jealous of Mrs. Owens, even now. You can't implicate Barbara, Mr. Keene. She's completely innocent. That remains to be seen. Mike? Yes, boss. Show Mr. Tate the mask we found in his study. Well, it's wrapped in this paper here. Here. Here it is. Do you recognize that mask, Mr. Tate? Why? Oh, yes. Jean Owens gave that to me before I was married. Where did she get it? Why, I don't know. She gave it to me when I admired it in her home. Someone had made it from a picture Jean had of me. It seems to me this fella can't explain very much, Mr. Keene. I'm for taking him down to police headquarters. Well, Mike, one hour more or less won't make any difference. You'd better call the police and tell them we just found Jean Owen's body. Then ask them to send a detail of men to Mr. Tate's home in an hour. I may have important evidence for them. Go right in, Mr. Keene and Mr. Clancy. Thank you. If your wife is here, Mr. Tate, I'd like to talk to her. Oh, my, my wife must be upstairs. I'd better... Boss, it's that fellow Frederick Barlow. So I see, Mike. Jeffrey. Hello, Frederick. Mr. Keene, I see you've managed to locate Jeffrey Tate without anyone else's help. Yes. Right now, he's under suspicion for two murders, Mr. Barlow. Two murders? Jean Owens was strangled to death. No. I didn't kill her, Fred. I swear I didn't. I, I, I must see my wife. I must speak to her, Mr. Keene. Your wife's upstairs. Mr. Keene, do you want me to call her? Please do, Mr. Barlow. Just a moment. Mr. Keene, it, it doesn't look as if there's a chance for me to prove my innocence. The evidence against you is very strong, Mr. Tate. I, I can't understand it. It's like some kind of an insane dream. Mike, give me the mask you wrapped in that paper, please. Here. Here you are, boss. Mr. Keene, I, I just thought of something. What is it, Mr. Tate? Suppose someone used that mask to impersonate me. Sure, and the boss thought of that long ago. There's only one thing wrong with that theory, Mr. Tate. How did the killer get hold of the mask and then return it to your home? Why, I don't know. Unless your wife was implicated in the crime. She is the only one who could have used this mask. Then why not arrest me, Mr. Keene, and set my husband free? Barbara. Jeffrey, darling, Mr. I... Tate, are you confessing to these murders? I'm showing you that all the evidence isn't against my husband, Mr. Keene. Barbara, keep out of this, please. Well, Mrs. Tate, where is Mr. Barlow? Well, I saw him a moment ago when he called me. He came down the stairs. He must have gone into the study. Mike, stay here with Mr. and Mrs. Tate for a moment. Okay, Mr. Keene. Mr. Barlow. Oh, uh, Mr. Keene. Were you looking for something here in Jeffrey Tate's study? Just uh, a match. Well, there's a lighter on top of the desk. Why bother to look inside the drawers? Oh, uh, I didn't see it. Well, I'm ready to take Mr. and Mrs. Tate to police headquarters. Mrs. Tate, too? Yes, they're both implicated in these murders, I'm afraid. Well, uh... In that case, Mr. Keene, they should have the services of a competent attorney. Yes, that's their privilege. As a friend of the family, I'm going to see to it that they get one. Uh, Dario? Uh, what is it, Mr. Oh, so you answer to the name of Dario, do you? I... I didn't quite hear what you said. Perhaps this mask is your handiwork. By any chance, were you looking for it in that desk when you said you were looking for a match? I never saw that mask before, Mr. Keene. No? May I look at your hands for a moment, Mr. Barlow? What for? Just curiosity. My hands are... Uh, very artistic hands, like a sculptor or a painter might have. And I'd say you were a sculptor, Mr. Barlow. Would you? Particularly since there seems to be clay underneath your fingernails and 
clay-colored powder on your fingers. What are you driving at, Keene? You murdered Gene Owens, Barlow. You're crazy. You can't deny it. The evidence is there on your fingers. The police will match the clay under your fingernails with the clay marks you left on Mrs. Owens' throat. That's very interesting. And if you murdered Jean Owen, she also murdered her husband. How? I, I suppose I put this mask over my face and impersonated Jeffrey Taylor. Eh? No, if you'd used this mask, you would have destroyed it. As a matter of fact, I believe you murdered Jean Owens because of this mask. You were the man who gave it to her years ago. And you knew she would identify you as a sculptor, something you wanted to avoid. So you went to her home, made her tell you what she did with the mask... Then killed her to keep her quiet. That's a clever deduction, Mr. Keene. You came back here after Jean Owens told you she'd given the mask to Jeffrey Tate. You hoped you'd be able to find it before the police did. And why would I be so anxious to get hold of this mask, Keene? Well, this is only a theory, but I think it can be proven. A clever sculptor can change a face and features with the aid of clay and paint. And if you could make a mask that resembled Jeffrey Tate so closely... You could also change your own features to resemble his. And that's what you did. Don't move or I'll kill you, Keene. Well, that gun won't help you, Barlow. When the police search your apartment, I'm sure they'll find evidence that you are or once were a sculptor. You're right. I was a sculptor and a great one, too. But no one ever appreciated me. No one knew what a genius I was. It rankled in your mind, didn't it, Barlow? I could have taken it if Jean hadn't turned me down for that idiot Russell Owens. So you too were in love with Jean. At first I thought my rival was Jeffrey Tate, but then I found out it was Russell Owens. Tate took it like a man. But you let it eat inside your soul until it drove you to murder. I'm going out that terrace door, Keen. And if you try to stop me, I'll shoot. <laughs> you see, Keen, I'm still the genius. Even you can't put your hands on me now. No, but I can. Well, you... A minute, Mike, I thought he was getting away. Well, after you went into the study, Mr. Keen, I started to put two and two together like you did. And I figured I'd better keep an eye on both of you. Oh, Barlow's coming out of it, Mike. Oh, I just gave him a light tap with my gun, Mr. Keene. Just to keep him quiet when he tried to drill a hole in me. It's a strange case, Mike. By making himself up to look like Jeffrey Tate, Barlow almost had a double revenge. Tate was a rival of his, too. And he thought Tate would be held for Russell Owens' murder. Appearing at the window so Gene Owens could see him was deliberate and part of his plan. Well, boss, his makeup days are over. Yes, Mike. I think we can now turn the killer with two faces over to the police. And so Mr. Keene finds the solution to the case of the two-faced murderer. The next time you're suffering from the pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, try Anacin. You'll bless the day you heard of this incredibly fast way to relieve these pains. Now, the reason Anacin is so wonderfully fast-acting and effective is this. Anacin is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anacin contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing Anacin tablets from their own dentist or physician and in this way have discovered the incredibly fast relief Anison brings from pain of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. So next time such pains strike, take Anison. For most effective relief, use only as directed. Your druggist has Anison in handy boxes of 12 and 30 and economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100. The name is Anison. A-N-A-C-I-N. <laughs> Tracer of Lost Persons is based on the novel Mr. Keene. The radio sequel is originated and produced by Frank and Ann Hummert. Dialogue by Lawrence Clee. Bennett Kilpack plays Mr. Keene. It is on the air every Thursday at this time. All characters are completely fictional and bear no relation to any person living or dead. Don't miss Mr. Keene next Thursday when the kindly old Tracer turns to the tea leaf murder case. It's time now for Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. (laughs) 
Ladies and gentlemen, Anison and Kalinos present Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. One of the most famous characters of American fiction in one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday at the same time, the famous old investigator takes from his file and brings to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. Tonight's case is entitled, The Case of the Melody of Murder. If you suffer from the pains of a headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, try Anison. You'll be amazed at what it does. Many people who have taken it will tell you, I'm quite sure, that its effectiveness and incredibly fast action are simply astounding. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, it contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients. Many people listening to me now have at some time or other had an envelope containing Anison tablets given them either by their dentist or physician. These people know it gives incredibly fast relief. So if you want really fast relief from headache, neuritis, or neuralgia pain, try Anison. For most effective relief, use only as directed. It is spelled A-N-A-C-I-N, and you can get it at any drug counter. Now for Mr. Keene and the case of the melody of murder. Our scene opens in a midtown apartment which is occupied at the moment by two people. One of them, a very attractive young girl, is standing at the piano listening to her companion who's playing for her. But as she watches the expert fingers slide lightly over the keys, she doesn't realize that those same fingers will very shortly become an instrument of horror. lovely piece you're playing. One of my favorites. I was thinking of including it in my debut recital next week. Please, why did you change? I wanted to hear you play the rest of it. Why? Why, what's the matter? You... Oh, no. No, don't look at me that way, please. I... Take your hands off my throat. I get... You're strangling me. Help! It's 9.30, Mr. Clancy, and Mr. Keene isn't here yet. Well, Mr. Keene should be in his office any minute now, young fella. Take it easy. You say you're his partner, Mr. Clancy? That's right. Well, then maybe you can help me. I can't wait any longer. I... Oh. Here's Mr. Keene now. Good morning, Mike. Sorry I'm late. Good morning, boss. Good thing you weren't any later. This young fellow's been jumping out of his skin waiting for you. You want to see me, young man? Yes, Mr. Keene. My name is Harper. Alan Harper. I... I've come here to ask you to help me find a murderer. Well, sit down, Alan, and try to relax. Relax? How can I relax when my own sister was killed? Strangled to death by a maniac. When did this happen? Three days ago. Well, it must have been when we were on that case in Chicago, Mr. Keene. Oh, yes, Mike. That's why we didn't read about it. Yes. Yes, it happened in my sister's apartment, Mr. Keene, here in New York. Imogene had just returned from Europe. I hadn't even seen her yet when the police got in touch with me and said they'd found her body. There were no clues? No trace of the murderer? No, sir. Her body was found lying in front of the piano. That's all. Mr. Keene... Ever since the death of our parents, Imogene and I have been as close as two people could be. We forgot our animosity in the past and... Animosity? You mean you and your sister disliked each other at one time? Well, it was childhood jealousy on my part, that was all. Imogene had always been talented and favored, I guess, by our parents. She played the piano magnificently and she'd been studying in Europe for the past eight months. I... I have no talent for music or anything else. Go on, Alan. Tell me the rest. Well, that's all there is to tell. She returned to New York to make her debut as a concert pianist. And she was murdered. I want you to know, Mr. Keene, that in spite of the jealousy I once felt towards my sister, I loved her more than anyone else in the world. If you'll help me find her murderer, sir, I'll be grateful to you for the rest of my life. I intend to help you, Alan. But I need more information. Now, what about your sister's friends and acquaintances? Do you know of anyone who may have hated her enough to murder her? No, Mr. Keene. 
Imogene had very few friends. She devoted her life to her music. I have no idea whom she met in Europe, except Lawrence Driscoll. And who is Lawrence Driscoll? He's a concert manager, discoverer of talent. He met Imogene in Paris and returned to New York with her to arrange for her debut. I see. Uh, do you want me to give you Lawrence Driscoll's address, Mr. Keene? He has an office and studio on 57th Street. Yes, put it down on this uh, piece of paper, Alan. Very well, sir. I'm sure that Mr. Driscoll can tell you about the people my sister knew while she was in Europe. You've talked to him, of course. Just once. The police headquarters when we were both questioned about the murder. Oh, uh, put down your own address under Mr. Driscoll's, Alan. All right, sir. I don't live anywhere near Imogene's apartment. My job doesn't pay very much and I can't afford it. But your sister could, hmm? Well... Imogene and I were both left some money by our folks. I'm afraid I spent mine a little foolishly while she invested hers wisely. I see. That's just about all I have to tell you, Mr. Keene. Except this. If you ever find the man who murdered Imogene, you'd better turn him into the police before I lay my hands on him. We'll let the law take care of the punishment, Alan. And you'll hear from me when I have some word. I'll be waiting, sir. Goodbye, Mr. Keene. Mr. Clancy. Goodbye, Alan. So long, young fella. Well, Alan Harper's a very emotional young man, Mike. Oh, I'd say he is. And as he was talking, boss, I began to think of how many times jealousy was the cause of murder. Yes, I was thinking the same thing, Mike. And how jealous he had been of his sister's musical talents. However, we better get started. I have a feeling we have a lot of ground to cover. Well, what's our first move, sir? We'll pay a visit to Mr. Lawrence Driscoll and see what he knows about the murdered girl and her recent contacts. Come in. What can I do for you, gentlemen? Are you Mr. Driscoll? Yes. My name is Keene. This is my partner, Mike Clancy. Mr. Keene, the famous investigator. I imagine you can guess why we've come to your studio. Sit down, gentlemen, please. You've come to question me about poor Imogene Harper, is that right? Yes, Mr. Driscoll. Well, I'm afraid I can only repeat what I told the police. It was a horrible crime. But I have no inkling of why or by whom it was committed. Oh, perhaps I'd better shut the door to my studio. Professor Graff is in there at the piano. Professor was just as shocked as I was with the news of Imogene's murder, Mr. Keene. Oh, he knew her? I engaged Professor Graff to give Imogene her final instructions before her debut as a concert pianist. Mm. He's a famous piano teacher, and he's played in concerts himself throughout Europe. He's been working for me since my return from Europe. Mike, while I'm talking to Mr. Driscoll, would you go inside and ask Professor Graff to step in here, please? Sure thing, Mr. Keene. Uh, when did you meet Imogene Harper, Mr. Driscoll? About two or three months ago, Mr. Keene, in Paris. Excuse me, Professor. Yes? Mr. Keene would like to see you in Mr. Driscoll's office. Mr. Keene? Well, I'm his partner, Mike Clancy. We're investigating the murder of Imogene Harper. No, I know nothing about it. Please, I've already seen the police. Well, there's nothing to get excited about, Professor. Mr. Keene just... Take your hand from my arm. I'm tired of being hounded. What do you think I am, a suspect in this murder? Nobody's accused you of being a suspect, Professor. I, uh, I have an appointment with a pupil, if you'll excuse me. Well, the appointment can wait, mister. This is a murder case. I told you I know nothing. Now leave me alone. Hey, there. Wait. What's going on, Mike? Well, Professor Graff walked out that other door there, Mr. Keene. He wouldn't come in and talk to you. The professor's a very temperamental man, Mr. Clancy. Are you sure you didn't anger him? If you ask me, Mr. Driscoll, that fellow's trying to hide something from us. If he is, you can find out very easily. I can give you his home address. I'd appreciate that, Mr. Driscoll. I'll jot it down in my office. Saints preserve us, Mr. Keene, but that professor acted like I was about to push him into the electric chair. Maybe that's exactly what he's afraid of, Mike. At any rate, we'll see very shortly. <laughs> Here's Professor Graff's apartment, Mr. Keene. His name's on the door. Ring the bell, Mike. It's possible he may still be out instructing one of his piano pupils. 
Yes? Is Professor Graff at home? Uh, not yet. Was he expecting you? My name is Keene. This is Mr. Clancy. It's important for us to see him. Well, he should be home any minute now. I'm his wife. Uh, please come in. Well, thank you, Mrs. Graff. You... You say your business is important, Mr. Keene. Very. But I... What are you doing, Mr. Clancy? Oh, just admiring these pictures on the wall. And looking things over. Oh, yes. Well, those pictures were taken years ago when I was a star in Grand Opera. You were an opera singer, Mrs. Graff? Yes, Mr. Keene. I sang all over the world. London, Paris, stop. Oh, I do wish Mr. Clancy wouldn't go through those things on the table. My husband doesn't like his music to be disturbed. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm just a curious feller, I guess. Yes, well, I, I think I'd better get back to the kitchen. Make yourselves at home. My husband will be here very shortly. We'll wait for him. Sure, in this studio of Professor Graff's is a queer place, Mr. Keene. Look at all them peculiar-looking masks on the walls. Mm, really, the Graffs collect them as a hobby. Well, I'd like to have a look at the rest of the flat, just to see what it... Luella. Luella. What are you doing here? Professor Graff? Well? I'm Mr. Keene. I believe you've met my partner, Mike Clancy. Since you seemed averse to talking to me in Mr. Driscoll's office... I thought we'd come to your home instead. I know nothing about Imogene Harper. She was my pupil for only a few days. There's nothing I can do to help you find her murderer. John! Luella! You mean Imogene Harper is dead? You didn't read about it in the newspapers, Mrs. Graff? Oh, well, I... I seldom read the papers shut up inside this studio all day long, but my husband, John, never told me that... Be quiet, Luella. What are you holding in your hand? Oh, just this, this jar of preserves. I... Couldn't open it. Well, here, let me have it, Mrs. Graff. I'll open the jar for you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Clancy. It's it, it stuck all right. I I can't seem to budge it. I... Let uh, Professor Graff try, Mike. What nonsense is this with a jar of preserves? Oh, please, I want all of you to leave. Now, I have to practice the piano, and I demand absolute quiet. But, John... Oh, give me that jar, Luella. There. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll get to my studio. I've already told the police everything I know about Imogene Harper's murder. Well, we'll be on our way, Mrs. Graff. Mr. Keene, I... Oh, I'm sorry my husband was so short for you. He's a very nervous man. You've got to make allowances. Oh, I assure you, Mrs. Graff, that I do. Good day. Uh, good day, Mr. Keene. Mr. Clancy. So long. Mike, that preserved jar was hard to open, wasn't it? With faith, and I couldn't budge it, Mr. Keene. Yet. You're a very strong man. A great deal stronger than Professor Graff, I should judge, except in the fingers. The fingers? A pianist often develops very strong fingers, Mike. And if you remember, Imogene Harper was strangled to death. Oh, you're right, boss. Do you think that... Boss, that must be Professor Graff playing the piano. Yes, Mike. I think in searching for Imogene Harper's murderer... We're up against a dangerous maniac who'd stop at nothing to protect himself. But who that maniac is still remains to be seen. In just a moment, we'll return to Mr. Keene and the case of the malady of murder. Meanwhile... Before you buy any cold remedy, know the facts about the preferred antihistamine wonder drug. Listen to this. Krypton, K-R-I-P-T-I-N, Krypton is the formula preferred by patients over all other antihistamines in the famous Naval Hospital test at Great Lakes, Illinois. Taken at the first sign of a cold, Krypton can stop a cold, not in days, but in hours. Yes, Krypton stops a cold the way no aspirin, quinine, or chest rub could ever do. Recommended by thousands of doctors. Effective for children. No wonder the medical world is excited. No wonder millions who have suffered from colds every year hail a sensational development. For the most spectacular results, take Krypton at the very first sneeze or sniffle. Today at your druggist, get Krypton tablets. Big economy size bottle is a wonderful bargain. Fifty tablets, only 98 cents. The handy packet size, ten tablets, only 29 cents. Get Krypton tablets today. Now back to Mr. Keene and the case of the melody of murder. 
Mr. Keene, the great investigator, and his partner, Mike Clancy, are investigating the murder of pretty Imogene Harper, a young prodigy of the piano who was strangled to death in her apartment. Among the suspects Mr. Keene has under surveillance is Professor John Graff, who was instructing Imogene before her forthcoming piano recital. Now Mr. Keene and Mike have returned to their office, where they find Alan Harper, the victim's brother, awaiting them. Mr. Keene, Mr. Keene, I've been waiting here outside your office for you. Oh, we've been busy, Alan, working in your sister's murder. Oh, would you please unlock the office door, Mike? Uh, yes, sir. Come in, Alan. Have you discovered any clues yet, sir? I believe we're progressing. However, judging by your nervousness, I'd say that you yourself just discovered something new. I have, Mr. Keene. After I left your office, I spoke to my sister's lawyer and found out Imogene had withdrawn all her money from the bank two days before she was murdered. Well, sure, and that looks like the beginning of a motive for murder. How much did she withdraw from the bank, Alan? $45,000 in cash and some security. $45,000, eh? There wasn't even enough left to pay Imogene's funeral expenses. The lawyer gave me this watch, the only possession of value my sister had left. Let me see that watch, Alan. Oh, here you are, sir. It was given to Imogene by our mother years ago. I believe it's worth two or three hundred dollars. Hmm. How did your attorney get possession of this watch? Oh, the police gave it to him, Mr. Keene. Imogene was wearing it when she was murdered. The glass is cracked, boss. Yes, Mike, and the watch seems to have stopped. It may have been broken when the girl fell to the floor at the time of the murder. Hmm. Here you are, Alan. You found no other clues at all, Mr. Keene? It's too early yet to say. Well, then, I won't take up any more of your time, sir. I'll be at home in case you want to reach me. Oh. oh, sorry, excuse me. There's someone here to see you, Mr. Keene. Oh, come in, Mrs. Graff. You'll hear from me, Alan. Very well, sir. Goodbye. Mr. Keene, may I see you alone, please? In regard to what, Mrs. Graff? My husband, Professor Graff. Anything you want to say can be said in front of my partner, Mike Clancy. I know I shouldn't have come here, Mr. Keene, but my conscience wouldn't let me rest. If my husband is the Antwerp Strangler, I've got to know and prevent someone else from becoming a victim. The Antwerp Strangler? Sans preserve us. What's that? Within the last six months, Mr. Clancy, two young women were murdered in Europe, in Antwerp, Belgium, both by strangulation, and the killer was never found. Yes, I remember those cases, Mrs. Graff. But uh, what do they have to do with your husband? He... He spent seven months in Belgium. And he only returned to the United States a week ago. Just about the time Imogene Harper returned. I... I wouldn't have become suspicious of my husband, Mr. Keene, if... Oh, if it hadn't been for the way he acted when you came to the house. And then, when Mr. Driscoll told me about the Antwerp Strangler... I... Lawrence Driscoll, the concert manager, told you about it? Yes, he read about it while he was in Europe. He came to our house soon after you left to talk to my husband. John behaved queerly again and stormed out of the house. That's when Mr. Driscoll remembered about the Antwerp Strangler. Mrs. Graff, do you realize you may be placing your husband in a very suspicious light? Yes, I do, Mr. Keene. And it doesn't make you unhappy? I gave up my opera career for John. All our married life I've slaved for him, and he hasn't appreciated it. He only thinks of himself and his piano playing. But I'm going to protect myself now. And if he's the man you're looking for, for Imogene Harper's murder, I... Oh, excuse me. Hello? Mr. Keene. Yes? This is Lawrence Driscoll. I'm in Imogene Harper's apartment, 7 West Avenue. Can you come down here right away? What's happened, Mr. Driscoll? I think I can show you where to find Imogene Harper's murderer. No. No. Get your hands off my throat. Mr. Driscoll. Stop it. Stop. Mr. Driscoll. 7 West Avenue, Mike, and hurry. A man's life may be at stake. This is it, boss. Well, the door is locked. Break it down, Mike. Wait, I'll let you in. Mr. Keene. Are you all right, Mr. Driscoll? Yes, I, I had a narrow escape, but I was able to fight him off. Who? Professor Graff. He's tied up in the next room. Bring him in, Mike. Right, sir. Tell me exactly what happened, Mr. Driscoll. Well, I went over to see Professor Graff this afternoon. I wanted to find out why he'd behaved so queerly when you tried to talk to him. 
He started to shout at me and ran out. It was then that I thought of a killer known as the Antwerp Strangler. Yes, yes, I've heard about him. Well, then something else occurred to me, Mr. Keene. An appointment Professor Graff had with Imogene Harper on the day she was murdered. She'd phoned me around six that afternoon and said she was taking her last series of piano lessons from him. Go on, Mr. Driscoll. Well, a little while ago, I, I came here to Imogene's apartment to check on it. I found the proof I was looking for. Oh? In her appointment book, she has a notation saying that she had a music lesson with Professor Graff at 6.30 that evening. Uh, the book is right here, Mr. Keene. Hmm. In other words, that place is Graff in the apartment around the time of the murder. That's my guess. As I was phoning you a few minutes ago, Professor Graff walked in and attacked me. I managed to get away from him and knocked him out. Then I tied him up and waited for you, Mr. Keene. Here he is, boss. Professor Graff, did you attempt to attack Mr. Driscoll a little while ago? He drove me to it. He called me a murderer. When was this? When he came to my house before. Then you followed me here to Imogene Harper's apartment and tried to add me to your list of victims. I didn't kill her. Why can't people leave me alone? Why do they have to hound me all the time? According to this appointment book, Professor Graff, you were with Imogene Harper at the time of her death. I didn't keep that appointment. I swear I didn't. All right, Mike. Take Professor Graff away. He can tell his story to the police. No, no, please believe me. I didn't kill her. I'm innocent. You'll have your chance to prove that to a judge and jury. Well, I'm glad that's over, Mr. Keene. Are you, Mr. Driscoll? You have no idea what a blow it was to me when Imogene was murdered. She was not only my friend, she had great talent. Yes. Do you play the piano, Mr. Driscoll? Why, yes. I was pretty good at one time, too, Mr. Keene. I noticed your fingers were long and your hands looked strong. Please play something, won't you? Oh, well, I'm not as good as Professor Graff or Imogene, but, uh... <clears throat> Listen, Mr. Keene. <laughs> Mr. Driscoll, at what time did you say you last spoke to Imogene Harper? Six o'clock, on the night she was murdered. You're sure of that? Oh, positive. Odd. Odd. How do you mean, Mr. Keene? Her wristwatch was broken when she struggled with her attacker, and it stopped at five o'clock. Imogene Harper wasn't alive at six that night. I could have made a mistake. You made several of them, Mr. Driscoll. Even though your plan was well executed. Plan? Your plan... What plan, Mr. Keene? To murder Imogene Harper and place the blame on Professor Graff. Because that's exactly what you did. Only you slipped up on the time. And that will cost you your life in the electric chair. You must be joking, Mr. Keene. You picked a time when you knew Professor Graff had an appointment with Imogene. And you strangled her before that. Afterward, you put a strong suspicion into his wife's mind that he was the Antwerp Strangler. And then, as a final touch, you goaded Professor Graff into attacking you to tie him up with a murder completely. And do you think you can prove all that, Mr. Keene? Yes. After I prove what your motive was. Frisco, I'm going to check every bank account you've ever had. Imogene Harper withdrew $45,000 from her bank just before you murdered her. If I find that amount, and I think I will, deposited in your name recently, that's all the proof I need, Driscoll. Yes. You'll find that money. You're right, Keene. I am the Antwerp Strangler, and this is my melody of murder. I killed Imogene. And the other girls, too. The fools. They all wanted to be great pianists. Geniuses. I told them that getting started in a concert career was expensive. And I took their money, then I put them out of their misery. But Imogene could have saved herself. I wanted her for my wife, and she refused. She could have saved herself. Only temporarily, Driscoll. Because your insane, twisted mind would have turned against her sooner or later. <laughs> you said my hands are strong. Well, I'm going to give you a chance to find out how strong they really are. I'm going to strangle you, Keen. You, you insane! <laughs> I'm going to kill you, kill you, kill you. Are you all right, Mister Keen, sir? Yes. A few moments later, Mike and I'd have been finished. 
Driscoll tried to strangle me. Well, when I heard that piano as I was going downstairs, I thought something was wrong, so I come back, sir. That's why I asked Driscoll to play, Mike. I was hoping it would bring you back. Where is Professor Graf? Well, I handcuffed him to the banister in the hall, sir. Release him at once, Mike. The real Antwerp strangler is lying at our feet, Lawrence Driscoll. Your bullets, Mike, saved the state of trial as well as saving my life. And I think we can inform the police that the mystery of Imogene Harper's murder has been solved. <laughs> And so Mr. Keene finds the solution to the case of the melody of murder. The next time you're suffering from the pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, try Anison. You'll bless the day you heard of this incredibly fast way to relieve these pains. Now, the reason Anison is so wonderfully fast-acting and effective is this. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing Anison tablets from their own dentist or physician, and in this way have discovered the incredibly fast relief Anison brings from pain of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. So next time such pain strike, take Anison. For most effective relief, use only as directed. Your druggist has Anison in handy boxes of 12 and 30, and economical family size bottles of 50 and 100. The name is Anison, A N A C I N. Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, is based on the novel, Mr. Keene. The radio sequel is originated and produced by Frank and Ann Hummert. Dialogue by Lawrence Clee. Bennett Kilpack plays Mr. Keene. It is on the air every Thursday at this time. Don't miss Mr. Keene next Thursday when the kindly old Tracer turns to the innocent flirtation murder case. It's time now for Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Anison and Kalinos present Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction in one of radio's most thrilling drama. Tonight and every Thursday at the same time, the famous old investigator takes from his file and brings to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. Tonight's case is entitled, The Innocent Flirtation Murder Case. Many of you, I'm sure, have had Anison recommended to you for the quick relief of pain from headaches, neuritis, or neuralgia. Everywhere, people are switching to this fast, modern way to relief. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, it contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven, active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have been given an envelope containing Anison tablets at some time or other, by their dentist or physician. These people know how incredibly fast this action is. If you have not yet tried Anison, go to your drug counter now and pick up a box. Try Anison the next time you are in pain from neuralgia, neuritis, or a headache. You'll be delighted with the result. For most effective relief, use only as directed. Ask for Anison, spelled A N A C I N. <laughs> Mr. Keene and the Innocent Flirtation Murder Case. Our scene opens in a large suburban home. It is late at night, and a quarrel is in progress. A quarrel that is about to end in tragedy. I'm... I'm sorry about this whole thing. But when you come to your senses, you'll... What are you doing? No! 
No. Put that gun down. Don't kill me. Don't. The next morning in the office of Mr. Keene, the famous investigator. Mr. Keene. Which of you gentlemen is Mr. Keene? I'm Mr. Keene. This is my partner, Mike Clancy. Sure, and what's all the excitement, mister? I didn't do it. I didn't kill him, I tell you. Saints preserve us. What's he talking about, boss? Pull that chair over here, Mike, so he can sit down. Now, try to relax. What's your name? Wills. Arthur Wills. I'm a building contractor. Last night, I did the most awful thing I've ever done in my life. Put myself under... Suspicion of murder. Exactly what happened, Mr. Wills. Well, you... You may have heard of Kenneth Leighton. The architect? Yes, Mr. Keene. One of the most successful young architects in the country. I went to his home in, in the suburbs with a pair of dueling pistols and challenged him to a duel. A duel? In this day and age? Oh, I don't blame you for looking at me as if I was crazy, Mr. Clancy, and maybe I was for a little while. Crazy with jealousy. It happened... Just after midnight, Mr. Keene, I, I'd gone to Kenneth Slayton's home where I found him alone. Just a moment. I'll open the door. Arthur Wills. Well, what are you doing here at this hour? You'll see what I'm doing in just a second. Here. Take your choice, Slayton. What have you got inside that box? A pair of dueling pistols. One for you and the other for me. We're going to have this out once and for all. Dueling pistols? <laughs> you can't be serious, Wills. You can't <laughs> laugh your way out of this one, Leighton. I've found out about you and my wife. You've been making love to her. And one of us is going to pay for it with his life. You must be out of your mind, Wills. Mary and I were never serious about each other. It was nothing but an innocent flirtation. Lies won't help you, Leighton. Are you going to accept my challenge to shoot it out with these pistols? Of course not. We're not living in the Middle Ages. Put those pistols away. You coward, I... You crazy fool! <clears throat> I'm sorry I had to knock you down, Wills. I'm sorry about this whole thing. But when you come to your senses... What are you doing? No. No, put that gun down. Don't kill me. Don't! <laughs> I swear to you, Mr. Keene, that's what happened. You had first challenged Kenneth Layton to a duel, is that it, Mr. Wells? Yes. He laughed at me and wouldn't accept. Then he... He must have mistaken a move I made for an attack because he struck me and knocked me down. He's a young man and strong. The blow dazed me for a few seconds, and while I was trying to come to my senses, I thought I heard two shots... A few moments later, when I came around, I saw Kenneth Leighton lying dead on the floor. Have the police been notified of the murder? Not yet, Mr. Keene. I, I, I was too frightened to do anything but run. I, I wandered through the streets all night and then thought of you. You have a reputation for helping a man when he's desperately in need of it, Mr. Keene. Please, help me now before I'm arrested for a murder I didn't commit. Sit where you are, Mr. Wells. Hello? Is Mr. Keene there, please? This is Mr. Keene speaking. My name is Don Judson, sir. I'm an assistant to Kenneth Layton, the architect. Mm -hmm. He was murdered last night, Mr. Keene. I, I found his body. And I'm requesting that you investigate the case on his behalf. When did you find the body, Mr. Judson? Early this morning when I came to Mr. Layton's home for a business conference. Then the police have been called? Yes, sir. I called them. They've already made a preliminary investigation, and they're looking for a man named Arthur Wills. Two dueling pistols belonging to Wills were found on the floor, and both of them had been fired. I see. All right, Mr. Judson, I'll do everything I can. Where are you calling from? Mr. Layton's home, sir. I'll be there inside of an hour. Thank you, Mr. Keene. Goodbye. Goodbye. Mr. Wills, do you know who Don Judson is? Uh, yes, Mr. Keene. He's a young architect, a protege of Kenneth Layton's. Well, he's found Layton's body, and the police are looking for you. Uh, then they know. Your dueling pistols were found on the floor beside the body. Yes. 
In my fright, I left them there. They were family heirlooms. The family name is inscribed on them. Mr. Wills, are you willing to give yourself up to the police while my partner, Mike Clancy, and I investigate your claim of innocence? My claim of innocence? You mean you don't believe me? So far, the circumstances are against you. And your word is all I have for your innocence. If you can't help me, Mr. Keene, I'm lost. The police will find out that I was insanely jealous of my wife and hated Leighton for seeing her. I won't have a chance. Well, Mr. Wills, if I find you're guilty of murdering Henry Leighton, I assure you I'll make certain you won't have a chance. Mr. Keene, would I have come here to your office begging for help if I were guilty? I'm sure, and many a man's come to Mr. Keene saying that he was innocent. And all he was trying to do was to pull the wool over the boss's eyes. But none of them ever got away with it. Mr. Keene, I'm willing to put all my trust in you and pay the penalty if you find out that I haven't been honest with you. Very well, Mr. Wills. We'll drive you to police headquarters where you'll surrender yourself for questioning. After that, Mike and I will begin investigating this remarkable case at the scene of the crime. <laughs> Kenneth Layton must have been a wealthy fellow, Mr. Keene. This house of his is fit for a king. He was one of the youngest, most successful architects in his profession, Mike. Hmm, ask Don Judson to wait here for me. Well, Judson is Layton's assistant. Is that it, boss? Yes, he found Layton's body. I wonder if so. Yes? My name is Keene. I... Oh, yes. Don Judson is expecting you. Please come in. Thank you. I'm Mary Wills. Mary Wills? Arthur Wills' wife. I see. Is that Mr. Keene? Yes. Well, I'm happy to know you, sir. I'm Don Judson. And this is my partner, Mike Clancy. Glad to know you. Mrs. Wills arrived a few minutes ago. I phoned and told her that the police were looking for her husband. This is Mr. Keene, the famous investigator, Mrs. Wills. Mr. Keene, I, I just can't believe that my husband has anything to do with Kenneth Layton's death. And what he's He's found, already I... given himself up to the police, Mrs. Wills. He has. And confessed to the murder? No, Mr. Judson. Arthur Wills claims he's innocent. Oh, you've got to help him, Mr. Keene. I intend to, Mrs. Wills, providing I find he is innocent. Now, Mr. Judson, just where did you find Mr. Layton's body when you came in this morning? Over there at the end of the foyer, Mr. Keene. The two dueling pistols were lying nearby. The police took the pistols as evidence. I know. I talked to them about it. They found no fingerprints in either gun, however. Apparently, both guns were wiped off by the killer. Oh, Mike. Yes, boss. While I examine the foyer, suppose you look through the rest of the house. Okay, sir. I'll show him around, Mr. Keene. Mrs. Wills, if you'll take a seat in the living room inside, I'll talk to you in just a few minutes. Well, very well, Mr. Keene. And meet me back here after you're through, Mike. Right, sir. This way, Mr. Clancy. What rooms would you like to examine first? Well, did Mr. Layton have a private study, Mr. Judson? Why, yes, uh, through this door. Well, that's as good a place as any to start with. After you, Mr. Clancy. This study leads to a terrace outside, through those two French doors. If you'd like to see it, Mr. I can... Mr. Judson, just keep right on talking. I just saw a shadow out there in the terrace behind the doors. Someone must be out there. Act like you're still showing me around. And move over toward the terrace. Mr. Layton owned a gun, I believe. He never had a chance to use it, I guess, before he was... Step aside. Quick, let me open them terrace doors. You're looking for somebody, young lady? Why, well, I just... Mr. Clancy, it's Dorothy Graff. Get out of my way! Just a second, miss. Come in here. Let go of me! Let go of you here! Mr. Clancy won't hurt you, Dorothy. There's nothing to be afraid of. What's going on here, Mike? Well, Mr. Keene, I just caught this young lady out on the terrace. She's trying to get away. Who are you? My name is Dorothy Grafton. She was engaged to Kenneth Layton at one time, Mr. Keene. What are you doing here, Miss Grafton? I wanted to speak to Kenneth. Kenneth is dead. What did you say? Kenneth Layton was murdered last night, Miss Grafton. No. Oh, no. Oh, Don, you didn't... I didn't do what? What were you going to say, Miss Grafton? Suppose I tell you, Mr. Keene. Dorothy Grafton seemed to feel that I was in love with her. She's apparently suggesting that... I might have had something to do with Mr. Layton's murder because of her. No, I didn't mean to... Suppose we let the facts speak for themselves. 
Kenneth Layton threw you over long before I ever met you. Isn't that true, Dorothy? I guess so, Don. Mr. Keene, it stands to reason I couldn't have been jealous of Mr. Layton because of Dorothy. And another thing, I happen to pin a great deal on my future career. What do you mean, Mr. Judson? Well, I haven't been making very much money up to now. As an architect's apprentice, my salary wasn't high. But if Kenneth Layton had lived, one day he might have helped me to become as successful as he was. Scrafton, is it true that you were in love with a murdered man, Kenneth Layton, and he threw you over? Mr. Keene, I loved him. I swear I wouldn't have hurt him for anything in the world. Sit down for a moment. I want you to remain here for questioning. Mike. Yes, boss. Did you find anything in this room worth examining? Well, I didn't have a chance to look, sir. But Mr. Judson here said that Mr. Layton had a gun. Mr. Judson, where did you usually keep his gun? Right here in the lower desk drawer. He had a license for it, of course. He... But the gun is gone. Boss, look. Dorothy Grafton's running for the terrace. Go after him, Mike. No! No, you'll never take me! Come back here! Come Miss back! Grafton dropped her bag. I'll get it for you, Mr. Keene. This handbag feels rather heavy. Yes. Let's see what's inside. What? Well, it's a gun. Oh. Evidently, Miss Grafton came prepared for trouble. Do you recognize this weapon by any chance, Mr. Judson? It looks like the one Mr. Layton owned. Oh, yes, Mr. Keene. This, this is the gun he kept in his desk. Well, it doesn't seem to have been fired. Inside, young lady, and no more tricks. And here comes Mike with Dorothy Grafton. Now we'll see if she has anything further to say about a murder that was started by merely an innocent flirtation. <laughs> a moment we'll return to Mr. Keene and the innocent flirtation murder case. Meanwhile, stop tooth decay and unpleasing breath. Yes, stop tooth decay and unpleasing breath that breathes between the teeth. Use Colonel's toothpaste with dental floss action. Your dentist will tell you, brush your teeth after meals to stop decay. Clean those cracks and crevices deep between your teeth to guard against unpleasing breath. Now, Kalinos gives you dental floss action. That is, sends thousands of active cleansing bubbles to help dislodge bits of food that can cause unpleasing breath. What's more, foamy, refreshing Kalinos brightens teeth by removing ordinary yellow surface stains. Helps stop tooth decay. Get Kalinos toothpaste with dental floss action today. back to Mr. Keene and the innocent flirtation murder case. Mr. Keene, the great investigator, and his partner, Mike Clancy, are investigating the murder of Kenneth Layton, a well-known young architect. Arthur Wills, a building contractor, is under suspicion for the murder. Wills was violently jealous of his wife, Mary, who was supposed to have had a flirtation with a murdered man. Now a new suspect has entered the case, attractive Dorothy Grafton, who had been jilted by the victim. She has just been brought into the study of Kenneth Layton's house after trying to escape. And as she faces Mr. Keene and young Don Judson, a protege of the murdered architect... Why did you try to run away, Miss Garton? Because I'm innocent, Mr. Keene. And I know you'll try to pin Kenneth's murder on me. Mr. Keene just found a gun in your handbag, Dorothy. A gun, did you say, Don? And Don tells me it belonged to the murdered man, Kenneth Layton. Running away like that puts you in line for a murder charge, young lady. Oh, no. My partner, Mike Clancy, is right, Miss Garton. You'll either tell the entire truth or I'll have to turn you over to the police immediately. Mr. Keene, will anyone believe the truth? I will, if you play fair with me. I stole that gun two days ago from Kenneth Smith. Why? I wanted him to take me back. I loved him so. I was going to threaten to use it on the two of us if he didn't. But it was only going to be a threat, Mr. Keene. I didn't actually mean it. Is that why you tried to sneak into this house? Yes. I had no idea that Kenneth was dead. Murdered. I've been a fool. And now I'm in trouble for it. I should have known he wouldn't fall in love with me all over again. There were others in his life. For instance? Don Judson here can tell you. Kenneth has been seeing Mrs. Wills. 
Mary Wills. Mr. Keene already knows that, Dorothy. Well, maybe Mary Wills had something to do with Kenneth's death. Or maybe your husband may have killed him. Her husband's been taken into custody by the police. Then why pick on me, Mr. Keene? Because it's not been proven yet that he murdered Kenneth Layton. Mike, you stay here with Dorothy Graff and Mr. Judson while I talk to Mrs. Wills, who's waiting in the hall. Okay, Mr. Keene. I warn you, Miss Graff, don't make another attempt to escape. I'll keep an eye on her, boss. Boss, that sounds like the front door opened. Wait here with the others, Mike. Mrs. Wills. Oh, yes, Mr. King. Were you just about to leave the house? I I was worried about my husband. You said he was being held by the police. I wanted to see him if I could. You'll get a chance to see him very shortly, Mrs. Wills. Dorothy Grafton is inside. Dorothy Grafton? You know her? Yes. We found her trying to sneak into the house with a gun in her purse. Mr. Keene, she used to be Kenneth's sweetheart. Really? Then he broke off with her. Before that, she was Don Judson's girl. She took expensive presents from Don, jewelry and furs. But she must have thought she could get even more out of Kenneth. Don Judson told me he'd broken off with Dorothy Grafton of his own accord. Yes, and it infuriated her. Then she tried to win Kenneth Layton over. How do you know all that, Mrs. Wills? Kenneth told me. She was making a pest of herself and he wanted to break it up in some way. Oh, don't you see, Mr. Keene? Dorothy Grafton could have killed Kenneth. Because she imagined she was jilted. Mrs. Wills, it appears that you're very anxious to place Dorothy Grafton in a suspicious light. I only want to tell you the truth. Mr. King, one thing you must believe, and I swear it's true. Kenneth and I were only friends. Perhaps it might have been mistaken for more than an innocent flirtation. But I remained faithful to my husband. Very well, Mrs. Wills. I have no more questions right now. You may go to police headquarters and see your husband, if you like. Thank you, Mr. King. Oh, just a moment. I'm going to send someone with you. You mean you don't trust me to go alone? Under the circumstances, I am forced to take every precaution. I'll send Don Judson with you. Very well, Mr. King. And tell your husband to have a little faith and patience. He may be a free man again even sooner than he thinks. Well, Mr. Keene, I just got a cab outside from Mrs. Wills and Don Judson. Now, what'll we do about this young lady here? We'll send Dorothy Grafton home, Mike. You mean you're setting me free? Temporarily, Miss Grafton. But stay at home until I call you. I won't try to run away again, sir. Very well. You can leave now, Miss Grafton. Thank you, Mr. Keene. Boss, I don't get it. Sure, she's one of our biggest suspects, isn't she? Well, I had to get her out of the house, Mike, because I want complete secrecy. If she tries to get away, we can find her easily enough. Well, I, I guess you're right, boss, but where do we go from here? Well, Mike, I've just discovered one important clue concerning this case. A clue that may solve it completely. We're going to spend the next few hours going over every one of Kenneth Layton's business records... Until we find the proof I need. Well, here's another set of bills, Mr. Keene. Let's see them, Mike. Only about half of them are marked paid in full. The other half are unpaid. Now, let's keep looking, Mike. Huh. Here's a checkbook, boss. Good. Let's look it over. And yes, it's Kenneth Layton's all right. And he had a balance of over $200,000 when he died. Huh. Let's look at those bills again. Sure, and... Here's one that was sent to Layton four months ago for a thousand dollars. Isn't it odd, Mike, that a man as wealthy as Kenneth Layton seemed to be couldn't pay his bills on time? Boss, here's another set of papers. More bills, I guess. Yes, these were sent out by Kenneth Layton for his services as an architect, not sent to him. 
And they're all paid up. Well, they're stamped paid, boss. And the stamp marks are initial. Mike, where's your small magnifying glass? Uh, right here in my pocket, sir. I'm never without it. Well, let me have it. I want to see if I can make out these initials. Here you are, sir. Can you read the initials, sir? Yes, and I think we've solved the mystery of Kenneth Layton's murder. Mr. Keene, someone just come into the house. I heard the front door close. It's undoubtedly our killer, Mike, and well-armed, I'm sure. Open that closet door quickly. I'm going to let myself be surprised, Mike. It may help us get a confession more easily. You remain inside this closet with your gun handy. Right, boss. Mr. Judson. I returned because I'd forgotten something, Mr. King. I didn't expect to find that you'd remained here. There were some facts I wanted to uncover, Mr. Judson. Concern is Kenneth Layton's murderer. Oh? Have you uncovered them? Very thoroughly. And you know who killed him? Yes. I suppose you uh, sent your partner, Mr. Clancy, after the murderer. I sent my partner out in regard to something else. There's no need to send anyone for the murderer, Mr. Judson. He's already walked in here. Really? <laughs> Mr. Keene, you sound as if I'm your man. You are, Judson. You killed Kenneth Layton, and I have proof. You make a move, Keene, I'll kill you. That gun in your hand certainly bears out my theory. Although it can be easily proved in any case. With Kenneth Layton's assistant, you seem to have handled all his bookkeeping. Yes. I'm an architect, too, but he wouldn't let me design one of his precious buildings. He only found out you didn't have the necessary talent. That made you bitter and murderous as well. But that wasn't the main reason you took Kenneth Layton's life. No. You took care of all his accounts. I know that because I found your initials on certain bills. Did you? You doctored his account books and kept half the money he gave you to pay his bills. I first suspected you, Judson, when Mrs. Wills mentioned your buying expensive presents for Dorothy Grafton. I told you I threw her over myself. True. But you did spend a great deal of money on her to satisfy your own vanity, I presume. And you told me yourself that as an architect's assistant, you didn't make very much. That's very clever, Keen. But you weren't clever. Sooner or later, Kenneth Layton's creditors would have sued him for unpaid bills. And then he would have discovered your thefts. He did discover them. And he was about to turn me over to the police. That's when you decided to murder him. You saw your chance when you sneaked into this house during the quarrel that Layton had with Arthur Wills. When Wills laid on the floor, temporarily dazed, you came out of hiding, grabbed his dueling pistols, and murdered Kenneth Layton. All right, Keen. Now, let me tell you something. I had a feeling you were up to something when you sent me out with Mary Wills. So I made it a point to come back. However, Mrs. Wills thinks I've gone home. And she'll have no way of proving anything against me when they find your dead body, Keith. You really believe you cover every angle, don't you, Judson? I covered one that had you guessing even before you entered the case. You trailed Arthur Wills after the shooting and saw him enter my office building. Then you called and asked me to enter the case as an added cover for yourself. Right. Now for my final piece of strategy. Here's a bullet for your trouble. See? Drop that gun. What? Drop it. Ah! Mr. Keene, if I hadn't beaten to the drawer, he'd have put a bullet in your heart. You shot the gun out of my hand. Sure. And it looks like your murdering days are over, Judson. Yes, Mike, you're right. Judson started with deception, then theft and finished with murder. The logical sequence of events that a criminal follows. Now he'll end that series of events as it always ends, by being fully punished for his crimes. And so Mr. Keene finds the solution to the innocent flirtation murder case. The next time you're suffering from the pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, try Anison. You'll bless the day you heard of this incredibly fast way to relieve these pains. 
Now, the reason Anison is so wonderfully fast-acting and effective is this. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven, active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing Anison tablets from their own dentist or physician. And in this way have discovered the incredibly fast relief Anison brings from pain of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. So next time such pain strike, take Anison. For most effective relief, use only as directed. Your druggist has Anison in handy boxes of 12 and 30 and economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100. The name is Anison, A-N-A-C-I-N. Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, is based on the novel Mr. Keene. The radio sequel is originated and produced by Frank and Ann Hummert. Dialogue by Lawrence Clee. Bennett Kilpack plays Mr. Keene. It is on the air every Thursday at this time. Don't miss Mr. Keene next Thursday when the kindly old Tracer turns to the yellow parrot murder case. It's time now for Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Anison and Kalinos present Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. One of the most famous characters of American fiction in one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday at the same time, the famous old investigator takes from his file and brings to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. Tonight's case is entitled, The Case of the Murdered Detective. This program comes to you from the makers of Anison. You probably have occasion at times to take something for headaches, neuritis, or neuralgic pain. But if you've never taken Anison, let me suggest that you do so, especially if you want incredibly fast and effective relief. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, it contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Your own dentist or physician may have given you an envelope containing Anison tablets at one time or another, Thousands of people have come to know and prefer Anison this way. So the next time you want prompt relief from the pains of headaches, neuritis, or neuralgia, try Anison. See for yourself how incredibly fast and effective it is. Ask for Anison at your neighborhood drug counter today. For most effective relief, use only as directed. Anison is spelled A N A C I N. <laughs> for Mr. Keene and the case of the murdered detective. Our scene opens in the office which Mr. Keene, the famous investigator, shares with his friend and partner, Mike Clancy. Telephone is ringing at the moment, and as Mike picks up the receiver, he hears a familiar voice at the other end of the wire. Hello. Mr. Keene. Oh, this is his partner, Mike Clancy, speaking. Uh, Mike, this is Jim Ryan. Oh, Jim, my boy, and how are you? Fine, Mike. Would you put Mr. Keene on the wire, please? It's important. Sure. Just a second. Mr. Keene? Yes, Mike? It's Jim Ryan, the police force detective. He says it's important. Oh, all right. I'll take it. Hello? Mr. Keene? Yes, Jim? I'm calling from a phone booth in the Hotel Metropole. I'm working on a case, and I thought you might be able to help me out. I'm glad to do anything I can, Jim. Do you remember a man named Martin Cook? Martin Cook? He's in the real estate business. He was called as a material witness in an embezzlement case two years ago. If I remember, you had something to do with breaking that case. Just a moment, Jim. I'll ask Mike Clancy to check through the files. I don't have much time, Mr. Keene. As a matter of fact, I've been trailing Cook for the past three hours. He... Uh, uh, Jim! Jim Ryan! Knife! I... I... Uh... Jim! What's the trouble, boss? Hotel Metropole, Mike, quickly. Something's happened to Jim Ryan. And I only hope we're not too late. Here are 
the public telephone booths, Mike. The first one's empty, Mr. Keene. Let's see if the other one... Mike, help me open this door. Wait, there's someone inside, crumpled up against the wall. Here, let's see if we can open this phone booth door. Mike. Sands preserve us. It's Jim Ryan. He's dead. He's got a knife in his back. Shoney was one of my old friends on the police force. Better man never lived. I'd like to get my hands on the man. Easy, Mike. Let's keep our heads. We've got work to do. These phone booths are isolated from the rest of the hotel lobby. That's why it wasn't hard for Jim Ryan's killer to strike and get away. Step into the next phone booth, Mike. And put a call through to the police. I will, sir. I'll notify the hotel manager. Then I want to pay a visit to a man named Martin Cook. Martin Cook? Is he the man Jim Ryan was trailing, boss? Yes, Mike. Jim said he was in the real estate business. And I want to find him before he has a chance to plan a getaway. Here's the office, Mr. Keene. Martin Cook, real estate. Keep your gun where you can reach it quickly, Mike. I've got it handy, boss. May I help you? Is Mr. Cook in? Not at the moment. I'm his secretary, Miss Everett. Did you have an appointment with Mr. Cook? No. My name is Keene. This is my partner, Mr. Clancy. Mr. Keene? The famous investigator? Please sit down, sir. Mr. Cook should be here at any moment. Perhaps you'd better take a look in his office, Mike. Yes, sir. But I assure you that Mr. Cook isn't in, Mr. Keene. I don't doubt your word on that, Miss Everett. However, I'd like my partner to search his office for evidence. Evidence of what? Your employer, Mr. Cook, is under suspicion of murder. Murder? Is that his private office, miss? Yes, I'll show it to you, Mr. Clancy. I'll uh, wait out here, Mike, in case Mr. Cook arrives. Right, sir. This is Mr. Cook's private office, Mr. Clancy. Let's have a look through this desk. Mr. Clancy, who... Who was murdered? Jim Ryan, a police detective. A man with a wife and three children dependent on him. Sure, and when we get our hands on the killer, he'll regret it. I'll take these books and these business papers along with me. Miss Everett, whose picture is that on Martin Cook's desk? Mr. Cook's son, Arthur. Oh, he's got himself a family, has he? Only his son. His wife is dead, Mr. Clancy. Mr. Cook. Miss Everett. What's going on in here? This man is an associate of Mr. Keene's, the private investigator. I'll handle it if you don't mind, miss. You're Martin Cook? I am. Just a minute, mister. Mr. Keene? Yes, Mike? Martin Cook came into his office through another door. Oh. Did you uh, find anything? Well, I didn't have much of a chance to look around before he came in, boss. I grabbed these books and papers on general principles just to read them over. Mr. Cook? Yes, Miss Everett, will you leave us alone, please? If there's anything Just I... see that I'm not disturbed. Very well, Mr. Cook. Mr. Keene, if I recall correctly, we met for a few moments about two years ago. That's right, Mr. Cook. It was in regard to an embezzlement case. I remember you helped the district attorney gather evidence to break the case. You were very brave to testify, since your life had been threatened by gangsters. Have you come here to ask me for additional help, Mr. Keene? No. This time, I'm afraid, you're not an innocent witness testifying for the state. You may find yourself a defendant. In what way? Do you know a man named James Ryan? Is he a police detective? Yes. I believe I've heard the name. He's been murdered. <laughs> murdered? Oh, no. And at the time, he was making some kind of investigation of you, Mr. Cook. I see. Do you know what he was investigating? Jim Ryan was investigating a theft of charity funds, Mr. Keene. Funds I stole. I see. And what about his murder? You have no father to go to find your murderer. I killed that police detective. Sure, and he admits it, Mr. Keene. Just a moment, Mike. Mr. Cook, you say you killed Jim Ryan? Yes. When? What difference does it make? Well... What did you do with the gun? I, I threw it away in the river. Mr. Keene. I must warn you, Mr. Cook, that anything you say can be used against you. 
But you're under no obligation to talk at this point. Take me away. Put me in jail. I've admitted the crime, haven't I? What more do you want? All right, Mike. We'll drive down to headquarters of Mr. Cook and turn him over to the police. Then we'll continue with our investigation. What more is there to investigate? You've solved the crime, haven't you? Not quite, Mr. Cook. I have a feeling there's a great deal more to be discovered in spite of your so-called confession. Now I want to know who the person is you're trying to shield. No one. No one. I tell you, I did it. Turn me over to the police. Very well, Mr. Cook. Come along. But I mean to find out who you're trying to shield. Well, Mr. Keene, we've turned our self-confessed murderer, Martin Cook, over to the police... Where do we go from here, sir? To Cook's residence, Mike. I've looked it up in the phone book. Drive to Carroll Street. Yes, sir. Sure, and when he said he threw his gun away, I got the shock of my life. I tricked him into that, Mike. As you know, Jim Ryan was stabbed to death with a knife. I suggested a gun, and Cook took the bait. But why do you think he did that, Mr. Keene? Confessed to a murder he didn't commit. As I told him, in my opinion, he's shielding someone. Well, I heard you tell that to Lieutenant Hale at police headquarters too, boss, but... The lieutenant mentioned another angle to it. Yes, I know, and he may be right. Martin Cook may be a clever psychologist. He might be trying to get us to think he's protecting someone. Just to make himself appear an innocent martyr. Cook could have actually committed the murder himself. But according to his account books, the money he collected from them charities is missing, boss. That's why Jim Ryan, the police detective, was trailing him. Yes, Mike, I know. Martin Cook may have stolen the money himself... Or it may have been stolen by the person he's trying to shield. We're on our way to Martin Cook's house right now to check on that all-important fact. Yes? My name is Keen. This is Mr. Clancy. This is Mr. Martin Cook's house, isn't it? Yes, I'm Arthur Cook, his son. I'm afraid I have bad news for you, Arthur. Bad news? Has something happened to Dad? He's being held by the police on suspicion of murder. My father held for murder? May we come in, please? Yes, of course. You just about knocked the wind out of me, Mr. Keene. Well, there must be some mistake. My father... He had admitted the murder, young fellow. Admitted it? What? Who... Who was murdered? A police detective named Ryan was stabbed to death while trailing your father. Jim Ryan evidently had gotten information that your father was guilty of stealing certain charity funds that were entrusted to him. No, no, Dad couldn't have stolen that money. I... I don't believe it. But he's admitted that, too. I must get hold of a lawyer. I... Just a moment, Mr. King. Hello? Arthur, darling? I, I can't talk to you now, Lola. But, Arthur, what's the matter? I'll call you back. You think I'm going to sit around in my apartment all day just waiting for your call? Mr. Keene, where is my father being held? At police headquarters. I must go down to see him at once. Since we're working with the police, uh, you don't mind if we remain here and look the house over, do you? There's, well, there's nothing in this house that'll interest you, Mr. Keene. Well, I suppose you let me be the judge of that, Arthur. Oh, very well. Stay here if you like. I'm going to get in touch with our attorney and get my father out of this crazy mess. Sure, and he turned pale when you told him about his father being a murder suspect, Mr. Keene. Yes, Mike, and his reaction to the theft of the charity funds was just as startling. And I wonder why. A murder charge is a lot more serious than the theft of money, and yet, uh... Hmm. Mike, there's a small book for telephone numbers on that side table. Would you hand it to me, please? Yes, here. Hey, Arthur. That uh, girl, Arthur Cook, just spoke to on the phone. He called her Lola. Yes, there's a phone number and address in here for someone named Lola Slade. I think I'll call her. Look at this house, Mr. Keene. Sure, it seems that a man who can afford an expensive place like this shouldn't be tempted into stealing money from charity cases. That's exactly what I was thinking, Mike. There's something strange about it. Hello? Is this Miss Lola Slade? Well? My name is Keene. 
I was wondering if I could see you about... I had uh, nothing to do with it. Keep away from me, dear. Here, keep away. Hello? Hello? Did Rhoda Slade hang up on your boss? Yes. After protesting her innocence about something I hadn't even accused her of. Mike, this case is a number of odd angles. We'll have to check every one before we're absolutely sure who murdered Detective Jim Ryan. I have a hunch, in spite of Martin Cook's confession, the eventual solution will be an amazing one. In just a moment, we'll return to Mr. Keene and the case of the murdered detective. Meanwhile, stop tooth decay and unpleasing breath. Yes, stop tooth decay and unpleasing breath that breeds between the teeth. Use Kalinos toothpaste with dental floss action. Your dentist will tell you, brush your teeth after meals to stop decay. Clean those cracks and crevices deep between your teeth to guard against unpleasing breath. Now Kalinos gives you dental floss action. That is, sends thousands of active cleansing bubbles to help dislodge bits of food that can cause unpleasing breath. What's more, foamy, refreshing Kalinos brightens teeth by removing ordinary yellow surface stains. Help stop tooth decay. Get Kalinos toothpaste with dental floss action today. Now back to Mr. Keene and the case of the murdered detective. Mr. Keene, the great investigator, and his partner, Mike Clancy, are investigating the murdered detective, Jim Ryan, of the police department, a friend of both Mr. Keene's and Mike's. Under suspicion for the killing is Martin Cook, who has confessed to the crime although Mr. Keene believes he is trying to shield the real culprit. Now, Mike and Mr. Keene arrive at the apartment of Lola Slade, a friend of Martin Cook's son, Arthur. Mr. Keene suspects that she knows a great deal more about the crime than she admits to. And as Mike rings her doorbell... Hmm, no answer, Mr. Keene. Maybe Lola Slade doesn't want to answer, Mike. Open this door or I'll force the lock. What do you want? Are you Lola Slade? What about it? My name is Keene. This is my partner, Mike Clancy. I spoke to you on the phone a few minutes ago. Stay out of my apartment. Get your foot out of the door. Keep this door open, if you please, lady. Step inside, boss. I'll hold it open with my foot. You've got no right to come in here like this. I'm no criminal. A detective named Jim Ryan has been murdered, Lola. And we're working with the police. We have a right to question all suspects. Suspects? I'm no suspect. But you seem to know a great deal about the case. You protested your innocence over the telephone even before you were accused. Well, I heard about the murder of that detective on a news broadcast a minute before you phoned, Mr. Keene. I knew that Martin Cook had been arrested, and I thought his son Arthur would be mixed up in it. But why should that frighten you, Lola? Well, I'm a showgirl, Mr. Keene. I sing for a living on the stage and in nightclubs. I have a reputation to consider. Mr. Keene. What is it, Mike? Take a look on that couch. Yes, I noticed that open suitcase. Evidently, Lola Slade was packing to leave the city. But I have an engagement to sing in Los Angeles. And that's just about as far away as you can get, eh? What do you mean, Mr. Clancy? Have you brought the police with you? Not yet, Lola. I'll answer that door for you, young lady. Mr. Clancy. Boss. Boss, it's Miss Everett, Mr. Cook's secretary. Oh, come in, Miss Everett. Is this Miss Lola Slade? Well, I thought I'd give you a chance to clear yourself before I turn this evidence over to the police. Evidence? What evidence? Are you crazy? Just what is it you found, Miss Everett? Mr. Keene, this letter came from Mr. Cook this afternoon. As his secretary, I open all his business mail, and I read it. What does it say? It's from a credit company. It says that unless $8,000 worth of bills are paid by Monday... Mr. Cook's son, Arthur, will be brought into court. Oh, let me see that letter, please, Miss Everett. Here you are, Mr. Keene. Hmm. According to this letter, the items were charged and several bad checks were passed. Bad checks? That makes it a criminal offense, boss. That's right, Mike. The items include a fur coat and a woman's bracelet, both of which were sent to Miss Lola Slade. But I didn't know Arthur Cook stole the money when he bought me those things. Stole what money, Lola? Why, why the money that... You mean the stolen charity funds? 
Judging by your slip of the tongue, Arthur Cook must have told you that he stole that money from his father. Yes. It was only a few days ago. He came to me to borrow some money to pay those bills. But I didn't have any. Then he got the money somewhere else. When I heard the story of the stolen funds and the murder over the radio, I just naturally tied it up with Arthur. Mr. Cook was right about you, Lola Slade. He did his best to separate you from Arthur. You keep quiet, Helen Never. You bled his son for all you could get out of him. I'll make you regret that. Put down that fire poker, Lola. I'll put it down on her head. Not so fast. Give me that poker. Let go of me. You're all against me, every one of you. But I'm innocent. I swear I'm innocent. Waving fire pokers around won't help your case any. When you recovered your composure, Lola, I suggest you tell the police what part you had in all this. You're going to arrest me, Mr. King? I have no evidence that you were involved in the murder of Detective Jim Ryan. At least, not yet. However, you may be involved in a theft before very long. Mr. Keene, I told you I didn't know Arthur Cook stole that money from his father. Miss Everett, just how were the funds stolen? Do you happen to know? Yes, Mr. Keene. They were taken in cash from the safe. The safe in Martin Cook's office? Yes, Mr. Cook reported it as a burglary at first. Well, Detective Jim Ryan must have gotten suspicious, boss, and followed up the case, yet in evidence that it was an inside job. I think so, too, Mike. Perhaps we'll have a look at Mr. Cook's safe and see if we can get any information from it. Lola, your attempt to attack Miss Everett is punishable by law. However, perhaps Miss Everett will forget it on the grounds of temperament and fear. I don't want to see her in jail, Mr. Keene. I'll accept an apology. I, I'm i sorry, Miss Everett. I just didn't know what I was doing. I'm ready to go to the police, Mr. Keene, and tell them as much as I know. Very well. We'll escort you to headquarters and then proceed to Mr. Cook's office. And perhaps discover the final information we need as to who murdered Detective Jim Ryan. <laughs> Come into the office, Mr. Keene and Mr. Clancy. Well, thank you, Miss Everett. Uh, first, I'd like to examine Mr. Cook's safe. The safe is in Mr. Cook's private office. I locked the door when I left before. The key is in my desk here. Here it is. Oh, just a moment, Miss Everett. Sir? Uh, you don't mind if I smoke a cigar, do you? Why, of course not. I smoke myself. But not cigars. <laughs> you have a match, Mike? Uh, sure, boss. I have one. Wait a minute. Here's a... Packet of matches in the desk. May I have them, Miss Everett? Help yourself, Mr. Keene. Thank you. Now, uh, let's proceed to Mr. Cook's private office. That's odd. I know I locked the store when I left, but now it's open. Miss Everett, Mr. Keene. Arthur, what are you doing in your father's office? I, I managed to get a key from Dad. I. I came here for evidence. What kind of evidence, Arthur? Evidence that will put me in jail for theft, Mr. Keene, and free my father of a murder charge. You mean you're confessing to the theft of that money your father collected for charity? Yes, Mr. Keene. They wouldn't believe me at police headquarters. They thought I was just trying to shield my father the way he's been shielding me. But I'm going to prove it to them. Is your father also shielding you for murder, Arthur? No, Mr. Keene. I didn't kill that detective, Jim Ryan. But I'm afraid Dad thinks I did, and he's trying to take the blame for me. He found out I stole that money to make up for some bad checks I handed out. Then he tried to lead Detective Ryan to believe he stole the money. Then when Dad found out that Ryan had been murdered, he took the blame for that, too. I see. I, I've been a fool, Mr. Keene, a spineless idiot. Dad gave me a generous allowance, but I wanted more. I, I felt I had to impress someone to win her love. You mean Lola Slade? Yes. Maybe if I'd stuck with a girl like Helen Everett here, things would have worked out differently. You and Miss Everett were keeping company at one time, Arthur? Yes. But when I met Lola... You and I were never serious about each other, and you know it, Arthur. But Helen, I Let's was... get back to the stolen charity funds, Arthur. Uh, what kind of evidence did you expect to find in your father's private office? Well, a letter, maybe, from the credit company, Mr. Keene. They called me a few days ago and said that they were going to contact my father if I didn't make good on those bad checks. Helen Everett's already shown us a letter. However, there may be further evidence in that safe to support your father's innocence. Open the safe for us, Arthur. 
But I can't open it, Mr. Keene. I don't know the combination. Well, then how did you manage to steal the money, young fella? Well, the safe was wide open when I came into the office that day, Mr. Clancy. Was anyone else here at the time? No, Mr. Keene. I thought it was odd, too. It was only three in the afternoon. Well, Dad was evidently out on business, but Helen Everett... I was out to lunch. At three in the afternoon? Miss Everett, would you mind opening the safe for us? I don't know the combination either, Mr. Keene. One lie is enough to give the lie to many other things, Miss Everett. And we'll find out if you're telling the truth about the safe. But I am, I am. Mike, call Martin Cook at police headquarters and ask him if anyone else outside of himself knows the combination to his safe. I'll wager that he trusted Miss Everett with it, since he seemed to trust her with everything else. Mr. Keene, are you trying to say that I stole that money? No, of course not, Miss Everett. Arthur Cook here admits to the theft. But what I do say is this. You left that safe open so Arthur would be tempted to take those charity funds, knowing he needed the money badly. That's a lie. Miss Everett, have you ever been to the Hotel Metropole where Detective Ryan was murdered? No. Then what are you doing with these matches with the hotel's name on the cover? They're the weapons I took from your desk. Mr. King, now I see it all. Helen Everett tried to get even with me. She gave me the chance to take the money before she knew about Lola Slade. I'll Dennis... jam this letter knife into the first one who moves. Stay where you are, all of you. That's all I was waiting for, Helen Everett. I wanted to see you give yourself away and prove my theory correct. You murdered Detective Ryan. While he was following Martin Cook, you were following him. He got as far as you've just gotten, Keene. He was just about to arrest Mr. Cook, and he would have included me as an accessory. But he got no further. And neither will you. Look out, Mr. King. Get oh. your hands off me. Let me go. Quiet, no. That's the last knife you've been throwing, lady. Good thing you caught her arm, Mike. That knife missed me by only an inch. Helen Everett had it all planned. She thought that if she murdered Detective Ryan, Arthur Cook would be held for the crime. And at the same time, she'd get rid of any evidence that she induced... Arthur to steal that money. I loved him. I loved Arthur and he turned me down for that painted fool of a showgirl. I was willing to steal for him, lie for him, cheat for him. When your love turned to hate, you were also ready to murder. I wondered why you forgave Lola Slade so quickly. As much as you hated Lola, it was Arthur you wanted to strike back at. Yes. And I'd do it again if I had the chance. You won't get that chance, Miss Everett, I assure you. All you can look forward to now is payment for your crimes in full. And so Mr. Keene finds a solution to the case of the murdered detective. The next time you're suffering from the pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, try Anison. You'll bless the day you heard of this incredibly fast way to relieve these pains. Now, the reason Anison is so wonderfully fast-acting and effective is this. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing Anison tablets from their own dentist or physician. And in this way have discovered the incredibly fast relief Anison brings from pain of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. So next time such pains strike, take Anison. For most effective relief, use only as directed. Your druggist has Anison handy boxes of 12 and 30 and economical family size bottles of 50 and 100. The name is Anison, A-N-A-C-I-N. Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, is based on the novel Mr. Keene. The radio sequel is originated and produced by Frank and Dan Hummert. Dialogue by Lawrence Clee. Bennett Kilpack plays Mr. Keene. It is on the air every Thursday at this time. Don't miss Mr. Keene next Thursday when the kindly old Tracer turns to the eccentric millionaire murder case. 
It's time now for Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. Ladies and gentlemen, Anison and Kalinos present Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction in one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday at the same time, the famous old investigator takes from his file and brings to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. Tonight's case is entitled, The Eccentric Millionaire Murder Case. This program is brought to you by the makers of Anison. The remarkable tablets that bring incredibly fast relief from the pains of a headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, it contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven, active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing Anison tablets from their own dentist or physician. Perhaps you, too, have been introduced to Anison this way. Then you already know how effective it is. But if you have not, try Anison the next time you want really fast relief from the pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. You'll find Anison tablets convenient to take, and you'll be delighted with the results they give you. For most effective relief, use only as directed. Just ask for Anison. It's spelled A N A C I N. <laughs> Mr. Keene and the eccentric millionaire murder case. Our scene opens in a large rambling house situated in a woody section of Pennsylvania. In one of the littered, unkempt rooms, an old man is seated at the telephone, trying to get an urgent message through to Mr. Keene, the celebrated investigator, a message which is destined to lead to a fantastic murder. Hello, operator. I want to put a call through to New York. No, I don't know the number. I want to call Mr. Keene, the famous investigator. Yes, yes, operator. I'll hold the wire. But hurry, please. It's very urgent. Who's that? No! No. Let me go. You'll... Help! You're joking me. No. No. Don't. Ah. Are you Mr. Keene, sir? No, I'm his partner, Mike Clancy. You wish to see me? Mr. Keene? Yes. My name is John Prague. I've come to you for help, sir, in regard to the murder of my brother. Murder? Sans preservus, I didn't read anything about a murder in the Smallins papers. Otis was strangled to death in his home in Pennsylvania. Mr. Keene, I haven't slept for two nights, but I knew how urgent it was to see you, especially since Otis was trying to reach you just before he died. Your brother tried to contact me? Yes. Your name was found on a small slip of paper near the telephone. Mm. They found Otis's body on the floor nearby. I told the local police I'd come to New York and contact you. Mr. Keene, I'm frightened. Not only was my brother's loss a terrible shock, but it was all so mysterious, so, so weird. Sit down, Mr. Prague. Oh, yes, thank you. Just how was your brother murdered? The police believe he was strangled with some kind of a wire, Mr. Keene. When did it happen? Two days ago. Around 11 o'clock in the morning. In the morning? Well, then maybe there was someone else in the house when your brother was attacked. No, no, Mr. Clancy, there wasn't. Outside of the murder... Your brother lived alone, Mr. Prigg? Perhaps I ought to tell you a little about Otis. He was almost 70 years old, 20 years my senior. As a matter of fact, he was only my half-brother. Yes, go on. Otis was a multimillionaire, Mr. Keene. His father left him some securities that later turned out to be a gold mine. They made him a very wealthy man. I see. And somehow all that money did something to Otis. 
He bought a 30-room house in the Pennsylvania Dutch area around Bucks County. He lived in it all by himself. One man living alone in a 30-room house? My brother Otis had become eccentric, Mr. Clancy. For a while, our niece, Elsie Horner, took care of him, and then she left. Well, that was several years ago. Since then, he's hardly ever been seen outside the old mansion. What was the reason for his eccentricity, Mr. Craig? Do you know? No one knew, Mr. Keene. Otis had stopped seeing me long ago. I entered his house for the first time in years after I was notified of his murder. Hmm. Tell me, Mr. Bragg, who inherits your brother's money? I... I don't know exactly. His will hasn't been read yet. Are you his closest relative? Yes, I think so. Mike, how soon do you think we can leave for Pennsylvania? Oh, just as soon as we clean up the details on the Jordan case, boss. I'd say sometime this afternoon. Well, Mr. Keene, do you want me to wait and drive you and Mr. Clancy out there? No, that won't be necessary, Mr. Craig. Uh, would it be possible for Mike and me to stay overnight at your brother's house? Why, of course. Here, I'll give you the keys to the house. And here are directions on how to get there by car. Fine, Mr. Craig. Would you like me to meet you at my brother's house? Sometime tomorrow, perhaps. I'd prefer to investigate this alone with my partner. Well, you may not be too comfortable staying at Otis's place. How do you mean? The house is in disrepair and cluttered with junk. It, it's the queerest place you'll ever see, Mr. Keene. This being inside the old mansion gives me the, the creeps. Well, Mike and I have spent the night in some very odd places. I'm sure we'll manage. Oh, just one thing more, Mr. Craig. You said you were very frightened since your brother's murder. You feel in need of protection? Not here in New York. For some reason, being inside that house gave me the impression that my life, too, is in danger. I, I just can't describe it. I think I understand. Then we'll see you tomorrow. Yes, Mr. Keene. Thanks again. Good day, gentlemen. Good day, Mr. Briggs. So long. Sure, and I think I know why you told him not to come out to his brother's place with us, Mr. Keene. Do you, Mike? Seems to me you don't want to investigate a case with a suspect hanging on your arm. Yes, you're right, Mike. John Bragg probably inherits his murdered brother's money. And that's something which must be taken into consideration. Sure, and I was thinking that myself, sir. We'll leave by car for Pennsylvania. We ought to make Bucks County by early evening. Then we'll find out at first hand a little more about the murder of Otis Prague in his strange old house. <laughs> Otis Prague's house should be right around the next bend in the road, Mike. Sure, and it's gloomy out here in these parts, Mr. Keene. Yes, you're right. Oh, there's the house now, boss. Hmm. And just look at the size of the place. A man could get lost living alone Mike, in a... There's a light inside the house. So there is, boss. I thought the place would be empty. So did I. Park over here in front of the door. Right, Mr. Keene. Do you think John Craig may have come here ahead of us after all, boss? But how could he have gotten in? He gave us the keys. Maybe I'd better keep my gun handy. Oh, Mike, don't use the keys. Ring the front doorbell instead and see what happens. I think I hear someone coming, Mr. Keene. What do you want? My name is Keene. We, oh, Mr. Uh... Keene, the famous investigator? Oh, oh, please come in. Thank you. Uh, look at this old place. It's like a haunted house. Uh, this is my partner, Mike Clancy. I'm Elsie Horner. Otis Prague was my uncle. Wasn't it awful, Mr. Keene? A poor old man like that, strangled to death. I, I guess you're working on the case with the police. We haven't contacted the local police yet, Miss Horner. John Bragg, your other uncle, asked us to investigate the tragedy. I haven't seen Uncle John in months. Is he all right? He seems to be, although he's naturally very broken up over his brother Otis' murder. Is he? Well, I didn't know they were so fond of each other. 
May I ask what you're doing here in Otis's house, Miss Hornan? Oh, I came to straighten it up. The house is going to be sold, you know, and I want to get a good price for it. You want to? The house was left to me in Uncle Otis's will, Mr. Keene. I spoke to his lawyer this morning. I took care of Uncle Otis for years, and he was kind enough to remember me. Hmm. Miss Horner, do you know anything else concerning the terms of the will? Well, I get some cash. Not nearly as much as Uncle John gets. My goodness, he comes into almost all of it. Well, that's interesting. I think we'll look around. What was that? Sounded like the horn in our car, boss. Go out and investigate, Mike. Yes, sir. What's the big idea? Nice horn, mister. <laughs> About a tall young fella. Who are you? What's your name? Evan. Evan? Yeah. What's yours? Mike Clancy. Uh, Clancy? That sounds like an Irish name. Well, you're as smart as a whip, ain't you? <laughs> what are you doing here, son? Just looking. Looking for what? Trouble, maybe. Evan, <laughs> where are you? Yeah, I'm over here, Miss Martin. Oh, why did you run away from me like that? That wasn't nice. I... Oh, excuse me. You are related to this young fellow, Miss? Uh, no, I'm a friend of his mother. My name is Hortense Martin. Uh, may, may I ask who you are? Mike Clancy. I'm working with Mr. Keene. The famous investigator? Oh, th then you must be here about the murder of Mr. Prey. What's the matter, Mike? Oh, nothing important, boss. Are you Mr. Keene? Why, yes. I'm Hortense Martin. I live in the village nearby. I'm sorry if Evan disturbed you. He's, he's really a good boy. <laughs> Not very responsible. Well, come along, Evan. I'll, I'll take you back to the village. Yeah, I ain't got nothing. He's not developed mentally, Mr. Keene. I've been trying to take him in hand and help him in some way. His mother is ill. I see. Miss Martin, did you happen to know Otis Prague, the murdered man? Yes, quite well. I was interested in buying his home at one time, but he wouldn't sell. He was a rather eccentric person, to say the least. Yes, so I understand. Perhaps you'll allow me to talk to you later on about Otis Prey. You may be able to give me some vital information. I, I don't like to get mixed up in a murder case if I can help it, Mr. Keene. But this would be in the interests of justice. Very well. I have a home in the village. You can come whenever you like. Thank you, Miss Martin. Well, I'd better catch up with Evan. Good night, Mr. Keene. Mr. Clancy. Good night. Good night. Sure, and that young lad Evan was a queer one, Mr. Keene. What do you suppose he was snooping around here for? I don't know, Mike. But... Sense preserve us. That must be Elsie Horner. Quick, Mike. Let's get back to the house. Miss Horner! Miss Horner! Well, she was here in this room and I left a few moments ago. Miss Horner, do you hear me? Faith and the woman's disappeared, boss. Now come along, Mike. We'll search every room in this house. This case is beginning to bear out my hunch already. We're involved in one of the weirdest situations we've ever encountered. In just a moment, we'll return to Mr. Keene and the eccentric millionaire murder case. Meanwhile, stop tooth decay and unpleasing breath. Yes, stop tooth decay and unpleasing breath that breathes between the teeth. Use Colonos toothpaste with dental floss action. Your dentist will tell you, brush your teeth after meals to stop decay. Clean those cracks and crevices deep between your teeth to guard against unpleasing breath. Now Colonos gives you dental floss action. That is, sends thousands of active cleansing bubbles to help dislodge bits of food that can cause unpleasing breath. What's more, for me, refreshing Colonos brightens teeth by removing ordinary yellow surface stains. Help stop tooth decay. Get Colonos toothpaste with dental floss action today. Now back to Mr. Keene and the eccentric millionaire murder case. Mr. Keene, the plant investigator. Uh, Evan, 
Edwin, you, you must tell Mr. Keene the truth. Tell him what you told me just before you ran away. What I told you, Miss Martin? Mr. Keene, he, he admitted killing Otis Prey. Did you tell Miss Martin that, Evan? She... <laughs> Uh, looks like our murder mystery solved, boss. We better be taking this lad Evan to the local police. Perhaps you're right, Mike. Miss Martin, knowing Evan as you do, would you have any idea as to why he killed the old man? Evan isn't responsible for his actions, I guess, Mr. Keaton. Otis Prague was his friend. He took pity on Evan. Evan was the only one he ever permitted in this house. I imagine Otis Prague didn't know that Evan could be dangerous. Mike, we'd better tell Elsie Horner if we're going into town with Evan. You want us to drive you in too, Miss Martin? Oh, I'd rather walk and then get some air. Evan, go with Mr. Keene and his partner. They won't hurt you. And I'll come down to the police station tomorrow and, and talk to you. Ooh, we're going to the police station? Yes, come along, Evan. We'll have a friendly talk on our way to town. And perhaps you'll decide to tell me everything you know. Sure, and I feel sorry for this boy, Evan, Mr. King. Look at him, sitting there, grinning like a monkey, with a noose hanging over his head. He'd only talk, Mike. We might learn something about Otis Sprague's murder. Well, it don't look as if he'll open his mouth for love or money. Money. There's lots of money. I bet there's a buried treasure in that house. What's that he's saying? Stop the car, Mike. Well, Evan. So you know where there's a treasure hidden? Yeah, if you didn't bust in on me, I'd have found it. I got a map. A map? Look. He's taking a piece of paper from his pocket. May I see that paper, Evan? Yeah. Maybe now you'll believe me. Hmm. Did you make this map yourself? Yeah. I copied it down out of my own head. Mike, turn the car around and get back to Otis Sprague's house as fast as possible. We haven't a second to lose. Do you think it was safe to leave Evan alone in that car, Mr. King? He isn't as dangerous as some people would have us believe. Oh, Mike, here's a hole that leads into the cellar of Otis Sprague's house. It's covered with these rose bushes. Evan must have dug through here one day and stumbled in his secret. Well, it's big enough to slide through, boss, but we can go in the other way, through the passage. We haven't got time, Mike. Get your gun out and follow me. Okay. Easy, boss. Hold on to my arm now. There. Okay, sir. We're in. It's dark in this cellar. Somebody fired at us, boss. Put out your flashlight, Mike. We can't see you, Miss Martin. You can't see us. It seems as if your little plan is finished. Duck your head, boss. Put your light on again, Mike. There she is. Lying in the corner, Mr. Keene. When she fired at us, I fired back and hit her. Miss Martin. Oh. Boss, look at the floor. It's covered with hundred dollar bills. Yes, Mike, it's a hidden treasure. Taken from this secret panel in the wall, which is covered with cement, before Hortense Martin hacked it away. She strangled Otis Prey. He tried to pin the crime on Evan, a feeble-minded boy who couldn't defend himself. Miss Martin, can you hear me? Yes. I'm afraid you don't have long to live. Evan showed me this map. It's scribbled on a piece of note paper with your initials on it. That he found in your home, Miss Martin. He's trying to talk, boss. Let the boy go. He's innocent. I know that. And I know you're guilty. You followed Evan, hoping he'd lead you to Otis Prague's hidden money. And he did. Am I right? Yes. Evan found out by accident where Otis Prague's money was hidden. Then he lied to me. He said the money 
It was in the safe. When I opened the safe, it wasn't there. That was right after you murdered Otis Prey. Evan thought it was a joke, lying to me that way. So I followed him. And tonight, he led me to the money. And your story about trying to buy the house from Prey was a lie. The fool Evan had told me the truth in the first place. I'd have been rich. Rich. Uh, uh. Miss Martin is dead, boss. Yes. She's paid for her crime in full, Mike. What an odd chain of events. A grasping, money-mad woman discovers that a feeble-minded boy has found a fortune in hidden money. And the boy had found it by accident. Through his friendship with the old man who took such pains to hide his wealth. Well, that's why Otis Prague bought this old house and lived here by himself, like a hermit. When he tried to reach me, he must have found out that someone had broken into his house looking for the money. Mr. Keene? Mr. Keene, are you down there in the cellar? Chelsea Horner, boss. Must have heard those shots from upstairs. What's happened? I thought I heard... <gasps> Who's that lying on the floor? It's Hortense Martin, your uncle's murderer, Miss Horner. <gasps> oh! There's nothing to be afraid of anymore. Please call the police immediately and tell them the mystery of the death of Otis Prade is solved. <laughs> And so Mr. Keene finds a solution to the eccentric millionaire murder case. The next time you're suffering from the pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, try Anison. You'll bless the day you heard of this incredibly fast way to relieve these pains. Now, the reason Anison is so wonderfully fast-acting and effective is this. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing Anison tablets from their own dentist or physician. And in this way, have discovered the incredibly fast relief Anison brings from pain of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. So, next time such pain strike, take Anison. For most effective relief, use only as directed. Your druggist has Anison in handy boxes of 12 and 30, and economical family size bottles of 50 and 100. The name is Anison, A N A C I N. <laughs> Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons, is based on the novel, Mr. Keen. The radio sequel is originated and produced by Frank and Ann Hummer. Dialogue by Lawrence Clee. Bennett Kilpack plays Mr. Keen. It is on the air every Thursday at this time. Don't miss Mr. Keen next Thursday when the kindly old Tracer turns to the Country Club Murder Case. Ever suffer heartburn or upset stomach from acid indigestion? Safe new Bicidol mints, medically proven, quickly rid stomach of that blown-up feeling. Give longer-lasting relief than baking soda. Yes, hours of relief. Bicidol mints not only neutralize, but actually carry away excess stomach acids. Soothe irritated stomach lining. Let you sleep all night long when acid indigestion strikes. Carry new Bicidol mints for fast relief. Anywhere, anytime. Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, will be on the air next Thursday at the same time. This is Larry Elliott saying goodbye for Mr. Keene and the Whitehall Pharmacal Company, makers of Anison and Kalinos, and many other dependable, high-quality drug products. It's time now for Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. Ladies and gentlemen, Anison and Kalinos present Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. 
one of the most famous characters of American fiction in one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday at the same time, the famous old investigator takes from his file and brings to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. Tonight's case is entitled The Country Club Murder Case. This program is presented for your entertainment by the makers of Anison, the remarkable tablets that bring such incredibly fast, effective relief from the pain of headaches, neuritis, or neuralgia. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, it contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. In all probability, you, like so many thousands of people, have been given an envelope containing Anison tablets by your own physician or dentist at some time or another. Then you already know how effective it is. But if you have not, try Anison the next time you want really fast relief from the pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. You'll be delighted with the results. For most effective relief, use only as directed. Ask for Anison, spelled A-N-A-C-I-N, at any drug counter today. for Mr. Keene and the Country Club murder case. Our scene opens at a fashionable country club in Westchester. A spring dance is in progress. And as the couples in evening clothes enjoy themselves in the main ballroom of the club, two young people emerge from the dance floor and pause momentarily on the terrace overlooking the grounds. Arlene, this is the first chance I've had to see you alone in nearly a week. I've missed you, Alan. Oh, darling. Oh, not here. We'll be seen. I'll go around and get the car. We'll take a drive. All right, Alan. You wait for me here, Arlene. I'll be back in two minutes. What a beautiful spring evening. Oh, I didn't know you... What, what are you doing? Take your hands from, from my throat. No! Don't kill me! No! No! Oh, no! When I got back to the terrace, Mr. Keene, Arlene was dead. She'd been strangled. And that was only a few minutes after you left her, Mr. Rogers? Yes, Mr. King. Well, saints preserve us, but you mean to say that no one in the ballroom saw it happen? And that they were all that close? Yes, Mr. Rogers. I'm just as puzzled about that as my partner, Mike Clancy. Well, it's true that Arlene was near the dances, Mr. Keene, but I'd closed the terrace door when we left the ballroom. And it was all over so quickly... No one even knew what happened until I found Arlene's body. I suppose the police questioned everyone who attended that country club dance. Yes, Mr. Keene, but no one was held. The murder's a complete mystery. Hmm. Tell me a little bit more about yourself and your relationship with Arlene Graham. Well, there's very little to tell. I was very much in love with her and she with me, I believe. Were you going to marry Arlene was already married, Mr. Keene. To whom, Mr. Rogers? Chester Graham. A drunkard. He treated her miserably. Arlene was wealthy, and she gave him almost half a million dollars to invest in the business. He gambled most of it away. He'd come home drunk, even beat her. Finally, she left him two months ago. She was suing for a divorce when she was murdered. Mr. Rogers, was this husband of hers, Chester Graham, at the country club dance uh, where the murder took place? No one saw him there, Mr. Clancy, but he could have sneaked in without being noticed. The police are looking for Chester now to question him. I thought with your help, Mr. Keene, he'd be rounded up a little faster. For my part, I'd you like to... You seem to feel that Chester Graham is the most important suspect in this case. Hmm? Who else would have murdered a girl like Arlene, Mr. Keene? She was gentle, kind, and loyal to her worthless husband. She wouldn't permit me to see her at all until she knew her marriage was ending. And she couldn't ever go back to Chester. Now, you say she had given her husband half a million dollars to invest? Yes. In my opinion, Chester only married her for her money. My relationship with her at first was in a business way. 
I advise her about her investments and securities. I oh, see. Up to the time she married Chester Graham, she... She lived with her guardian. An uncle named Hubert Parker. He's heartbroken over Arlene's death. And very bitter about it. Mr. Parker had advised Arlene not to marry Chester. Now he feels, as I do, that... Chester may have had something to do with her murder. Who inherits Arlene Graham's money now that she's dead? I guess Chester, her husband, inherits the money, Mr. Keene. Which could have been another Let's reason... Let's not come to conclusions until we investigate this further, Mr. Rogers. Then you'll accept the case, Mr. Keene? You'll try to find Arlene's murderer? Well, yes, of course. Thank you. The loss of Arlene was... was a great blow to me. I wish I could describe to you how wonderful she was. How forgiving. Forgiving? Do you imply that she forgave you for something, Mr. Rogers? Well, I, I wasn't thinking of myself exactly. All, although I did make one bad mistake that she covered for me. Oh, what was that? Oh, it was nothing important. I, I must insist on having every detail concerning this case, Mr. Rogers. No matter how unimportant it may seem to you. Well, it was just that I advised her badly about an investment once and she lost some money. But that was long ago and it's all been forgotten. Mr. Rogers... Does anyone know where this Graham fellow, her husband, might be hiding out? No, Mr. Clancy, but I suddenly remembered something a moment ago that may be of some help. What was it? On top of Chester Graham's other bad habits, he was deceitful. He was seeing another woman. When Arlene found out about that, it was the last straw. Who is this other woman? Eve Worthing. She's a well-known artist with a studio down in Greenwich Village. Something tells me that Miss Worthing may know where Chester Graham can be found. And we'll make Miss Worthing's studio our first stop, Mike. Okay, boss. Mr. Keene, needless to say, I'll do anything to help you solve this case. I'm going to see that Arlene's murderer pays the full penalty for the crime if it's the last thing I do. You can rest assured that justice will be done eventually, Mr. Rogers. No matter who that murderer turns out to be. You have my address, Mr. Keene. I'll be waiting for news. You'll hear from me shortly. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, Mr. Clancy. So long. Goodbye. He seems like a nice young fella to me, Mr. Keene. Yes, Mike, but there are one, two things about his story that started me off on a different track. Meaning what, boss? Well, that bad investment he advised Arlene Graham to make. Alan Rogers didn't want to talk about it too much. Well, now that you mentioned it, I noticed that too, Mr. Keene. Well, a case like this is always wise to keep an eye on everyone, Mike, including our client. Well, suppose we proceed to Eve Worthing's art studio and see if we can get any information on Chester Graham, who at the moment seems to be suspect number one. <laughs> Building superintendent downstairs said that Miss Wortham was in her studio apartment, Mr. Keene. It's odd she doesn't answer her doorbell, Mike. Try ringing again. Yes? Are you Miss Eve Worthing? Yes, I am. Well, my name is Keene. This is my partner, Mr. Clancy. Mr. Keene, the great investigator? I was wondering if I could talk to you for a few minutes. May we come in? Well... I can answer your questions out here in the hall. You happen to know where I can locate Chester Graham? Chester? What makes you think I know where he is? Well, we understand that you're a friend of his. I haven't seen him in two months. Did you know that his wife, Arlene Graham, was murdered last night? His wife? Murdered? Well, I... I haven't had a chance to read the papers yet, Mr. Keene. The story hasn't appeared yet. I don't know where Chester is. And what's more, I don't care. I see. Well, thank you for your information, Miss Worthing. Good day. Good day. Sure, and she had guilt written all over her face, Mr. Keene. Yes, Eve Worthing knows where Chester Graham is, Mike. In my opinion, he's here in her apartment right now. She seemed to be very anxious to keep us out. And what do we do, sir? Come over here to the end of the hall, Mike. This uh, seems to be the service entrance to the apartment. It may be open. Try the door very quietly. It's open, boss. I'll go back to the front door and ring the bell again. When Miss Worthing comes to the door, I'll keep her busy while you get inside and look the place over and see if Chester Graham is there. All right, sir. Be careful now. Graham may be dangerous. <laughs> 
I'll be ready for him, Mr. Keene. What is it now, Mr. Keene? Oh, there's just one more piece of information I thought you might be able to give me. Who's there? Who's in the kitchen? What are you... Just stay where you are, mister. Don't pull anything. Who are you? The name is Clancy. What's yours? None of your business. Let's see an identification, mister. Get out. Get out before I call the police. Why, sure, and I'll call them for you. What? Go on into the studio, Mr. Chester Graham. How did you know? Oh, just call it into wish. I tell you, Mr. Keene, that I don't know where Chester is. Maybe I do, boss. He's right here. Good work, Mike. Miss Worthing, I'm afraid I'll have to insist on coming in, whether you like it or not. Who are you? Name is Keene. And you? Well, looks as though this fella just doesn't want to talk, boss. It's no use, Chester. They know who you are. You could have kept them out, Eve. You never even tried. Chester! Mr. Graham, I presume you know your wife has been murdered. I won't answer your questions, Mr. Keene. I demand to see my lawyer. That demand will be granted. Just as soon as we turn you over to the police. Chester didn't kill Arlene, Mr. Keene. He's been with me all the time. How long has he been hiding here in your apartment, Miss Worthing? He's been here Don't ever since... Don't lie to him, Eve. It'll only get you into trouble. I've only been here for an hour, Mr. Keene. Where were you at 11 last night when your wife was murdered? I, I don't remember. Sure, and that's not even a good try at an alibi, mister. I tell you, I don't remember. I, I've been drinking and I, I must have fallen asleep somewhere in the park. I... I'll answer that. Is uh, Miss Eve Worthing here? Yes, she is. It's Arlene's uncle, Hubert Parker. Hubert, I... Chester Graham, I've been aching for the chance to get my hands on you. You won't get away with this, you murderer, you heartless, drunken killer. Mr. Keene, he's got a I'll gun. I'll kill you. I'll kill you. Mike. Mike. Give me that gun, mister. Drop it. Drop it. All right. All right. Let go of my arm. Mr. Park, that shot hadn't been reflected by Mike Clancy. You yourself would be facing a murder charge right I, now. I, I couldn't help it. I, I just couldn't help it. Who are you? My name is Keene. Mr. Keene, the famous investigator? Then you've come here to arrest Chester Graham for murdering my niece, Arlene. I've come here to turn Chester Graham over to the police for questioning, Mr. Parker. As for arresting your niece's killer, I intend to do that too. As soon as I find out, without the shadow of a doubt, who is responsible for her death. <laughs> Just a moment, we'll return to Mr. Keene and the Country Club murder case. Meanwhile, stop tooth decay and unpleasing breath. Yes, stop tooth decay and unpleasing breath that breathes between the teeth. Use Colonos toothpaste with dental floss action. Your dentist will tell you, brush your teeth after meals to stop decay. Clean those cracks and crevices deep between your teeth to guard against unpleasing breath. Now, Colonos gives you dental floss action. That is, sends thousands of active cleansing bubbles to help dislodge bits of food that can cause unpleasing breath. What's more, foamy, refreshing colonos brightens teeth by removing ordinary yellow surface stains. Help stop tooth decay. Get colonos toothpaste with dental floss action today. Now back to Mr. Keene and the Country Club murder case. Mr. Keene, the famous investigator, and his partner, Mike Clancy, are investigating the murder of lovely, wealthy young Arlene Graham, who was strangled during a dance at a fashionable country club. Among the suspects is Chester Graham, Arlene's estranged husband, whom Mr. Keene and Mike captured in the apartment of Eve Worthing, a friend of Graham's. Now Mr. Keene and Mike have returned to their office, and a young man enters. It is Alan Rogers, who was in love with a murdered girl. Boss, here's young Alan Rogers again. Mr. Keene, you found Arlene's husband, Chester Graham? Yes, he's being questioned by the police about the murder of his wife right now, Mr. Rogers. I hope he gets the full penalty. It hasn't been proven yet that he's the murderer. However, the police may want to question you again. Why, I've already talked to them. I told them the truth as I told it to you. 
I was in love with Arlene, and I handled a business affairs. So like business affairs, we are most interested in Mr. Rogers. That's why I asked you to come back here to my office. Well, what is it you want to know, Mr. Keene? Well, you've told me Arlene Graham was quite wealthy. My partner, Mike Clancy, and I would like to look over her business records. We were wondering if you had them, Mr. Rogers. Why, no, Mr. Clancy, I... I only advised Arlene in regard to certain investments. I... I wasn't her accountant. Who was her accountant? She didn't have any, Miss Keene. At least, not since I knew her. Arlene kept her own records. And how long had you known her, all told? Only a year. I met Arlene just after she married Chester Graham. Did you know her uncle, Hubert Parker? Only slightly. What uh, kind of a man is he? He's a very pleasant old gentleman, well-liked. I'm sure he didn't act like that a couple of hours ago. What do you mean, Mr. Clancy? He attempted to kill Chester Graham in Eve Worthing's apartment. Really, Mr. Keene? Well, I don't blame him. Mr. Parker loved his niece, Arlene. I might have lost my head, too, if I'd come face to face with Graham. Fortunately, Mr. Parker realized what he had done. Chester Graham... Refused to press charges against him. He'd be a fine one to press charges against anybody, Mr. Keene. Mr. Rogers, you still feel pretty certain that Chester Graham killed his wife? Yes, I do. Well, he wasn't seen at the country club where she was strangled. But he was a member of the club. He could have walked in. Was that dance restricted to members only, Mr. Rogers? Yes. We have a closed membership now, Mr. Keene. Only 70 people. It's a young people's club. I'd say that no member was over 40 years of age. It's a good point to remember, Mike. Who are you uh, calling, Miss Keene? Hubert Parker. We're going to search Arlene's home for possible clues. She hasn't lived with her uncle since her marriage. I know. We've gotten the key to her home from her husband, Chester Graham. But there was something I wanted to ask, Mr... Um... Hello? Oh, Mr. Parker? Yes. This is Mr. Keene. Oh, uh, I uh, I meant to thank you, Mr. Keene, for the way you handled my uh, stupid outburst with Chester Graham. You saved me a lot of grief uh, by interfering. Well, Mr. Parker, I called to ask you something about your niece, Arlene. Uh, well? Did she ever have a professional accountant to handle her business affairs? No, not that I know of, Mr. Keene. Who handled her finances while she was your ward? I did, with her permission, of course. But there was never any need for an accountant. All Arlene's investments had been made by her father before his death. And uh, she merely received income on our stocks and bonds. I see. Well, perhaps I'll learn a little more when I go over her business affairs. Thank you for your help, Mr. Parker. Uh, what about Arlene's husband, Chester Graham? I trust the police will keep him under arrest. Well, they probably will until the case is closed. Goodbye, Mr. Parker. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Keene. All right, Mike. Let's get started. Right, boss. Oh, Mr. Rogers. Yes, Mr. Keene. Did you tell the police about the bad investments you made for Arlene Graham and the money she lost through them? No. And I see now that was a mistake. Do you want me to report to them? Yes. Meanwhile, I have a feeling that a clue to Arlene Graham's murder may be found inside her own home. And if it's there, Mike and I intend to find it. This is a beautiful house, Mr. Keene. Arlene Graham was sure wealthy. Yes, she was, Mike. Uh, this room here must be the study. Let's go in. There must be a light switch in this room, Mr. Keene. Just a moment, Mike. Don't put the lights on yet. Boss, someone's in the next room. Yes, this house is supposed to be empty. Let's find out who else is interested in Arlene Graham's private affairs. <gasps> Mr. Keene. What are you doing here, Miss Worthing? Nothing. I mean... Eve I... Worthing came in through that open window, boss. Yes, Mike. A rather unusual way to make a casual visit. I refuse to discuss it, Mr. Yeah, Keene. Not so fast, lady. How dare you stand in my way? I suggest we dispense with the act, Miss Worthing. I can turn you into the police for housebreaking, if for no other reason. Very well, do it. Perhaps I will. After I find out why you've come here to Arlene Graham's home... I'll take that knitting bag you're holding, if you please. No. Turn I... it over, lady, or I'll have to take it away from you. Oh, I've ruined everything. I should never have started this. The knitting bag, please. 
Here. Mr. Kane, it's stuffed with checks. Cancel checks, Mike. Let's look them over. Hmm. Several of these checks appear to be forgeries. The signatures don't match Arlene Graham's signatures on the others. Chester didn't kill Arlene, Mr. Keene. He he may have forged her name on those checks, but he needed money desperately. Is that why you came for these checks, Miss Worthing? To protect Arlene's husband, Chester Graham? Yes. How did you know about these forgeries? Uh, Arlene told me. She did? Yes. Just before she was murdered, she phoned me and asked me where Chester was. She hadn't seen him since their separation. Then she said her name had been forged on several checks for over $50,000. And she suspected that her husband was guilty? Yes. Someone's at the front door, Mike. See who it is. Okay, sir. Well, Miss Worthing, this not only puts Chester Graham in a more serious position, but you as well. What do you mean, Mr. Keene? You admit you're in love with Chester Graham, don't you? I don't admit anything. You must be in love with him. Or you wouldn't have tried to hide him or get hold of these forged checks to defend him. Well, suppose I did love Chester. And suppose after he left his wife, Arlene, he wanted to return to her again. Suppose you became so insanely jealous of Arlene Graham that you... uh... That I murdered her? Is that what you were going to say, Mr. King? Well, it's not true, and you can't prove it is. Mr. Keene, Mr. Parker's here. Well, bring him in, Mike. Hubert Parker? Arlene's uncle? Yes. Why, I... I believe I've met Miss Worthing before, Mr. Keene. When, Mr. Parker? You mean before you came to her studio a few hours ago? Yes, before my niece Arlene was married. This woman was Arlene's social secretary. Mm, that's very interesting. <laughs> You're all against me! Well, do what you like. I don't care. Mike, take Miss Worthing into the next room. She's becoming hysterical. Well, you better come along. Please. I won't let you send Chester to the electric chair. We're both innocent. Both of us. Take it easy. I came here to speak to you, Mr. Keene. After you phoned, I was suddenly reminded of something that may be important. Oh, what was it, Mr. Parker? The last time I spoke to my niece, Arlene, uh, just before she was murdered, she said something about missing money. Oh? She referred to her husband, Chester Graham, and told me that she'd give me more details after she'd uh, thoroughly checked through her bank statements. Did she mention anything about forged checks, Mr. Parker? No, not that I remember. You see, I've just discovered these cancelled checks of Arlene's. And several of them appear to be forgeries. Then that was it, Mr. Keene. Her husband, Chester Graham, had forged her name in order to get money. Now, there's no doubt about it. Chester Graham murdered my niece to cover up his forgeries. Mm, There's only one clue that's missing, Mr. Parker. No one saw Chester Graham in the vicinity of the country club on the night of the murder. I saw him there. You? I dropped in for a few moments during the dance and uh, saw him in the foyer. Were you a member of that country club, Mr. Parker? Why, uh, yes, Mr. Keene. Miss Worthen is lying down on the couch inside, boss. Crying like a baby. In spite of everything, I'm beginning to feel kind of sorry for her. Well, she has nothing to worry about, Mike. I know now who murdered Arlene Graham. You know who murdered my niece? Who, Mr. Keene? First, let me ask you one more question, Mr. Parker. Is Chester Graham left-handed? Why, I... I don't think so. Neither is he Worthing. But you are. I noticed that when you fired a gun at Chester Graham. Well, what's that got to do with anything? Because it was a left-handed person who forged those checks. The handwriting of a left-handed person often slants in a different way from a right-handed person. Mr. Keene, are you accusing me of murdering my niece? I am, Mr. Parker. What rot? You must be crazy. I have several other pieces of evidence. One thing you said, you were a member of that country club. As they have no members over 40, and you're obviously older than that... I knew you were lying, which makes me believe that you lied about several other things as well. For instance? You were at the country club all right, but you didn't see Chester Graham there. You sneaked in unnoticed in some way and strangled your niece. Then, to base a case against Chester, you tried to testify you saw him at the club. That still isn't final proof against me, King. You knew your niece had discovered the forgers of her checks, and that she'd try to turn you into the police. That's why you decided to murder her. No, no, that's a lie. And her recent disagreement with her husband gave you a perfect chance. Chester Graham's bad habits are well known. 
And you thought he'd be blamed for the murder and forgeries, too. You're crazy, Keene. You don't know what you're talking about. In my opinion, Mr. Parker, you made a mistake and didn't know it. A mistake? Actually, Arlene believed her husband did forge those checks. But you thought she suspected you. Arlene could have discovered the truth if she learned what I did in examining these cancelled checks. And what was that? Two of these checks are dated back two years, long before Arlene was married. She was living with you at that time, Mr. Parker, and you were helping yourself to her fortune by forging her name. Sure, look at it, Mr. Keene. He's turning pale. Yes, Mike. Parker, it won't take me long to prove these forgeries are yours. Go through his wallet, Mike. If he has a driver's license with his own signature on it, we'll compare it with one of these forged checks. That... that won't be necessary, Mr. Keene. I'm afraid you win. I wish I could feel sorry for you, Parker. You're not a young man anymore, and this will finish you. But I have no sympathy with murder. A man who takes a human life for his own selfish profit deserves to feel the full impact of the law. And that's just what you're heading for now. And so Mr. Keene finds the solution to the country club murder case. The next time you're suffering from the pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, try Anison. You'll bless the day you heard of this incredibly fast way to relieve these pains. Now, the reason Anison is so wonderfully fast-acting and effective is this. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing Anison tablets from their own dentist or physician, and in this way have discovered the incredibly fast relief Anison brings from pain of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. So next time such pain strike, take Anison. For most effective relief, use only as directed. Your druggist has Anison in handy boxes of 12 and 30, and economical family size bottles of 50 and 100. The name is Anison, A-N-A-C-I-N. Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, is based on the novel Mr. Keene. The radio sequel is originated and produced by Frank and Ann Hummert. Dialogue by Lawrence Klee. Bennett Kilpack plays Mr. Keene. It is on the air every Thursday at this time. Don't miss Mr. Keene next Thursday when the kindly old Tracer turns to the case of the woman who married a murderer. Ever suffer heartburn or upset stomach from acid indigestion? Safe new Bicidol mints, medically proven, quickly rid stomach of that blown-up feeling. Give longer-lasting relief than baking soda. Yes, hours of relief. Bicidol mints not only neutralize, but actually carry away excess stomach acids. Soothe irritated stomach lining. Let you sleep all night long when acid indigestion strikes. Carry new Bicidol mints for fast relief anywhere, anytime. Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, will be on the air next Thursday at the same time. This is Larry Elliott saying goodbye for Mr. Keene and the Whitehall Pharmacal Company, makers of Anison and Kalinos, and many other dependable, high-quality drug 